This is Carmilla, written by Joseph Sheridan Lefano and narrated by Tony Walker. Carmilla by J. Sheridan Lefano. Prologue. Upon a paper attached to the narrative which follows, Dr. Heselius has written a rather elaborate note which he accompanies with a reference to his essay on the strange subject which the manuscript illuminates. This mysterious subject he treats in that essay with his usual learning and acumen, and with remarkable directness and condensation. It will form but one volume of the series of that extraordinary man's collected papers. As I publish the case in this volume simply to interest the laity, I shall forestall the intelligent lady who relates it in nothing and after due consideration, I have determined, therefore, to abstain from presenting any précy of the learned doctor's reasoning, or extract from his statement on the subject which he describes as involving, not improbably, some of the profoundest arcana of our dual existence and its intermediates. I was anxious on discovering this paper to reopen the correspondence commenced by Dr. Heselius, so many years before with a person so clever and careful as his informant seems to have been. Much to my regret, however, I found that she had died in the interval. She probably could have added little to the narrative which she communicates in the following pages, with, so far as I can pronounce, such conscientiousness particularity. 1. An Early Fright In Styria we, though by no means magnificent people, inhabit a castle or schloss. A small income in that part of the world goes a great way. Eight or nine hundred a year does wonders. Scantily enough ours would have answered among wealthy people at home. My father is English, and I bear an English name, although I never saw England. But here, in this lonely and primitive place, where everything is so marvellously cheap, I really don't see how ever so much more money would at all materially add to our comforts or even luxuries. My father was in the Austrian service, and retired upon a pension and his patrimony, and purchased this feudal residence and the small estate on which it stands, a bargain. Nothing can be more picturesque or solitary. It stands on a slight eminence in a forest. The road, very old and narrow, passes in front of its drawbridge never raised in my time, and its moat, stocked with perch and sailed over by many swans and floating on its surface white fleets of water lilies. Of all of this, the schloss shows its many-windowed front, its towers, and its Gothic chapel. The forest opens in an irregular and very picturesque glade before its gate, and at the right a steep Gothic bridge carries the road over a stream that winds in deep shadow through the wood. I have said that this is a very lonely place. Judge whether I say truth. Looking from the hall towards the road, the forest in which our castle stands extends fifteen miles to the right and twelve to the left. The nearest inhabited valley is about seven of your English miles to the left. The nearest inhabited schloss of any historic associations is that of old General Spielsdorf, nearly twenty miles away to the right. I have said the nearest inhabited village, because there is only three miles westward, that is to say in the direction of General Spielsdorf's schloss, a ruined village, with its quaint little church now roofless, in the isle of which are the mouldering tombs of the proud family of Karnstein, now extinct, who once owned the equally desolate chateau which, in the thick of the forest, overlooks the silent ruins of the town. Respecting the cause of the desertion of this striking and melancholy spot, there is a legend which I shall relate to you another time. I must tell you now how very small is the party who constitute the inhabitants of our castle. I don't include servants or those dependents who occupy rooms in buildings attached to the schloss. Listen and wonder. My father, who is the kindest man on earth but growing old, and I, at the date of my story, only nineteen. Eight years have passed since then. I and my father constituted the family at the schloss. My mother, a Styrian lady, died in my infancy, but I had a good-natured governess who had been with me from, I might almost say, my infancy. I could not remember the time when her fat, benign face was not a familiar picture in my memory. This was Madame Perrodon, a native of Bern whose care and good nature now in part supplied to me the loss of my mother, whom I do not even remember so early I lost her. She made a third at our little dinner party. There was a fourth, 
Mademoiselle de la Fontaine, a lady such as you term, I believe, a finishing governess. She spoke French and German, Madame Perdon French and broken English, to which my father and I added English, which partly to prevent its becoming a lost language among us, and partly from patriotic motives, we spoke every day. The consequence was a babble at which strangers used to laugh, and which I shall make no attempt to reproduce in this narrative. And there were two or three young lady friends besides, pretty nearly of my own age, who were occasional visitors for longer or shorter terms, and these visits I sometimes returned. These were our regular social resources, but of course there were chance visits from neighbours of only five or six leagues' distance. My life was, notwithstanding, rather a solitary one, I can assure you. My gouvernante had just so much control over me as you might conjecture such sage persons would have in the case of a rather spoiled girl whose only parent allowed her pretty nearly her own way in everything. The first occurrence in my existence which produced a terrible impression upon my mind, which, in fact, never has been effaced, was one of the very earliest incidents of my life which I can recollect. Some people will think it so trifling that it should not be recorded here. You will see, however, by and by, why I mention it. The nursery, as it was called, though I had it all to myself, was a large room in the upper story of the castle, with a steep oak roof. I can't have been more than six years old when one night I awoke, and looking round the room from my bed, failed to see the nursery maid. Neither was my nurse there, and I thought myself alone. I was not frightened, for I was one of those happy children who are studiously kept in ignorance of ghost stories, of fairy tales, and of all such lore as makes us cover up our heads when the door cracks suddenly, or the flicker of an expiring candle makes the shadow of a bedpost dance upon the wall nearer to our faces. I was vexed and insulted at finding myself, as I conceived, neglected, and I began to whimper, preparatory to a hearty bout of roaring, when to my surprise, I saw a solemn but very pretty face looking at me from the side of the bed. It was that of a young lady who was kneeling with her hands under the coverlet. I looked at her with a kind of pleased wonder and ceased whimpering. She caressed me with her hands and lay down beside me on the bed and drew me towards her, smiling. I felt immediately delightfully soothed and fell asleep again. I was wakened by a sensation as if two needles ran into my breast very deep at the same moment, and I cried loudly. The lady started back with her eyes fixed on me, and then slipped down upon the floor, and as I thought, hid herself under the bed. I was now for the first time frightened, and I yelled with all my might and main. Nurse, nursery maid, housekeeper, all came running in, and hearing my story they made light of it, soothing me all they could meanwhile. But, child as I was, I could perceive that their faces were pale with an unwonted look of anxiety, and I saw them look under the bed and about the room and peep under tables and pluck open cupboards, and the housekeeper whispered to the nurse, Lay your hand along that hollow in the bed. Someone did lie there, so sure as you did not. The place is still warm. I remember the nursery maid petting me and all three examining my chest where I told them I felt the puncture, and pronouncing that there was no sign visible that any such thing had happened to me. The housekeeper and the two other servants who were in charge of the nursery remained sitting up all night, and from that time a servant always sat up in the nursery until I was about fourteen. I was very nervous for a long time after this. A doctor was called in. He was pallid and elderly, how well I remember his long saturnine face, slightly pitted with smallpox, and his chestnut wig. For a good while, every second day, he came and gave me medicine, which of course I hated. The morning after I saw this apparition, I was in a state of terror, and could not bear to be left alone, daylight though it was, for a moment. I remember my father coming in and standing at the bedside and talking cheerfully and asking the nurse a number of questions and laughing very heartily at one of the answers and patting me on the shoulder and kissing me and telling me not to be frightened, that it was nothing but a dream and could not hurt me. But I was not comforted, for I knew the visit of the strange woman was not a dream, and I was awfully frightened. I was a little consoled by the nursery maids assuring me that it was she who had come and looked at me and lain down beside me, and that I must have been half dreaming not to have known her face. But this, 
though supported by the nurse, did not quite satisfy me. I remembered in the course of that day a venerable old man in a black cassock coming into the room with the nurse and the housekeeper and talking a little to them and very kindly to me. His face was very sweet and gentle, and he told me they were going to pray and joined my hands together and decided me to say softly while they were praying, Lord, hear all good prayers for us, for Jesus' sake. I think these were the words, for I often repeated them to myself, and my nurse used to for years to make me say them in my prayers. I remembered so well the thoughtful sweet face of that white-haired old man in his black cassock as he stood in the rude, lofty brown room with the clumsy furniture of a fashion three hundred years old about him, and the scanty light entering its shadowy atmosphere through the small lattice. He kneeled, and the three women with him, and he prayed aloud with an earnest, quavering voice for what appeared to me a long time. I forget all my life preceding that event, and for some time after it is all obscure also, but the scenes I have just described stand out vivid as the isolated pictures of the phantasmagoria surrounded by darkness. I am now going to tell you something so strange that it will require all your faith in my veracity to believe my story. It is not only true, nevertheless, but truth of which I have been an eyewitness. It was a sweet summer evening, and my father asked me, as he sometimes did, to take a little ramble with him along that beautiful forest vista which I have mentioned as lying in front of the Schloss. General Spielsdorf cannot come to us so soon as I had hoped, said my father as we pursued the walk. He was to have paid us a visit of some weeks, and we had expected his arrival the next day. He was to have brought with him a young lady, his niece and ward, Mademoiselle Reinfeldt, whom I had never seen, but whom I had heard described as a very charming girl, and in whose society I had promised myself many happy days. I was more disappointed than a young lady living in a town, or a bustling neighbourhood can possibly imagine. This visit and the new acquaintance it promised had furnished my daydream for many weeks. And how soon does he come? I asked. Not till autumn, not for two months, I dare say, he answered. And I'm very glad now, dear, that you never knew Mademoiselle Reinfeldt. And why? I asked, both mortified and curious. Because the poor young lady is dead, he replied. I quite forgot I had not told you, but you were not in the room when I received the general's letter this evening. I was very much shocked. General Spielsdorf had mentioned in his first letter six or seven weeks before that she was not so well as he would wish her, but there was nothing to suggest the remotest suspicion of danger. Here's the general's letter, he said, handing it to me. I'm afraid he is in great affliction. The letter appears to me to have been written very nearly in distraction. We sat down on a rude bench under a group of magnificent lime trees. The sun was setting with all its melancholy splendour behind the sylvan horizon and the stream that flows beside our home and passes under the steep old bridge I have mentioned wound through many a group of noble trees, almost at our feet, reflecting in its current the fading crimson of the sky. General Spieldorf's letter was so extraordinary, so vehement, and in some places so self-contradictory, that I read it twice over the second time aloud to my father, and was still unable to account for it, except by supposing that grief had unsettled his mind. It said, I have lost my darling daughter, for as such I loved her. During the last days of dear Bertha's illness, I was not able to write to you. Before then, I had no idea of her danger. I have lost her, and now learn all. Too late. She died in the peace of innocence, and in the glorious hope of a blessed futurity. The fiend who betrayed our infatuated hospitality has done it all. I thought I was receiving into my house innocence, gaiety, a charming companion for my lost Bertha. Heavens, what a fool I have been. I thank God my child died without a suspicion of the cause of her sufferings. She is gone without so much as a conjecturing of the nature of her illness and the accursed passion of the agent of all this misery. I devote my remaining days to tracking and extinguishing a monster. I am told I may hope to accomplish my righteous and merciful purpose. At present, 
there is scarcely a gleam of light to guide me. I curse my conceited incredulity, my despicable affection of superiority, my blindness, my obstinacy, all too late. I cannot write or talk collectedly now, I am distracted. So soon as I shall have a little recovered, I mean to devote myself for a time to inquiry, which may possibly lead me as far as Vienna. Sometime in the autumn, two months hence, or earlier, if I live, I will see you, that is, if you permit me. I will then tell you all that I scarce dare put upon paper now. Farewell. Pray for me, my dear friend. In these terms ended this strange letter. Though I had never seen Bertha Reinfeldt, my eyes filled with tears at the sudden intelligence. I was startled, as well as profoundly disappointed. The sun had now set, and it was twilight by the time I had returned the general's letter to my father. It was a soft, clear evening, and we loitered, speculating upon the possible meaning of the violent and incoherent sentences which I had just been reading. We had nearly a mile to walk before reaching the road that passes the Schloss in front, and by that time the moon was shining brilliantly. At the drawbridge we met Madame Peridon and Mademoiselle de la Fontaine, who had come out without their bonnets to enjoy the exquisite moonlight. We heard their voices gabbling in animated dialogue as we approached. We joined them at the drawbridge and turned about to admire with them the beautiful scene. The glade through which we had just walked lay before us. At our left the narrow road wound away under clumps of lordly trees and was lost to sight amid the thickening forest. At the right the same road crosses a steep and picturesque bridge, near which stands a ruined tower which once guarded that pass, and beyond the bridge an abrupt eminence arises, covered with trees and showing in the shadows some grey, ivy-clustered rocks. Over the sward and low grounds a thin film of mist was stealing like smoke, marking the distances with a transparent veil, and here and there we could see the river faintly flashing in the moonlight. No softer, sweeter scene could be imagined. The news I had just heard made it melancholy, but nothing could disturb its character of profound serenity and the enchanted glory and vagueness of the prospect. My father, who enjoyed the picturesque, and I, stood looking in silence over the expanse beneath us, the two good governesses standing a little way behind us discoursed upon the scene and were eloquent upon the moon. Madame Peridon was fat, middle-aged and romantic and talked and sighed poetically. Mademoiselle de La Fontaine, in right of her father who was a German, assumed to be psychological, metaphysical and something of a mystic, now declared that when the moon shone with a light so intense it was well known that it indicated special spiritual activity. The effect of the full moon in such a state of brilliancy was manifold. It acted on dreams, it acted on lunacy, it acted on nervous people, it had marvellous physical influences connected with life. Mademoiselle related that her cousin, who was a mate of a merchant ship, having taken a nap on deck on such a night, lying on his back with his face full in the light of the moon, had wakened after a dream of an old woman clawing him by the cheek, with his features horribly drawn to one side and his countenance had never quite recovered its equilibrium. The moon this night, she said, is so full of idyllic and magnetic influence, and see, when you look behind you, at the front of the schloss, how all its windows flash and twinkle with that silvery splendour, as if unseen hands had lighted up the rooms to receive fairy guests. There are indolent styles of the spirits, in which, indisposed to talk ourselves, the talk of others is pleasant to our listless ears, and I gazed on, pleased with the tinkle of the lady's conversation. I have got into one of my moping moods tonight, said my father, after a silence and quoting Shakespeare, whom by way of keeping up our English we used to read aloud, he said, In truth, I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me. You say it wearies you. But how I got it, came by it. I forget the rest, but I feel as if some great misfortune were hanging over us. I suppose the poor general's afflicted letter has had something to do with it. At this moment, the unwonted sound of carriage wheels and many hoofs upon the road arrested our attention. They seemed to be approaching from the high ground overlooking the bridge, and very soon the equipage emerged from that point. The horsemen first crossed the bridge, and then came a carriage drawn by four horses, and two men rode behind. It seemed to be the travelling carriage of a person of rank, and we were all immediately absorbed in watching that very unusual spectacle. 
It became, in a few moments, greatly more interesting, for just as the carriage had passed the summit of the steep bridge, one of the leaders, taking fright, communicated his panic to the rest, and after a plunge or two, the whole team broke into a wild gallop together, and dashing between the horsemen who rode in front, came thundering along the road towards us with the speed of a hurricane. The excitement of the scene was made more painful by the clear, long-drawn screams of a female voice from the carriage window. We all advanced in curiosity and horror, me rather in silence, the rest with various ejaculations of terror. Our suspense did not last long. Just before you reached the castle drawbridge on the route they were coming, there stands by the roadside a magnificent lime tree. On the other stands an ancient stone cross, at sight of which the horses, now going at a pace that was perfectly frightful, swerved so as to bring the wheel over the projecting roots of the tree. I knew what was coming. I covered my eyes, unable to see it out, and turned my head away. At the same moment I heard a cry from my lady friends who had gone on a little. Curiosity opened my eyes, and I saw a scene of utter confusion. Two of the horses were on the ground. The carriage lay upon its side with two wheels in the air. The men were busy removing the traces, and the lady, with a commanding air and figure, had got out and stood with clasped hands, raising the handkerchief that was in them every now and again to her eyes. Through the carriage door was now lifted a young lady, who appeared to be lifeless. My dear old father was already beside the elder lady, with his hat in his hand, evidently tendering his aid and the resources of his schloss. The lady did not appear to hear him, or to have eyes for anything but the slender girl who was being placed against the slope of the bank. I approached. The young lady was apparently stunned, but she was certainly not dead. My father, who piqued himself on being something of a physician, had just had his fingers on her wrist and assured the lady, who declared herself her mother, that her pulse, though faint and irregular, was undoubtedly still distinguishable. The lady clasped her hands and looked upward, as if in a momentary transport of gratitude, but immediately she broke out again in that theatrical way, which is, I believe, natural to some people. She was what is called a fine-looking woman for her time of life, and must have been handsome. She was tall, but not thin, and dressed in black velvet, and looked rather pale, but with a proud and commanding countenance, though now agitated strangely. Who was ever being so born to calamity, I heard her say with clasped hands as I came up. Here am I on a journey of life and death, in prosecuting which to lose an hour is possibly to lose all. My child will not have recovered sufficiently to resume her route, for who can say how long? I must leave her. I cannot, dare not delay. How far on, sir, can you tell is the nearest village? I must leave her there, and shall not see my darling, or even hear of her, till my return three months hence. I plucked my father by the coat and whispered earnestly in his ear, O oh, Papa, pray ask to let her stay with us. It will be so delightful. Do, pray. If Madame will entrust her child to the care of my daughter and of her good gouvernante, Madame Perdon, and permit her to remain as our guest under my charge until her return, it will confer a distinction and an obligation upon us, and we shall treat her with all the care and devotion which so sacred a trust deserves. I cannot do that, sir. It would be to task your kindness and chivalry too cruelly, said the lady distractedly. It would, on the contrary, be to confer on us a very great kindness, at a moment when we most need it. My daughter has just been disappointed by a cruel misfortune in a visit for which she had long anticipated a great deal of happiness. If you confide this young lady to our care, it will be her best consolation. The nearest village on your route is distant and affords no such inn as you could think of placing your daughter at. You cannot allow her to continue her journey for any considerable distance without danger. If, as you say, you cannot suspend your journey, you must part with her tonight, and nowhere could you do so with more honest assurance of care and tenderness than here. There was something in this lady's air and appearance so distinguished and even imposing, and in her manner so engaging, as to impress one quite apart from the dignity of her equipage, with the conviction that she was a person of consequence. By this time the carriage was replaced in its upright position, and the horses, quite tractable, in the traces again. The lady threw on her daughter a glance, which I fancied was not quite so affectionate as one might have anticipated from the beginning of the scene. Then she beckoned slightly to my father, and withdrew two or three steps with him out of hearing, and talked to him with a fixed and stern countenance, not at all like that with which she had hitherto spoken. 
I was filled with wonder that my father did not seem to perceive the change, and also unspeakably curious to learn what it could be that she was speaking about, almost in his ear, with so much earnestness and rapidity. Two or three minutes at most, I think, she remained thus employed, and then she turned, and a few steps brought her to where her daughter lay, supported by Madame Perradon. She kneeled beside her for a moment and whispered, as Madame supposed, a little benediction in her ear. Then, hastily kissing her, she stepped into her carriage. The door was closed. The footmen in stately liveries jumped up behind. The outriders spurred on. The postilions cracked their whips. The horses plunged and broke suddenly into a furious canter that threatened soon again to become a gallop. And the carriage whirled away, followed at the same rapid pace by the two horsemen in the rear. Carmilla three. We compare notes. We followed the cortege with our eyes until it was swiftly lost to sight in the misty wood, and the very sound of the hooves and the wheels died away in the silent night air. Nothing remained to assure us that the adventure had not been an illusion of a moment, but the young lady, who just at that moment opened her eyes. I could not see, for her face was turned from me, but she raised her head, evidently looking about her, and I heard a very sweet voice asking complainingly, "'Where is Mamma?" Our good Madame Peridon answered tenderly and added some comfortable assurances. I then heard her ask, "'Where am I? Where is this place?' And after that she said, "'I don't see the carriage, and Matska, where is she?' Madame answered all her questions in so far as she understood them, and gradually the young lady remembered how the misadventure came about, and was glad to hear that no one in or in attendance on the carriage was hurt, and on learning that her mamma had left her there till her return in about three months, she wept. I was going to add my consolations to those of Madame Peridon when Mademoiselle de la Fontaine placed her hand upon my arm, saying, Don't approach, one at a time is as much as she can at present converse with. A very little excitement would possibly overpower her now. As soon as she is comfortably in bed, I thought, I will run up to her room and see her. My father, in the meantime, had sent a servant on horseback for the physician, who lived about two leagues away, and a bedroom was being prepared for the young lady's reception. The stranger now rose and, leaning on Madame's arm, walked slowly over the drawbridge and into the castle gate. In the hall, servants waited to receive her, and she was conducted forthwith to her room. The room we usually sat in as our drawing-room is long, having four windows that looked over the moat and the drawbridge upon the forest scene I have just described. It is furnished in old carved oak with large carved cabinets, and the chairs are cushioned with crimson Utrecht velvet. The walls are covered with tapestry and surrounded with great gold frames, the figures being as large as life, in ancient and very curious costume and the subjects represented are hunting, hawking, and generally festive. It is not too stately to be extremely comfortable, and here we had our tea, for with his usual patriotic leanings he insisted that the national beverage should make its appearance regularly with our coffee and chocolate. We sat here this night, and with candles lighted were talking over the adventure of the evening. Madame Peridon and Mademoiselle de la Fontaine were both of our party, the young stranger had hardly lain down in her bed when she sank into a deep sleep, and those ladies had left her in the care of a servant. "'How do you like our guest?' I asked, as soon as Madame entered. "'Tell me all about her.' "'I like her extremely,' answered Madame. "'She is, I almost think, the prettiest creature I ever saw, about your age, and so gentle and nice. She is absolutely beautiful, threw in Mademoiselle, who had peeped for a moment into the stranger's room. And such a sweet voice, added Madame Peridon. Did you remark a woman in the carriage after it was set up again who did not get out, inquired Mademoiselle, but only looked from the window? No, we hadn't seen her. Then she described a hideous black woman with a sort of coloured turban on her head, and who was gazing all the time from the carriage window, nodding and grinning derisively toward the ladies with gleaming eyes and large white eyeballs, and her teeth set as if in fury. 
Did you remark what an ill-looking pack of men those servants were? asked madame. Yes, said my father, who had just come in. Ugly, hang-dog-looking fellows as ever I beheld in my life. I hope they mayn't rob the poor lady in the forest. They're clever rogues, however. They got everything to write in a minute. I dare say they're wound out with too long travelling, said madame. Besides looking wicked, their faces were so strangely lean and dark and sullen. I'm very curious, I own, but I dare say the young lady will tell you all about it tomorrow if she is sufficiently recovered. I don't think she will, said my father with a mysterious smile and a little nod of his head as if he knew more about it than he cared to tell us. This made us all the more inquisitive as to what had passed between him and the lady in the black velvet in the brief but earnest interview that had immediately preceded her departure. We were scarcely alone when I entreated him to tell me. He didn't need much pressing. There's no particular reason why I shouldn't tell you. She expressed a reluctance to trouble us with the care of her daughter, saying she was in delicate health and nervous, but not subject to any kind of seizure, she volunteered that, nor to any illusion, being in fact perfectly sane. How very odd to say all that, I interpolated. It was so unnecessary. In all events, it was said, he laughed, and as you wish to know all that passed, which was indeed very little, I tell you, she then said, I am making a long journey of vital importance, she emphasised the word, rapid and secret. I shall return for my child in three months. In the meantime, she will be silent as to who we are, whence we come, and whither we are travelling. That's all she said. She spoke very pure French. When she said the word secret, she paused for a few seconds, looking sternly, her eyes fixed on mine. I fancy she makes a great point of that. You saw how quickly she was gone. I hope I haven't done a very foolish thing in taking charge of the young lady. For my part, I was delighted. I was longing to see and talk to her, and only waiting till the doctor should give me leave. You, who live in towns, can have no idea how great an event the introduction of a new friend is in such a solitude as surrounded us. The doctor didn't arrive till nearly one o'clock, but I could no more have gone to my bed and slept than I could have overtaken on foot the carriage in which the princess in black velvet had driven away. When the physician came down to the drawing-room, it was to report very favourably upon his patient. She was now sitting up, her pulse quite regular, apparently perfectly well. She had sustained no injury, and the little shock to her nerves had passed away quite harmlessly. There could be no harm certainly in my seeing her, if we both wished it and, with his permission, I sent forthwith to know whether she would allow me to visit her for a few minutes in her room. The servant returned immediately to say that she desired nothing more. You may be sure I was not long in availing myself of this permission. Our visitor lay in one of the handsomest rooms in the Schloss. It was, perhaps, a little stately. There was a sombre piece of tapestry opposite the foot of the bed, representing Cleopatra with the asps to her bosom and other solemn classic scenes were displayed, a little faded, upon the other walls. But there was a gold carving, and rich and varied colour enough in the other decorations of the room to more than redeem the gloom of the old tapestry. There were candles at the bedside. She was sitting up, her slender, pretty figure enveloped by the soft silk dressing-gown, embroidered with flowers and lined with thick quilted silk, which her mother had thrown over her feet as she lay upon the ground. What was it that, as I reached the bedside and had just begun my little greeting, struck me dumb in a moment and made me recoil a step or two from her? I'll tell you. I saw the very face which had visited me in my childhood at night, which remained so fixed in my memory, and on which I had for so many years so often ruminated with horror when no one suspected of what I was thinking. It was pretty, even beautiful and when I first beheld it, wore the same melancholy expression. But this almost instantly lighted into a strange fixed smile of recognition. There was a silence of fully a minute, and then, at length, she spoke. I could not. How wonderful, she exclaimed. Twelve years ago I saw your face in a dream, and it has haunted me ever since. Wonderful indeed, I repeated overcoming with an effort the horror that had for a time suspended my utterances. Twelve years ago, in vision or reality, I certainly saw you. I couldn't forget your face. It's remained before my eyes ever since. 
Her smile had softened. Whatever I had fancied strange in it was gone, and it and her dimpling cheeks were now delightfully pretty and intelligent. I felt reassured, and continued more in the vein which hospitality indicated to bid her welcome, and to tell her how much pleasure her accidental arrival had given us all, and especially what a happiness it was to me. I took her hand as I spoke. I was a little shy, as lonely people are, but the situation made me eloquent and even bold. She pressed my hand, she laid hers upon it, and her eyes glowed, as looking hastily into mine she smiled again, and blushed. She answered my welcome very prettily. I sat down beside her, still wondering, and she said, I must tell you my vision about you. It is so very strange that you and I should have had each of the other so vivid a dream, that each should have seen I you and you me, looking as we do now, when, of course, we were both mere children. I was a child about six years old, and I awoke from a confused and troubled dream and found myself in a room unlike my nursery wainscoted clumsily in some dark wood and with cupboards and bedsteads and chairs and benches placed about it. The beds were, I thought, all empty in the room itself without any one but myself in it, and I, after looking about me for some time, and admiring especially an iron candlestick with two branches, which I should certainly know again, crept under one of the beds to reach the window, but as I got from under the bed I heard someone crying and looked up. While I was still upon my knees I saw you, most assuredly you, as I see you now, a beautiful young lady with golden hair and large blue eyes and lips, your lips, you, as you are here. Your looks won me. I climbed on the bed and put my arms about you, and I think we both fell asleep. I was aroused by a scream. You were sitting up screaming. I was frightened and slipped down upon the ground, and, it seemed to me, lost consciousness for a moment, and when I came to myself, I was again in my nursery at home. Your face I have never forgotten since. I couldn't be misled by mere resemblance. You are the lady whom I saw then. It was now my turn to relate my corresponding vision, which I did, to the undisguised wonder of my new acquaintance. I don't know which should be most afraid of the other, she said again, smiling. If you were less pretty, I think I should be very much afraid of you, but... Being as you are, and you and I both so young, I feel only that I have made your acquaintance twelve years ago, and have already a right to your intimacy. At all events, it does seem as if we were destined from our earliest childhood to be friends. I wonder whether you feel as strangely drawn towards me as I do to you. I have never had a friend. Shall I find one now? She sighed, and her fine, dark eyes gazed passionately on me. Now, the truth is, I felt rather unaccountably towards the beautiful stranger. I did feel, as she said, drawn towards her. But there was also something of repulsion. In this ambiguous feeling, however, the sense of attraction immensely prevailed. She interested and won me. She was so beautiful and so indescribably engaging. I perceived now something of languor an exhaustion stealing over her, and hastened to bid her good night. The doctor thinks, I added, that you ought to have a maid to sit up with you tonight. One of ours is waiting, and you'll find her a very useful and quiet creature. How kind of you, but I couldn't sleep. I never could with an attendant in the room. I shan't require any assistance, and shall I confess my weakness? I am haunted with the terror of robbers. Our house was robbed once, and two servants murdered, so I always lock my door. It's become a habit. And you look so kind, I know you'll forgive me. I see there's a key in the lock. She held me close in her pretty arms for a moment and whispered in my ear, Good night, darling. It's very hard to part with you, but good night. Tomorrow, but not early. I shall see you again. She sank back on the pillow with a sigh, and her fine eyes followed me with a fond and melancholy gaze, and she murmured again, Good night, dear friend. Young people like and even love on impulse. I was flattered by the evident, though as yet undeserved, fondness she showed me. I liked the confidence with which she at once received me. She was determined that we should be very near friends. Next day came and we met again. I was delighted with my companion, that is to say, in many respects. Her looks lost nothing in daylight. 
she was certainly the most beautiful creature I had ever seen, and the unpleasant remembrance of the face presented in my early dream had lost the effect of the first unexpected recognition. She confessed that she had experienced a similar shock in seeing me, and precisely the same faint antipathy that had mingled with my admiration of her. We now laughed together over our momentary horrors. Carmilla, four. Her habits, a saunter. I told you that I was charmed with her in most particulars. There were some that didn't please me so well. She was above the middle height of women. I shall begin by describing her. She was slender and wonderfully graceful, except that her movements were languid, very languid indeed. There was nothing in her appearance to indicate an invalid. Her complexion was rich and brilliant. Her features were small and beautifully formed. Her eyes large, dark and lustrous. Her hair was quite wonderful. I never saw hair so magnificently thick and long when it was down about her shoulders. I have often placed my hands under it and laughed with wonder at its weight. It was exquisitely fine and soft, and in colour a rich, very dark brown with something of gold. I loved to let it down, tumbling with its own weight, as in her room she lay back in her chair, talking in her sweet low voice. I used to fold and braid it and spread it out and play with it, Heavens, if I had but known all. I said there were particulars which did not please me. I've told you that her confidence won me the first night I saw her, but I found that she exercised with respect to herself, her mother, her history, everything in fact connected with her life, plans and people, an ever wakeful reserve. I dare say I was unreasonable, perhaps I was wrong. I dare say I ought to have respected the solemn injunction laid upon my father by this stately lady in black velvet. But curiosity is a restless and unscrupulous passion, and no one girl can endure with patience that hers should be baffled by another. What harm could it do anyone to tell me what I so ardently desired to know? Had she no trust in my good sense or honour? Why would she not believe me when I assured her so solemnly that I wouldn't divulge one syllable of what she told me to any mortal breathing. There was a coldness, it seemed to me, beyond her years, in her smiling, melancholy, persistent refusal to afford me the least ray of light. I can't say we quarrelled upon this point, for she wouldn't quarrel upon any. It was, of course, very unfair of me to press her very ill-bred, but I really couldn't help it, and I might just as well have left it alone. What she did tell me amounted, in my unconscionable estimation, to nothing. It was all summed up in three very vague disclosures. First, her name was Carmilla. Second, her family was very ancient and noble. Third, her home lay in the direction of the West. She wouldn't tell me the name of her family, nor their armorial bearings, nor the name of their estate, nor even that of the country they lived in. You are not to suppose that I worried her incessantly on these subjects. I watched opportunity and rather insinuated than urged my inquiries. Once or twice, indeed, I did attack her more directly, but no matter what my tactics, utter failure was invariably the result. Reproaches and caresses were all lost upon her, but I must add this, that her evasion was conducted with so pretty a melancholy and deprecation with so many and even passionate declarations of a liking for me and trust in my honour, and with so many promises that I should at last know all, that I couldn't find it in my heart long to be offended with her. She used to place her pretty arms about my neck, draw me to her, and laying her cheek to mine, murmur with her lips near my ear, Dearest, your little heart is wounded. Think me not cruel because I obey the irresistible law of my strength and weakness. If your dear heart is wounded, my wild heart bleeds with yours. In the rapture of my enormous humiliation I live in your warm life, and you shall die, sweetly die, into mine. I can't help it, as I draw near to you, you in your turn will draw near to others, and learn the rapture of that cruelty which yet is love, 
So, for a while, seek to know no more of me and mine, but trust me with all your loving spirit. Her agitations and her language were unintelligible to me. And when she had spoken such a rhapsody, she would press me more closely in her trembling embrace, and her lips in soft kisses gently glow upon my cheek. Her agitations and her language were unintelligible to me. From these foolish embraces, which were not of very frequent occurrence, I must allow, I used to wish to extricate myself, but my energy seemed to fail me. Her murmured words sounded like a lullaby in my ear, and soothed my resistance into a trance from which I only seemed to recover myself when she withdrew her arms. In these mysterious moods, I didn't like her. I experienced a strange, tumultuous excitement that was pleasurable ever and anon, mingled with a vague sense of fear and disgust. I had no distinct thoughts about her while such scenes lasted, but I was conscious of a love growing into adoration and also of abhorrence. This, I know, is a paradox but I can make no other attempt to explain the feeling. I now write, after an interval of more than ten years, with a trembling hand, with a confused and horrible recollection of certain occurrences and situations, in the ordeal through which I was unconsciously passing, though with a vivid and very sharp remembrance of the main current of my story. But, I suspect in all lives there are certain emotional scenes those in which our passions have been most wildly and terribly roused, that are of all others the most vaguely and dimly remembered. Sometimes, after an hour of apathy, my strange and beautiful companion would take my hand and hold it with a fond pressure, renewed again and again, blushing softly, gazing in my face with languid and burning eyes and breathing so fast that her dress rose and fell with a tumultuous respiration. It was like the ardour of a lover, it embarrassed me, it was hateful and yet overpowering, and with gloating eyes she drew me to her, and her hot lips travelled along my cheek in kisses, and she would whisper almost in sobs, You are mine, you shall be mine, you and I are one for ever. Then she had thrown herself back in her chair with her small hands over her eyes, leaving me trembling. Are we related? I used to ask. What can you mean by all this? I remind you perhaps of someone whom you love, but you must not. I hate it. I don't know you. I don't know myself when you look so and talk so. She used to sigh at my vehemence, then turn away and drop my hand. Respecting these very extraordinary manifestations, I strove in vain to form any satisfactory theory. I couldn't refer them to affectation or trick. It was unmistakably the momentary breaking out of suppressed instinct and emotion. Was she, notwithstanding her mother's volunteer denial, subject to brief visitations of insanity, or was there here a disguise in a romance? I had read in old storybooks of such things. What if a boyish lover had found his way into the house and sought to prosecute his suit in masquerade with the assistance of a clever old adventuress? But there were many things against this hypothesis highly interesting as it was to my vanity. I could boast of no little attention such as masculine gallantry delights to offer. Between these passionate moments there were long intervals of commonplace, of gaiety, of brooding melancholy, during which, except that I detected her eyes so full of melancholy fire following me, at times I might have been as nothing to her, except in these brief periods of mysterious excitement her ways were girlish, and there was always a languor about her, quite incompatible with a masculine system in a state of health. In some respects her habits were odd, perhaps not so singular in the opinion of a town lady like you as they appeared to us rustic people. She used to come down very late, generally not until one o'clock. She would then take a cup of chocolate but eat nothing. We then went out for a walk, which was a mere saunter, and she seemed almost immediately exhausted, and either returned to the schloss or sat on one of the benches that were placed here and there among the trees. This was a bodily language in which her mind did not sympathise. She was always an animated talker, and very intelligent. She sometimes alluded for a moment to her own home, or mentioned an adventure or situation, or an early recollection, which indicated the people of strange manners, and described customs of which we knew nothing. 
I gathered from these chance hints that her native country was much more remote than I had at first fancied. As we sat thus one afternoon under the trees, a funeral passed us by. It was that of a pretty young girl whom I had often seen, the daughter of one of the rangers of the forest. The poor man was walking behind the coffin of his darling. She was his only child, and he looked quite heartbroken. Peasants walking two and two came behind. They were singing a funeral hymn. I rose to mark my respect as they passed and joined in the hymn they were very sweetly singing. My companion shook me a little roughly, and I turned surprised. She said brusquely, Don't you perceive how discordant that is? I think it very sweet on the contrary, I answered, vexed at her interruption, and very uncomfortable, lest the people who composed the little procession should observe and resent what was passing. I resumed, therefore, instantly, and was again interrupted. You pierce my ears, said Carmilla almost angrily, and stopping her ears with her tiny fingers. Besides, how can you tell that your religion and mine are the same? Your forms wound me, and I hate funerals. What a fuss! Why, you must die, everyone must die, and all are happier when they do. Come home. My father has gone with the clergyman to the churchyard. I thought you knew she was to be buried today. She? I don't trouble my head about peasants. I don't know who she is, answered Carmilla, with a flash from her fine eyes. She is the poor girl who fancied she saw a ghost a fortnight ago, and has been dying ever since till yesterday when she expired. Tell me nothing about ghosts. I shan't sleep tonight if you do. I hope there's no plague or fever coming. All this looks very like it, I continued. The swineherd's young wife died only a week ago, and she thought something seized her by the throat as she lay in bed and nearly strangled her. Papa says such horrible fancies do accompany some forms of fever. She was quite well the day before. She sank afterwards and died before a week. Well, her funeral is over, I hope, and her hymn sung and our ears shan't be tortured with that discord and jargon. It has made me nervous. Sit down here beside me, sit close, hold my hand, press it hard, hard, harder. We had moved a little back, and she had come to another seat. She sat down. Her face underwent a change that alarmed and even terrified me for a moment. It darkened and became horribly livid. Her teeth and hands were clenched, and she frowned and compressed her lips while she stared down upon the ground at her feet, and trembled all over with a continued shudder, as irrepressible as ague. All her energies seemed strained to suppress a fit, with which she was then breathlessly tugging, and at length a low convulsive cry of suffering broke from her, and gradually the hysteria subsided. There, that comes of strangling people with him, she said at last. Hold me, hold me still. It's passing away. And so, Gradually it did, and perhaps to dissipate the sombre impression which the spectacle had left upon me, she became unusually animated and chatty, and so we got home. This was the first time I had seen her exhibit any definable symptoms of that delicacy of health which her mother had spoken of. It was the first time also I had seen her exhibit anything like temper. Both passed away like a summer cloud, and never but once afterwards did I witness on her part, a momentary sign of anger. I will tell you how it happened. She and I were looking out of one of the long drawing-room windows when there entered the courtyard over the drawbridge a figure of a wanderer whom I knew very well. He used to visit the Schloss generally twice a year. It was the figure of a hunchback with the sharp, lean features that generally accompanied deformity. He wore a pointed black beard and he was smiling from ear to ear showing his white fangs. He was dressed in buff, black and scarlet, and crossed with more straps and belts than I could count, from which hung all manner of things. Behind he carried a magic lantern and two boxes, which I well knew. In one of them was a salamander, and in another a mandrake. These monsters used to make my father laugh. They were compounded of parts of monkeys, parrots, squirrels, fish and hedgehogs, dried and stitched together with great neatness and startling effect. He had a fiddle a box of conjuring apparatus, a pair of foils and masks attached to his belt, several other mysterious cases dangling about him, and a black staff with copper ferules in his hand. His companion was a rough, spared dog that followed at his heels but stopped short, suspiciously at the drawbridge, and in a little while began to howl dismally. 
In the meantime, the mountebank standing in the midst of the courtyard raised his grotesque hat and made us a very ceremonious bow, paying his compliments very volubly in execrable French and German not much better. Then, disengaging his fiddle, he began to scrape a lively air to which he sang with a merry discord, dancing with ludicrous airs and activity that made me laugh in spite of the dog's howling. Then he advanced to the window with many smiles and salutations, and his hat in his left hand, his fiddle under his arm, and with a fluency that never took breath he gabbled, a long advertisement of all his accomplishments, and the resources of the various arts which he placed at our service, and the curiosities and entertainments which it was in his power, at our bidding, to display. Will your ladyships be pleased to buy an amulet against the upir which is going like the wolf I hear through these woods? he said, dropping his hat on the pavement. They are dying a bit right and left, and here is a charm that never fails, only pinned to the pillow, and you may laugh in his face. These charms consisted of oblong slips of vellum, with cabalistic ciphers and diagrams upon them. Carmilla instantly purchased one, and so did I. He was looking up, and we were smiling down upon him, amused, at least I can answer for myself. His piercing black eye, as he looked up in our faces, seemed to detect something that fixed for a moment his curiosity. In an instant he enrolled a leather case full of all manner of odd little steel instruments. See here, my lady, he said, displaying it and addressing me. I profess, among other things, less useful the art of dentistry. Plague, take the dog, he interpolated. Silence, beast! He howls so that your ladyships can scarcely hear a word. Your noble friend, the young lady at your right, has the sharpest tooth. Long, thin, pointed like an oar, like a needle. <laughs> With my sharp and long sight as I look up, I've seen it distinctly. Now, if it happens to hurt the young lady, and I think it must, here am I. Here are my file, my punch, my nippers. I will make it round and blunt, if her ladyship pleases. No longer the tooth of a fish, but of a beautiful young lady as she is. Eh? Hey, is the young lady displeased? Have I been too bold? Have I offended her? The young lady indeed looked very angry as she drew back from the window. How dares that mountebank insult us so? Where is your father? I shall demand redress from him. My father would have had the wretch tied to the pump and flogged with a cart whip and burnt to the bones with a cattle brand. She retired from the window a step or two and sat down, and had hardly lost sight of the offender when her wrath subsided as suddenly as it had arisen, and she gradually recovered her usual tone and seemed to forget the little hunchback and his follies. My father was out of spirits that evening, and coming in he told us that there had been another case very similar to the two fatal ones which had lately occurred. The sister of a young peasant on his estate only a mile away was very ill, had been, as she described it, attacked very nearly in the same way, and was now slowly but steadily sinking. All this, said my father, is strictly referable to natural causes. These poor people infect one another with their superstitions and so repeat in imagination the images of terror that have infested their neighbours. But that very circumstance frightens one horribly, said Carmilla. How so? inquired my father. I am so afraid of fancying I see such things, I think it will be as bad as reality. We are in God's hands, nothing can happen without his permission, and all will end well for those who love him. He is our faithful creator, he has made us all, and will take care of us. Creator? Nature? said the young lady in answer to my gentle father. And this disease that invades the country is natural. Nature? All things proceed from nature, don't they? All things in the heaven, in the earth, and under the earth act and live as nature ordains. I think so. The doctor said he would come here today, said my father, after a silence. I want to know what he thinks about it, and what he thinks we had better do. Doctors never did me any good, said Carmilla. Then have you been ill? I asked. More ill than ever you were, she answered. Long ago, yes, a long time, I suffered from this very illness, but I forget all but my pain and weakness, and they were not so bad as I suffered in other diseases. You were very young then, I dare say. L let's talk no more about it. You would not wound a friend. She looked languidly in my eyes and passed her arm around my waist lovingly, and led me out of the room. My father was busy over some papers near the window. Why does your papa like to frighten us, said the pretty girl with a sigh and a little shudder. He doesn't, dear Carmilla. It is the very furthest thing from his mind. 
are you afraid, dearest? I should be very much if I fancied there was any real danger of me being attacked as those poor people were. You're afraid to die? Yes, everyone is. But to die as lovers may, to die together so that they may live together. Girls are caterpillars while I live in the world, to be finally butterflies when the summer comes, but in the meantime there are grubs and larvae, don't you see, each with their peculiar propensities, necessities and structure. So says Monsieur Buffon in his big book in the next room. Later in the day the doctor came and was closeted with Papa for some time. He was a skilful man of sixty and upwards. He wore powder and shaved his pale face as smooth as a pumpkin. He and Papa emerged from the room together, and I heard Papa laugh and say as they came out, Well, I do wonder at a wise man like you. What do you say to hippogriffs and dragons? The doctor was smiling and made answer, shaking his head. Nevertheless, life and death are mysterious states, and we know little of the resources of either. And so they walked on, and I heard no more. I did not then know what the doctor had been broaching, but I think I guess it now. Carmilla, five, a wonderful likeness. This evening there arrived from Graz the grave, dark-faced son of the picture cleaner, with a horse and cart laden with two large packing cases, having many pictures in each. It was a journey of ten leagues, and whenever a messenger arrived at the Schloss from our little capital of Graz, we used to crowd about him in the hall to hear the news. This arrival created in our secluded quarters quite a sensation. The cases remained in the hall, and the messenger was taken charge of by the servants till he had eaten his supper. Then, with assistance and armed with hammer, ripping chisel and turnscrew, he met us in the hall, where we had assembled to witness the unpacking of the cases. Carmilla sat looking listlessly on, while one after the other the old pictures, nearly all portraits, which had undergone the process of renovation were brought to light. My mother was of an old Hungarian family, and most of these pictures, which were about to be restored to their places, had come to us through her. My father had a list in his hand from which he read as the artist rummaged out the corresponding numbers. I don't know that the pictures were very good, but they were undoubtedly very old, and some of them very curious also. They had, for the most part, the merit of being now seen by me, I may say, for the first time, for the smoke and dust of time had all but obliterated them. There's a picture that I have not yet seen, said my father. In one corner at the top of it is the name, as well as I could read, Marcia Karnstein, and the date, 1698, and I'm curious to see how it's turned out. I remembered it. It was a small picture, about a foot and a half high, and nearly square, without a frame, but it was so blackened by age that I couldn't make it out. The artist now produced it with evident pride. It was quite beautiful. It was startling. It seemed to live. It was the effigy of Carmilla. Carmilla, dear, he is an absolute miracle. Here you are, living, smiling, ready to speak in this picture. Isn't it beautiful, Papa? And see, even the little mole on her throat. My father laughed and said, Certainly it's a wonderful likeness. But he looked away, and to my surprise seemed but little struck by it, and went on talking to the picture cleaner, who was also something of an artist, and discoursed with intelligence about the portraits or other works which his art had just brought into light and colour, while I was more and more lost in wonder the more I looked at the picture. "'Will you let me hang this picture in my room, Papa?' I asked. "'Certainly, dear,' said he, smiling. "'I'm very glad you think it's so like. It must be prettier even than I thought it, if it is.' The young lady didn't acknowledge this pretty speech and didn't seem to hear it. She was leaning back in her seat, her fine eyes under their long lashes gazing on me in contemplation and she smiled in a kind of rapture. And now you can read quite plainly the name that is written in the corner. It's not Marcia. It looks as if it was done in gold. The name is Merchala, Countess Karnstein, and this is a little coronet over and underneath, A.D. 1698. I am descended from the Karnsteins, that is, Mama was. Ah, said the lady languidly, so am I. I think a very long descent, very ancient. Are there any Karnsteins living now? None who bear the name, I believe, the family were ruined, I believe, in some civil wars long ago, but the ruins of the castle are only about three miles away. 
How interesting, she said languidly. But see what beautiful moonlight. She glanced through the hall door which stood a little open. Suppose you take a little ramble round the court and look down at the road and river. It's so like the night you came to us, I said. She sighed, smiling. She rose, and each with her arm about the other's waist, we walked out upon the pavement. In silence, slowly we walked down to the drawbridge, where the beautiful landscape opened before us. And so you were thinking of the night I came here, she almost whispered. Are you glad I came? Delighted, dear Carmilla, I answered. And you ask for the picture you think like me, to hang in your room, she murmured with a sigh, as she drew her arm closer about my waist and let her pretty head sink upon my shoulder. How romantic you are, Carmilla, I said. Whenever you tell me a story, it were made up chiefly of some great romance. She kissed me silently. I'm sure, Carmilla, that you have been in love, that there is at this moment an affair of the heart going on. I have been in love with no one. I never shall, she whispered, unless it should be with you. How beautiful she looked in the moonlight. Shy and strange was the look with which she quickly hid her face in my neck and hair, with tumultuous sighs that seemed almost a sob, and pressed in mine a hand that trembled. Her soft cheek was glowing against mine. Darling, darling, she murmured, I live in you, and you would die for me, I love you so. I started from her. She was gazing on me with eyes from which all fire or meaning had flown and a face colourless and apathetic. Is there a chill in the air, dear, she said drowsily. I almost shiver. Have I been dreaming? Let us come in, come, come in. Y you look ill, Carmilla, a little faint. You certainly must take some wine, I said. Yes, I will, I'm better now. I shall be quite well in a few minutes. Yes, do give me a little wine, answered Carmilla as we approached the door. Let us look again for a moment. It's the last time, perhaps, I shall see the moonlight with you. How do you feel now, dear Carmilla? Are you really better? I asked. I was beginning to take alarm, lest she should have been stricken with the strange epidemic that they say had invaded the country about us. Papa would be grieved beyond measure, I added, if he thought you were ever so little ill without immediately letting us know. We have a very skilful doctor near us, the physician who was with Papa today. I'm sure he is. I know how kind you all are, but, dear child, I'm quite well again. There's nothing ever wrong with me but a little weakness. People say I'm languid, I'm incapable of exertion, I can scarcely walk as far as a child of three years old, and every now and then the little strength I have falters, and I become as you've just seen me. But after all, I'm very easily set up again. In a moment, I'm perfectly myself. See how I've recovered. So indeed she had and she and I talked a great deal, and very animated she was, and the remainder of that evening passed without any recurrence of what I called her infatuations, I mean her crazy talk and looks, which embarrassed and even frightened me. But there occurred that night an event which gave my thoughts quite a new turn, and seemed to startle even Carmilla's languid nature into momentary energy. Six, a very strange agony. When we got into the drawing room and had sat down to our coffee and chocolate, although Carmela did not take any, she seemed quite herself again, and Madame and Mademoiselle de la Fontaine joined us and made a little card party, in the course of which Papa came in for what he called his dish of tea. When the game was over, he sat down beside Carmela on the sofa and asked her a little anxiously whether she had heard from her mother since her arrival. She answered, no. He then asked whether she knew where a letter would reach her at present. I cannot tell, she answered ambiguously. But I have been thinking of leaving you. You have been already too hospitable and too kind to me. I have given you an infinity of trouble, and I should wish to take a carriage tomorrow and post in pursuit of her. I know where I shall ultimately find her, although I dare not tell you. But you must not dream of any such thing, exclaimed my father to my great relief. We can't afford to lose you so, and I won't consent to your leaving us except under the care of your mother, who was so good as to consent to your remaining with us till she should herself return. I should be quite happy if I knew that you had heard from her, but this evening the accounts of the progress of the mysterious disease that has invaded our neighbourhood grow even more alarming, 
and my beautiful guest, I do feel the responsibility, unaided by advice from your mother, very much. But I shall do my best, and one thing is certain, that you must not think of leaving us without her distinct direction to that effect. We should suffer too much in parting from you to consent to it easily. Thank you, sir, a thousand times for your hospitality, she answered, smiling bashfully. You have all been too kind to me. I have seldom been so happy in all my life before, as in your beautiful chateau, under your care, and in the society of your dear daughter. So he gallantly, in his old-fashioned way, kissed her hand, smiling, and pleased at her little speech. I accompanied Carmilla as usual to her room, and sat and chatted with her while she was preparing for bed. Do you think, I said at length, that you will ever confide fully in me? She turned round, smiling, but made no answer, only continued to smile at me. You won't answer that, I said. You can't answer pleasantly. I ought not to have asked you. You were quite right to ask me that, or anything. You do not know how dear you are to me, or you could not think any confidence too great to look for. But I am under vows. No nun half so awfully, and I dare not tell my story yet, even to you. The time is very near when you shall know everything. You will think me cruel, very selfish, but love is always selfish. The more ardent, the more selfish. How jealous I am, you cannot know. You must come with me, loving me to death, or else hate me and still come with me, and hating me through death and after. There is no such word as indifference in my apathetic nature. Now, Carmilla, you're going to talk your wild nonsense again, I said hastily. Not I, silly little fool as I am, and full of whims and fancies. For your sake, I'll talk like a sage. Were you ever at a ball? No. How oh, you do run on. What's it like? How charming it must be. You're not so old. Your first ball can hardly be forgotten yet. I remember everything about it, with an effort. I see it all, as divers see what is going on above them through a medium, dense, rippling, but transparent. There occurred that night what has confused the picture and made its colours faint. I was all but assassinated in my bed, wounded, here, she touched her breast, and never was the same since. Were you near dying? Yes, very. A cruel love, strange love, that would have taken my life. Love will have its sacrifices. No sacrifice without blood. Let us go to sleep now. I feel so lazy. How can I get up just now and lock my door? She was lying with her tiny hands buried in her rich wavy hair under her cheek, her little head upon the pillow, and her glittering eyes followed me wherever I moved, with a kind of shy smile that I couldn't decipher. I bid her good night and crept from the room with an uncomfortable sensation. I often wondered whether our pretty guest ever said her prayers. I certainly had never seen her upon her knees. In the morning she never came down until long after our family prayers were over and at night she never left the drawing-room to attend our brief evening prayers in the hall. If it had not been that it had casually come out in one of our careless talks that she had been baptised, I should have doubted her being a Christian. Religion was a subject on which I had never heard her speak a word. If I had known the world better, this particular neglect or antipathy would have not so much surprised me. The precautions of nervous people are infectious, and persons of a like temperament are pretty sure after a time, to imitate them. I had adopted Carmilla's habit of locking her bedroom door, having taken into my head all her whimsical alarms about midnight invaders and prowling assassins. I had also adopted her precaution of making a brief search through her room to satisfy herself that no lurking assassin or robber was ensconced. These wise measures taken, I got into my bed and fell asleep. A light was burning in my room. This was an old habit of a very early date, and which nothing could have tempted me to dispense with. Thus fortified, I might take my rest in peace. But dreams come through stone walls, light up dark rooms, or darkened light ones, and their persons make their exits and their entrances as they please, and laugh at locksmiths. I had a dream that night that was the beginning of a very strange agony. I cannot call it a nightmare for I was quite conscious of being asleep. But I was equally conscious of being in my room and lying in bed precisely as I actually was. I saw, or fancied I saw, the room and its furniture, just as I had seen it last, except that it was very dark. 
and I saw something moving round the foot of the bed, which at first I couldn't accurately distinguish. But I soon saw that it was a sooty black animal that resembled a monstrous cat. It appeared to me about four or five feet long, for it measured fully the length of the hearth rug as it passed over it, and it continued toing and froing with the lithe, sinister restlessness of a beast in a cage. I couldn't cry out, although, as you may suppose, I was terrified. Its pace was growing faster, and the room rapidly darker and darker, and at length so dark that I could no longer see anything of it but its eyes. I felt it spring lightly on the bed. The two broad eyes approached my face, and suddenly I felt a stinging pain, as if two large needles darted an inch or two apart, deep into my breast. I waked with a scream. The room was lighted by the candle that burnt there all through the night, and I saw a female figure standing at the foot of the bed, a little at the right side. It was in a dark, loose dress, and its hair was down and covered its shoulders. A block of stone could not have been more still. There was not the slightest stir of respiration. As I stared at it, the figure appeared to have changed its place and was now nearer the door, then close to it. The door opened, and it passed out. I was now relieved and able to breathe and move. My first thought was that Carmilla had been playing me a trick, and that I had forgotten to secure my door. I hastened to it, and found it locked, as usual, on the inside. I was afraid to open it. I was horrified. I sprang into my bed and covered my head up in the bedclothes, and lay there, more dead than alive, till morning. Seven. Descending. It would be vain my attempting to tell you the horror with which, even now, I recall the occurrence of that night. It was no such transitory terror as a dream leaves behind it. It seemed to deepen by time, and communicated itself to the room and the very furniture that had encompassed the apparition. I could not bear next day to be alone for a moment. I should have told Papa, but for two opposite reasons. At one time I thought he would laugh at my story and I couldn't bear it being treated as a jest. At another I thought he might fancy that I had been attacked by the mysterious complaint which had invaded our neighbourhood. I had myself no misgiving of that kind, and as he had been rather an invalid for some time I was afraid of alarming him. I was comfortable enough with my good-natured companions, Madame Peridon and the vivacious Mademoiselle La Fontaine. They both perceived that I was out of spirits and nervous and at length I told them what lay so heavy at my heart. Mademoiselle laughed, but I fancied that Madame Peridon looked anxious. By the by, said Mademoiselle, laughing, the long lime-tree walk behind Carmilla's bedroom window is haunted. Nonsense, exclaimed Madame, who probably thought the theme rather inopportune. And who tells that story, my dear? Martin says that he came up twice when the old yard gate was being repaired, before sunrise, and twice saw the same female figure walking down the Lime Tree Avenue. So he well might, as long as there are cows to milk in the river field, said Madame. I dare say, but Martin chooses to be frightened, and never did I see a fool more frightened. You must not say a word about it to Carmilla, because she can see down that walk from her room window, I interposed, and she is, if possible, a greater coward than I. Carmilla came down rather later than usual that day. I was so frightened last night, she said, so soon as we were together, and I am sure I should have seen something dreadful if it had not been for that charm I bought from the poor little hunchback whom I called such hard names. I had a dream of something black coming round my bed, and I awoke in a perfect horror, and I really thought for some seconds I saw a dark figure near the chimney-piece, but I felt under my pillow for my charm, and the moment my fingers touched it the figure disappeared, and I felt quite certain only that I had it by me, that something frightful would have made its appearance and perhaps throttled me, as it did those poor people we heard of. Well, listen to me, I began, and recounted my adventure, at the recital of which she appeared horrified. And had you the charm near you? she asked earnestly. No, I dropped it in a china vase in the drawing-room, but I shall certainly take it with me to-night, as you have so much faith in it. 
At this distance of time I cannot tell you or even understand how I overcame my horror so effectually as to lie alone in my room that night. I remember distinctly that I pinned the charm to my pillow. I fell asleep almost immediately and slept even more soundly than usual all night. Next night I passed as well. My sleep was delightfully deep and dreamless. But I awakened with a sense of lassitude and melancholy, which, however, did not exceed a degree that was almost luxurious. Well, I told you so, said Carmilla, when I described my quiet sleep. I had such a delightful sleep myself last night. I pinned the charm to the breast of my nightdress. It was too far away the night before. I'm quite sure it was all fancy except the dreams. I used to think that evil spirits made dreams, but our doctor told me it's no such thing, only a fever passing by, or some other malady, as they often do, he said, knocks at the door, and not being able to get in passes on without alarm. And what do you think the charm is? said I. It has been fumigated or immersed in some drug, and is an antidote against the malaria, she answered. Then it only acts on the body? Certainly. You don't suppose that evil spirits are frightened by bits of ribbon or the perfumes of a druggist's shop? No, these complaints wandering in the air begin by trying the nerves, and so infect the brain. But before they can seize upon you, the antidote repels them. That, I'm sure, is what the charm has done for us. It's nothing magical. It's simply natural. I should have been happier if I could have quite agreed with Carmilla, but I did my best, and the impression was a little losing its force. For some nights I slept profoundly, but still every morning I felt the same lassitude, and a languor weighed upon me all day. I felt myself a changed girl. A strange melancholy was stealing over me, a melancholy that I wouldn't have interrupted. Dim thoughts of death began to open, and an idea that I was slowly sinking took gentle and somehow not unwelcome possession of me. If it was sad, the tone of mind which this induced was also sweet. Whatever it might be, my soul acquiesced in it. I would not admit that I was ill, I would not consent to tell my papa or to have the doctor sent for. Carmilla became more devoted to me than ever, and her strange paroxysms of languid adoration more frequent. She used to gloat on me with increasing ardour the more my strength and spirits waned. This always shocked me, like a momentary glare of insanity. Without knowing it, I was now in a pretty advanced stage of the strangest illness under which mortal ever suffered. There was an unaccountable fascination in its earlier symptoms that more than reconciled me to the incapacitating effect of that stage of the malady. This fascination increased for a time, until it reached a certain point when gradually a sense of the horrible mingled itself with it, deepening, as you shall hear, until it discoloured and perverted the whole state of my life. The first change I experienced was rather agreeable. It was very near the turning point from which began the descent of Avernus. Certain vague and strange sensations visited me in my sleep. The prevailing one was that of a pleasant, peculiar cold thrill which we feel in bathing when we move against the current of a river. This was soon accompanied by dreams that seemed interminable and were so vague that I could never recollect their scenery and persons or any one connected portion of their action. But they left an awful impression and a sense of exhaustion, as if I had passed through a long period of great mental exertion and danger. After all these dreams, there remained on waking a remembrance of having been in a place very nearly dark, and of having spoken to people whom I could not see, and especially of one clear voice of a female's, very deep, that spoke as if at a distance, slowly, and producing always the same sensation of indescribable solemnity and fear. Sometimes there came a sensation, as if a hand was drawn softly along my cheek and neck. Sometimes... It was as if warm lips kissed me, and longer and longer, and more lovingly as they reached my throat, but there the caress fixed itself. My heart beat faster, my breathing rose and fell rapidly in full drawn, a sobbing that rose into a sense of strangulation supervened, and turned into a dreadful convulsion in which my senses left me, and I became unconscious. It was now three weeks since the commencement of this unaccountable state. My sufferings had, during the last week, told upon my appearance. I had grown pale, my eyes were dilated and darkened underneath, and the languor which I had long felt began to display itself in my countenance. 
My father asked me often whether I was ill, but, with an obstinacy which now seems to me unaccountable, I persisted in assuring him that I was quite well. In a sense this was true, I had no pain, I could complain of no bodily derangement. My complaint seemed to be one of the imagination, or the nerves, and horrible as my sufferings were, I kept them, with a morbid reserve, very nearly to myself. It could not be that terrible complaint which the peasants called the upir, for I had now been suffering for three weeks, and they were seldom ill for much more than three days, when death put an end to their miseries. Carmilla complained of dreams and feverish sensations, but by no means of so alarming a kind as mine. I say that mine were extremely alarming. Had I been capable of comprehending my condition, I would have invoked aid and advice on my knees. The narcotic of an unsuspected influence was acting upon me, and my perceptions were benumbed. I'm going to tell you now of a dream that led immediately to an odd discovery. One night, instead of the voice I was accustomed to hear in the dark, I heard one sweet and tender, and at the same time terrible, which said, Your mother warns you to beware of the assassin. At the same time a light unexpectedly sprang up, and I saw Carmilla standing near the foot of my bed, in her white nightdress, bathed from her chin to her feet, in one great stain of blood. I wakened with a shriek, possessed with the one idea that Carmilla was being murdered. I remember springing from my bed, and my next recollection is that of standing on the lobby crying for help. Madame and Mademoiselle came scurrying out of their rooms in alarm. A lamp burned always on the lobby, and seeing me, they soon learned the cause of my terror. I insisted on our knocking on Camilla's door. Our knocking was unanswered. It soon became a pounding and an uproar. We shrieked her name, but all was vain. We all grew frightened, for the door was locked. We hurried back in panic to my room. There we rang the bell long and furiously. If my father's room had been at that side of the house, we would have called him up at once to our aid, but, alas, he was quite out of hearing, and to reach him involved an excursion for which none of us had courage. Servants, however, soon came running up the stairs. I had got on my dressing gown and slippers meanwhile, and my companions were already similarly furnished. Recognising the voices of the servants on the lobby, we sallied out together, and having renewed as fruitlessly our summons on Carmilla's door, I ordered the men to force the lock. They did so, and we stood, holding our lights aloft in the doorway, and so stared into the room. We called her by name, but there was still no reply. We looked around the room. Everything was undisturbed. It was exactly in the state which I had left it on bidding her good night. But Carmilla was gone. Search. At sight of the room perfectly undisturbed except for our violent entrance, we began to cool a little, and soon recovered our senses sufficiently to dismiss the men. It had struck Mademoiselle that possibly Carmilla had been wakened by the uproar at her door, and in her first panic had jumped from her bed and hid herself in a press or behind a curtain from which she could not, of course, emerge until the major domo and his myrmidons had withdrawn. We now recommenced our search and began to call her name again. It was all to no purpose. Our perplexity and agitation increased. We examined the windows, but they were secured. I implored of Carmilla, if she had concealed herself to play this cruel trick no longer, to come out and to end our anxieties. It was all useless. I was by this time convinced that she was not in the room, nor in the dressing room, the door of which was still locked on this side. She could not have passed it. I was utterly puzzled. Had Carmilla discovered one of those secret passages which the old housekeeper said were known to exist in the Schloss, although the tradition of their exact situation had been lost? A little time would no doubt explain all, utterly perplexed as for the present we were. It was past four o'clock, and I preferred passing the remaining hours of darkness in Madame's room. Daylight brought no solution of the difficulty. The whole household, with my father at its head, was in a state of agitation the next morning. Every part of the chateau was searched, the grounds were explored, no trace of the missing lady could be discovered, 
The stream was about to be dragged. My father was in distraction. What a tale to have to tell the poor girl's mother on her return. I, too, was almost beside myself, though my grief was quite of a different kind. The morning was passed in alarm and excitement. It was now one o'clock and still no tidings. I ran up to Carmilla's room and found her standing at her dressing table. I was astounded. I couldn't believe my eyes. She beckoned me to her with her pretty finger in silence. Her face expressed extreme fear. I ran up to her in an ecstasy of joy. I kissed and embraced her again and again. I ran to the bell and rang it vehemently to bring others to the spot who might at once relieve my father's anxiety. Dear Carmilla, what has become of you all this time? We have been in agonies of anxiety about you, I exclaimed. Where have you been? How did you come back? Last night has been a night of wonders, she said. For mercy's sake, explain all you can. It was past two last night, she said, when I went to sleep as usual in my bed with my doors locked, that of the dressing room, and that opening upon the gallery. My sleep was uninterrupted and, so far as I know, dreamless but I woke just now on the sofa in the dressing room there, and I found the door between the rooms open and the other forced. How could all of this have happened without my being wakened? It must have been accompanied with a great deal of noise, and I am particularly easily wakened. And how could I have been carried out of my bed without my sleep having been interrupted, I whom the slightest stir startles? By this time, Madame, Mademoiselle, my father, and a number of the servants were in the room. Carmilla was, of course, overwhelmed with inquiries, congratulations, and welcomes. She had but one story to tell, and seemed the least able of all the party to suggest any way of accounting for what had happened. My father took a turn up and down the room, thinking. I saw Carmilla's eye follow him for a moment with a sly, dark glance. When my father had sent the servants away, Mademoiselle having gone in search of a little bottle of valerian and sal volatile, and there being no one now in the room with Carmilla except my father, madame, and myself, he came to her thoughtfully, took her hand very kindly, led her to the sofa, and sat down beside her. Will you forgive me, my dear, if I risk a conjecture and ask a question? Who can have a better right, she said. Ask what you please, and I will tell you everything. But my story is simply one of bewilderment and darkness. I know absolutely nothing. Put any question you please, but you know, of course, the limitations Mamma has placed me under. Perfectly, my dear child. I need not approach the topics on which she desires our silence. Now, the marvel of last night consists in your having been removed from your bed and your room without being wakened, and this removal having occurred apparently while the windows were still secured and the two doors locked upon the inside. I will tell you my theory and ask you a question. Carmilla was leaning on her hand dejectedly. Madame and I were listening breathlessly. Now, my question is this. Have you ever been suspected of walking in your sleep? Never, since I was very young indeed. But you did walk in your sleep when you were young. Yes, I know I did. I have been told so often by my old nurse. My father smiled and nodded. Well, what's happened is this. You got up in your sleep and locked the door, not leaving the key as usual in the lock, but taking it out and locking it on the outside. You again took the key out, and carried it away with you to some one of the five-and-twenty rooms on this floor, or perhaps upstairs or downstairs. There are so many rooms and closets, so much heavy furniture, and such accumulations of lumber, that it would require a week to search this old house thoroughly. Do you see now what I mean? I do, but not all, she answered. And how, Papa, do you account for her finding herself on the sofa in the dressing room which we had searched so carefully? She came there after you had searched it still in her sleep, and at last awoke spontaneously, and was as much surprised to find herself where she was as anyone else. I wish all mysteries were as easily and innocently explained as yours, Carmilla, he said, laughing. And so we may congratulate ourselves on the certainty that the most natural explanation of the occurrence is one that involves no drugging, no tampering with locks, no burglars or poisoners or witches, nothing that need alarm Carmilla or anyone else for our safety. Carmilla was looking charmingly. Nothing could be more beautiful than her tints. Her beauty was, I think, enhanced by that graceful languor that was peculiar to her. I think my father was silently contrasting her looks with mine, for he said, I wish my poor Laura was looking more like herself, and he sighed. So our alarms were happily ended, and Carmilla, restored to her friends.
9. The Doctor As Carmilla would not hear of an attendant sleeping in her room, my father arranged that a servant should sleep outside her door, so that she should not attempt to make another such excursion without being arrested at her own door. That night passed quietly, and next morning early, the doctor whom my father had sent for, without telling me a word about it, arrived to see me. Madame accompanied me to the library, and there the grave little doctor, with white hair and spectacles whom I mentioned before, was waiting to receive me. I told him my story, and as I proceeded he grew graver and graver. We were standing, he and I, in the recess of one of the windows facing one another. When my statement was over, he leaned with his shoulders against the wall, and with his eyes fixed on me earnestly, with an interest in which was a dash of horror. After a minute's reflection, he asked Madame if he could see my father. He was sent for accordingly, and as he entered, smiling, he said, I dare say, Doctor, you're going to tell me that I'm an old fool for having brought you here. I hope I am. But his smile faded into shadow, as the doctor, with a very grave face, beckoned him to him. He and the doctor talked for some time in the same recess where I had just conferred with the physician. It seemed an earnest and argumentative conversation. The room is very large, and I and Madame stood together, burning with curiosity at the farther end. Not a word could we hear, however, for they spoke in a very low tone, and the deep recess of the window quite concealed the doctor from view and very nearly my father, whose foot, arm and shoulder only could we see, and the voices were, I suppose, all the less audible for the sort of closet which the thick wall and window formed. After a time my father's face looked into the room. It was pale, thoughtful, and I fancied agitated. Laura, dear, come here for a moment. Madame, we shan't trouble you, the doctor says at present. Accordingly, I approached for the first time, a little alarmed, for, although I felt very weak, I didn't feel ill, and strength, one always fancies, is a thing that may be picked up when we please. My father held out his hand to me as I drew near, but he was looking at the doctor, and he said, It certainly is very odd. I don't understand it quite. Laura, come here, dear. Now attend to Dr. Spielsberg and recollect yourself. You mentioned a sensation like that of two needles piercing the skin somewhere about your neck on the night when you experienced your first horrible dream. Is there still any soreness? None at all, I answered. Can you indicate with your fingers about the point at which you think this occurred? Very little below the throat. Here, I answered. I wore a morning dress which covered the place I pointed to. Now, you can satisfy yourself, said the doctor. You won't mind your papa's lowering your dress a very little. It is necessary to detect a symptom of the complaint under which you may have been suffering. I acquiesced. It was only an inch or two below the edge of my collar. God bless me, so it is, exclaimed my father, growing pale. You see it now with your own eyes, said the doctor with a gloomy triumph. What is it? I exclaimed, beginning to be frightened. Nothing, my dear young lady, but a small blue spot, about the size of the tip of your little finger. And now, he continued, turning to Papa, the question is, what is best to be done? Is there any danger? I urged in great trepidation. I trust not, my dear, answered the doctor. I don't see why you shouldn't recover. I don't see why you shouldn't begin immediately to get better. That is the point at which the sense of strangulation begins. Yes, I answered. And, recollect as well as you can, the same point was a kind of centre of that thrill which you described just now, like uh, the current of a cold stream running against you. It m may have been. I, I think it was. Ah, uh, you see, he added, turning to my father. Shall I say a word to madame? Certainly, said my father. He called madame to him and said, I find my young friend here far from well. It won't be of any great consequence, I hope, but it will be necessary that some steps be taken, which I will explain by and by. But in the meantime, madame, you will be so good as not to let Miss Laura be alone for one moment. That is the only direction I need give you for the present. It is indispensable. We may rely upon your kindness, madame, I know, added my father. Madame satisfied him eagerly. And you, dear Laura, I know you will observe the doctor's direction. I shall have to ask your opinion upon another patient whose symptoms slightly resemble those of my daughter that have just been detailed to you, very much milder in degree, but I believe quite of the same sort. She is a young lady, our guest, but as you say you will be passing this way again this evening, you can't do better than take your supper here, and you can see her then. She doesn't come down till the afternoon. I thank you, said the doctor. I shall be with you then about seven this evening, and then they repeated their directions to me and to Madame, 
and with this parting charge my father left us and walked out with the doctor, and I saw them pacing together up and down between the road and the moat on the grassy platform in front of the castle, evidently absorbed in earnest conversation. The doctor did not return. I saw him mount his horse there, take his leave and ride away eastward through the forest. Nearly at the same time I saw the man arrive from Dranfield with the letters and dismount and hand the bag to my father. In the meantime, Madame and I were both busy, lost in conjecture, as to the reasons of the singular and earnest direction which the doctor and my father had concurred in imposing. Madame, as she afterwards told me, was afraid the doctor apprehended a sudden seizure, and that without prompt assistance I might either lose my life in a fit, or at least be seriously hurt. The interpretation did not strike me, and I fancied, perhaps luckily for my nerves, that the arrangement was prescribed simply to secure a companion would prevent me taking too much exercise, or eating unripe fruit, or doing any of the fifty foolish things to which young people are supposed to be prone. About half an hour after my father came in, he had a letter in his hand and said, This letter had been delayed. It's from General Spielsdorf. He might have been here yesterday. He may not come till tomorrow, or he may be here today. He put the open letter in my hand, but he didn't look pleased, as he used to, when a guest especially one so much loved as a general was coming. On the contrary, he looked as if he wished him at the bottom of the Red Sea. There was plainly something on his mind which he didn't choose to divulge. Papa, darling, will you tell me this, said I, suddenly laying my hand upon his arm, and looking, I am sure, imploringly in his face. Perhaps, he answered, smoothing my hair caressingly over my eyes. Does the doctor think me very ill? No, dear, he thinks, if the right steps are taken, you'll be quite well again, at least on the high road to a complete recovery, in a day or two. He answered a little dryly, I wish our good friend the general had chosen any other time, that is, I wish you had been perfectly well to receive him. But do tell me, Papa, I insisted, what does he think is the matter with me? Nothing. You mustn't plague me with questions, he answered, with more irritation than I ever remembered him to have displayed before, and seeing that I looked wounded, I suppose, he kissed me and added, You shall know all about it in a day or two, that is, all that I know. In the meantime, you're not to trouble your head about it. He turned and left the room, but came back before I had done wondering and puzzling over the oddity of all of this. It was merely to say that he was going to Karnstein, and had ordered the carriage to be ready at twelve, and that I and Madame should accompany him. He was going to see the priest who lived near those picturesque grounds upon business, and as Carmilla had never seen them, she could follow when she came down with Mademoiselle, who would bring materials for what you call a picnic, which might be laid for us in the ruined castle. At twelve o'clock, accordingly, I was ready, and not long after my father, madame, and I set out on our projected drive. Passing the drawbridge, we turned to the right and followed the road of the steep Gothic bridge westward to reach the deserted village and ruined castle of Karnstein. No sylvan drive can be fancied prettier. The ground breaks into gentle hills and hollows, all clothed with beautiful wood, totally destitute of the comparative formality which artificial planting an early culture and pruning in part. The irregularities of the ground often lead the road out of its course and cause it to wind beautifully around the sides of broken hollows and the steeper sides of the hills among varieties of grounds almost inexhaustible. Turning on one of these points, we suddenly encountered our old friend the general riding towards us, attended by a mounted servant. His portmanteaus were following in a hired wagon, such as we term a cart. The general dismounted as we pulled up, and after the usual greetings, was easily persuaded to accept the vacant seat in our carriage, and sent his horse on with his servant to the Schloss. Ten. Bereaved. It was about ten months since we had last seen him, but that time had sufficed to make an alteration of years in his appearance. He had grown thinner, something of gloom and anxiety had taken the place of that cordial serenity which used to characterize his features. His dark blue eyes, always penetrating, now gleamed with a sterner light from under his shaggy grey eyebrows. It was not such a change as grief alone usually induces and angrier passions seemed to have had their share in bringing it about. 
We had not long resumed our drive when the general began to talk, with his usual soldierly directness, of the bereavement, as he termed it, which he had sustained in the death of his beloved niece and ward, and he then broke out in a tone of intense bitterness and fury, inveighing against the hellish arts to which she had fallen victim, and expressing with more exasperation and piety his wonder that heaven should tolerate so monstrous an indulgence of the lusts and malignity of hell. My father, who saw at once that something very extraordinary had befallen, asked him, if not too painful to him, to detail the circumstances which he thought justified the strong terms in which he expressed himself. I should tell you with all pleasure, said the general, but you would not believe me. Why should I not? he asked. Because, he answered testily, you believe in nothing but what consists with your own prejudices and illusions. I remember when I was like you, but I have learned better. Try me, said my father. I am not such a dogmatist as you suppose. Besides which, I know very well that you generally require proof for what you believe, and I am therefore very strongly predisposed to respect your conclusions. You are right in supposing that I have not been led lightly into a belief in the marvellous for what I have experienced is marvellous, and I have been forced by extraordinary evidence to credit that which ran counter diametrically to all my theories. I have been made the dupe of a preternatural conspiracy. Notwithstanding his professions of confidence and general's penetration, I saw my father at this point glance at the general with, as I thought, a marked suspicion of his sanity. The general didn't see it, luckily. He was looking gloomily and curiously into the glades and vistas of the woods that were opening before us. "'You are going to the ruins of Karnstein,' he said. "'Yes, it is a lucky coincidence. Do you know I was going to ask you to bring me there to inspect them? I have a special object in exploring. There is a ruined chapel there, ain't there, with a great many tombs of that extinct family?' "'So there are. Highly interesting,' said my father. "'I hope you are thinking of claiming the title in the States.' My father said this gaily, but the general didn't recollect the laugh, or even the smile, which courtesy extracts for a friend's joke. On the contrary, he looked grave, and even fierce, ruminating on a matter that stirred his anger and horror. Something very different, he said gruffly. I mean to unearth some of these fine people. I hope by God's blessing to accomplish a pious sacrilege here, which will relieve our earth of certain monsters and enable honest people to sleep in their beds without being assailed by murderers. I have strange things to tell you, my dear friend, such as I myself would have scouted as incredible a few months since. My father looked at him again, but this time not with a glance of suspicion, with an eye rather of keen intelligence and alarm. The house of Karnstein, he said, has been long extinct, a hundred years at least, my dear wife was maternally descended from the Karnsteins, but the name and title have long ceased to exist. The castle is a ruin, the very village is deserted. It's fifty years since the smoke of a chimney was seen there, not a roof left. Quite true. I have heard a great deal about that since I last saw you. A great deal will astonish you. But I had better relate everything in the order in which it occurred, said the general. You saw my dear ward, my child, I may call her. No creature could have been more beautiful and only three months ago none more blooming. Yes, poor thing, when I saw her last, she certainly was quite lovely, said my father. I was grieved and shocked more than I can tell you, my dear friend. I knew what a blow it was to you. He took the general's hand, and they exchanged a kind of pressure. Tears gathered in the old soldier's eyes. He didn't seek to conceal them, he said. We have been very old friends. I knew you would feel for me childless as I am. She had become an object of very near interest to me, and repaid my care by an affection that cheered my home and made my life happy. That is all gone. The years that remain to me on earth may not be very long, but by God's mercy I hope to accomplish a service to mankind before I die, and to subserve the vengeance of heaven upon the fiends who have murdered my poor child in the spring of her hopes and beauty. You said just now that you intended relating everything as it occurred, said my father. Pray do. I assure you that it is not mere curiosity that prompts me. By this time we had reached the point at which the Drunstall Road, by which the General had come, diverges from the road which we were travelling to Karnstein. How far is it to the ruins? inquired the General, looking anxiously forward. About half a league, answered my father. Pray, let us hear the story you were so good as to promise.
11. The Story With all my heart, said the General, with an effort, and after a short pause in which to arrange his subject, he commenced on one of the strangest narratives I ever heard. My dear child was looking forward with great pleasure to the visit you had been so good as to arrange for her to your charming daughter. Here he made a gallant but melancholy bow. In the meantime, we had an invitation to my old friend, the Count Karlsfeld, whose schloss is about six leagues to the other side of Karnstein. It was to attend the series of fates which you remember were given by him in honour of his illustrious visitor, the Grand Duke Charles. Yes, and very splendid, I believe they were, said my father. Princely. But then his hospitalities are quite regal. He has Aladdin's lamp. The night from which my sorrow dates was devoted to a magnificent masquerade. The grounds were thrown open, the trees hung with coloured lamps. There was such a display of fireworks as Paris itself had never witnessed. And such music, music, you know, is my weakness, such ravishing music. The finest instrumental band, perhaps, in the world, and the finest singers who could be collected from all the great operas in Europe. As you wandered through these fantastically illuminated grounds, the moon-lighted chateau throwing a rosy light from its long rows of windows, you would suddenly hear these ravishing voices stealing from the silence of some grove, or rising from boats upon the lake. I felt myself, as I looked and listened, carried back into the romance and poetry of my early youth. When the fireworks were ended and the ball beginning, we returned to the noble suite of rooms that were thrown open to the dancers. A masked ball, you know, is a beautiful sight, but so brilliant a spectacle of the kind I never saw before. It was a very aristocratic assembly. I was myself almost the only nobody present. My dear child was looking quite beautiful. She wore no mask. Her excitement and delight added an unspeakable charm to her features, always lovely. I remarked a young lady dressed magnificently but wearing a mask, who appeared to me to be observing my ward with extraordinary interest. I had seen her earlier in the evening in the great hall and again for a few minutes walking near us on the terrace under the castle windows, similarly employed. A lady, also masked, richly and gravely dressed and with a stately air like a person of rank, accompanied her as a chaperone. Had the young lady not worn a mask, I could, of course, have been much more certain upon the question whether she was really watching my poor darling. I am now well assured that she was. We were now in one of the salons. My poor dear child had been dancing and was resting a little in one of the chairs near the door. I was standing near. The two ladies I have mentioned had approached, and the younger took the chair next to my ward, while her companion stood beside me and for a little time addressed herself in a low tone to her charge. Availing herself of the privilege of her mask, she turned to me, and in the tone of an old friend, and calling me by name, opened a conversation with me which piqued my curiosity a good deal. She referred to many scenes where she had met me at court and at distinguished houses. She alluded to little incidents which I had long ceased to think of, but which I found had only lain in abeyance in my memory for they instantly started into life at her touch. I became more and more curious to ascertain who she was every moment. She parried my attempts to discover very adroitly and pleasantly. The knowledge she showed of many passages in my life seemed to me all but unaccountable, and she appeared to take a not unnatural pleasure in foiling my curiosity and in seeing me flounder in my eager perplexity from one conjecture to another. In the meantime, the young lady, whom her mother called by the odd name of Milarka, when she had once or twice addressed her, had, with the same ease and grace, got into conversation with my ward. She introduced herself by saying that her mother was a very old acquaintance of mine. She spoke of the agreeable audacity which a mask rendered practicable. She talked like a friend. She admired her dress and insinuated very prettily her admiration of her beauty. She amused her with laughing criticisms upon the people who crowded the ballroom and laughed at my poor child's fun. She was very witty and lively when she pleased, and after a time they had grown very good friends, and the young stranger lowered her mask, displaying a remarkably beautiful face. I had never seen it before, neither had my dear child, but though it was new to us, the features were so engaging as well as lovely that it was impossible not to feel the attraction powerfully. My poor girl did so. I never saw anyone more taken with another at first sight, unless indeed it was the stranger herself, 
who seemed quite to have lost her heart to her. In the meantime, availing myself of the license of a masquerade, I put not a few questions to the elder lady. You have puzzled me utterly, I said, laughing. Is that not enough? Won't you now consent to stand on equal terms and do me the kindness to remove your mask? Can any request be more unreasonable, she replied. Ask a lady to yield an advantage. Beside, how do you know you should recognize me? Years make changes. As you see, I said with a bow, and I suppose a rather melancholy little laugh. As philosophers tell us, she said, and how do you know that the sight of my face would help you? I should like to take a chance for that, I answered. It is vain trying to make yourself out an old woman. Your figure betrays you. Years, nevertheless, have passed since I saw you, rather, since you saw me, for that is what I am considering. Milarka there is my daughter. I cannot then be young, even in the opinion of people who time has taught to be indulgent, and I may not like to be compared with what you remember me. You have no mask to remove. You can offer me nothing in exchange. My petition is to your pity to remove it, and mine to yours to let it stay where it is, she replied. Well, then, at least you will tell me whether you are French or German. You speak both languages so perfectly. I don't think I shall tell you that, General. You intend a surprise and are meditating the particular point of attack. At all events, you won't deny this, I said, that being honoured by your permission to converse, I ought to know how to address you. Shall I say, Madame la Comtesse? She laughed, and she would no doubt have met me with another evasion, if indeed I can treat any occurrence in an interview, every circumstance of which was prearranged, as I now believe, with the profoundest cunning, as liable to be modified by accident. As to that, she began, but she was interrupted almost as she opened her lips by a gentleman, dressed in black, who looked particularly elegant and distinguished, with this drawback, that his face was the most deadly pale I ever saw, except in death. He was in no masquerade, even in the plain evening dress of a gentleman, and he said, without a smile, but with a courtly and unusually low bow, Will Madame la Comtesse permit me to say a very few words which may interest her? The lady turned quickly to him and touched her lip in token of silence. She then said to me, Keep my place for me, General. I shall return when I have said a few words. And with this injunction playfully given, she walked a little aside with the gentleman in black and talked for some minutes, apparently very earnestly. They then walked away slowly together in the crowd, and I lost them for some minutes. I spent the interval in cudgelling my brains for a conjecture as to the identity of the lady who seemed to remember me so kindly, and I was thinking of turning about and joining in the conversation between my pretty ward and the countess's daughter, and trying whether by the time she returned I might not have a surprise in store for her by having her name, title, chateau, and estates at my fingers' ends. But at this moment... She returned, accompanied by the pale man in black, who said, I shall return and inform Madame la Comtesse when her carriage is at the door. He withdrew with a bow. Thirteen, the woodman. There soon, however, appeared some drawbacks. In the first place, Milarka complained of extreme languor, the weakness that remained after her late illness, and she never emerged from her room until the afternoon was pretty far advanced. In the next place, it was accidentally discovered, although she always locked her door from the inside and never disturbed the key from its place till she admitted the maid to assist her at her toilet, that she was undoubtedly sometimes absent from her room in the very early morning, and at various times later in the day, before she wished it to be understood that she was stirring. She was repeatedly seen from the windows of the Schloss, in the first faint grey of the morning, walking through the trees in an easterly direction and looking like a person in a trance. But this hypothesis did not solve the puzzle. How did she pass from her room, leaving the door locked on the inside, how did she escape from the house without unbarring door or window? In the midst of my perplexities, an anxiety of a far more urgent kind presented itself. My dear child began to lose her looks and health, and that in a manner so mysterious and even horrible that I became thoroughly frightened. She was at first visited by appalling dreams, then, as she fancied by a spectre, sometimes resembling Milarka, 
sometimes in the shape of a beast, indistinctly seen, walking round the foot of her bed from side to side. Lastly came sensations, one, not too unpleasant but very peculiar, she said, resembled the flow of an icy stream against her breast. At a later time she felt something like a pair of large needles pierce her, a little below the throat, with a very sharp pain. A few nights after followed a gradual and convulsive sense of strangulation, then came unconsciousness. I could hear distinctly every word the kind old general was saying, because by this time we were driving upon the short grass that spreads on either side of the road as you approach the roofless village, which had not shown the smoke of a chimney for more than half a century. You may guess how strangely I felt as I heard my own symptoms so exactly described in those which had been experienced by the poor girl, who, but for the catastrophe which followed, would have been at that moment a visitor at my father's chateau. You may suppose also how I felt as I heard him detail habits and mysterious peculiarities which were in fact those of our beautiful guest, Carmilla. A vista opened in the forest. We were on a sudden under the chimneys and gables of the ruined village and the towers and battlements of the dismantled castle round which gigantic trees are grouped overhung us from a slight eminence. In a frightened dream I got down from the carriage and in silence, for we had each abundant matter for thinking, we soon mounted the ascent and were among the spacious chambers, winding stairs and dark corridors of the castle. And this was once the palatial residence of the Karnsteins, said the old general at length, as from a great window he looked out across the village and saw the wide, undulating expanse of forest. It was a bad family, and here its blood-stained annals were written, he continued. It is hard that they should after death continue to plague the human race with their atrocious lusts. That is the chapel of the Karnsteins, down there. He pointed down to the grey walls of the Gothic building partly visible through the foliage a little way down the steep. And I hear the axe of a woodman, he added, busy among the trees that surround it. He possibly may give us the information for which I am in search and point out the grave of Mirkala, Countess of Karnstein. These rustics preserve the local traditions of great families, whose stories die out among the rich and titled, so soon as the families themselves become extinct. We have a portrait at home of Mikala, the Countess Karnstein. Should you like to see it? asked my father. Time enough, dear friend, replied the general. I believe that I have seen the original, and one motive which has led me to you earlier than I at first intended was to explore the chapel which we are now approaching. What? See the Countess Mercala, exclaimed my father. Why, she has been dead more than a century. Not so dead as you fancy, I am told, answered the general. I confess, general, you puzzle me utterly, replied my father, looking at him. I fancied for a moment with the return of the suspicion I detected before, but although there was anger and detestation at times in the old general's manner, there was nothing flighty. There remains to me, he said, as we passed under the heavy arch of the Gothic church, for its dimensions would have justified it being so styled. But one object which can interest me during the few years that remain to me on earth, and that is to wreak on her the vengeance which I thank God may still be accomplished by a mortal arm. What vengeance can you mean? asked my father in increased amazement. I mean to decapitate the monster, he answered with a fierce flush and a stamp that echoed mournfully through the hollow ruin, and his clenched hand was at the same moment raised as if it grasped the handle of an axe, while he shook it ferociously in the air. What? exclaimed my father, more than ever bewildered, to strike her head off. Cut her head off? Aye, with a hatchet, with a spade, or with anything that can cleave through her murderous throat. You shall hear, he answered, trembling with rage, and hurrying forward he said, that beam will answer for a seat. Your dear child is fatigued. Let her be seated, and I will, in a few sentences, close my dreadful story. The squared block of wood which lay on the grass-grown pavement of the chapel formed a bench on which I was very glad to seat myself, and in the meantime the general called to the woodman, who had been removing some boughs which leaned upon the old walls, and, axe in hand, the hardy old fellow stood before us. He could not tell us anything of these monuments, but there was an old man, he said, a ranger of this forest, at present sojourning in the house of the priest about two miles away, 
who could point out every monument of the old Karnstein family. And for a trifle he undertook to bring him back with him, if he would lend him one of our horses, in little more than half an hour. "'Have you been long employed about this forest?' asked my father of the old man. "'I have been a woodman here,' he answered in his patois, "'under the forester all my days. "'So has my father before me, and so on as many generations as I can count up. "'I could show you the very house in the village here in which my ancestors lived. "'How came the village to be deserted?' asked the general. "'It was troubled by revenants, sir. "'Several were tracked to their graves.' They are detected by the usual tests and extinguished in the usual way by decapitation, by the stake and by burning, but not until many of the villagers were killed. But after all these proceedings according to law, he continued, so many graves opened and so many vampires deprived of their horrible animation, the village was not relieved. But a Moravian nobleman who happened to be travelling this way heard how matters were, and being skilled, as many people are in his country in such affairs. He offered to deliver the village from its tormentor. He did so thus. There being a bright moon that night, he ascended shortly after sunset the towers of the chapel here, from whence he could distinctly see the churchyard beneath him. You can see it from that window. From this point he watched until he saw the vampire come out of his grave and place near it the linen clothes in which he had been folded, and then glide away towards the village to plague its inhabitants. The stranger, having seen all this, came down from the steeple, took the linen wrappings of the vampire, and carried them up to the top of the tower, which he again mounted. When the vampire returned from his prowlings and missed his clothes, he cried furiously to the Moravian whom he saw at the summit of the tower, and who in reply beckoned him to ascend and take them. Whereupon the vampire, accepting his invitation, began to climb the steeple, and so soon as he had reached the battlements, the Moravian, with a stroke of his sword, clove his skull in twain, hurling him down to the churchyard, whither, descending by the winding stairs, the stranger followed and cut his head off, and the next day delivered it and the body to the villagers who duly impaled and burnt them. This Moravian nobleman had the authority from the then head of the family to remove the tomb of Michala, Countess Karnstein, which he did effectually, so that in a little while its site was quite forgotten. "'Can you point out where it stood?' asked the general eagerly. The forester shook his head and smiled. "'Not a soul living could tell you that now,' he said. "'Besides, they say our body was removed, but no one's sure of that either.' Having thus spoken as time pressed, he dropped his axe and departed, leaving us to hear the remainder of the general's strange story. Fourteen. The Meeting. My beloved child, he resumed, was now growing rapidly worse. The physician who attended her had failed to produce the slightest impression on her disease, for such then I supposed it to be. He saw my alarm and suggested a consultation. I called in an abler physician from Graz. Several days elapsed before he arrived. He was a good and pious as well as a learned man. Having seen my poor ward together, they withdrew to my library to confer and discuss. I, from the adjoining room where I awaited their summons, heard these two gentlemen's voices raised in something sharper than a strictly philosophical discussion. I knocked at the door and entered. I found the old physician from Graz maintaining his theory. His rival was combating it with undisguised ridicule, accompanied with bursts of laughter. This unseemly manifestation subsided, and the altercation ended on my entrance. Sir, said my first physician, my learned brother seems to think that you want a conjurer and not a doctor. Pardon me, said the old physician from Graz, looking displeased. I shall state my own view of the case in my own way another time. I grieve, monsieur le général, that by my skill and science I can be of no use. Before I go, I shall do myself the honour to suggest something to you. He seemed thoughtful and sat down at the table and began to write. 
profoundly disappointed, I made my bow, and as I turned to go, the other doctor pointed over his shoulder to his companion, who was writing, and then, with a shrug, significantly touched his forehead. This consultation then left me precisely where I was. I walked out into the grounds, all but distracted. The doctor from Graz in ten or fifteen minutes overtook me. He apologised for having followed me, but said that he could not conscientiously take his leave without a few words more. He told me that he could not be mistaken. No natural disease exhibited the same symptoms, and that death was already very near. There remained, however, a day, or possibly two, of life. If the fatal seizure were at once arrested, with great care and skill, her strength might possibly return. But all hung now upon the confines of the irrevocable. One more assault might extinguish the last spark of vitality which is every moment ready to die. And what is the nature of the seizure you speak of, I entreated. I have stated all fully in this note which I place in your hands upon the distinct condition that you send for the nearest clergyman and open my letter in his presence, and on no account read it till he is with you. You would despise it else. And it is a matter of life and death. Should the priest fail you, then indeed you may read it. He asked me before taking his leave finally whether I wished to see a man curiously learned upon the very subject, which, after I had read his letter, would probably interest me above all others. And he urged me earnestly to invite him to visit him there, and so took his leave. The ecclesiastic was absent, and I read the letter by myself. At another time, or in another case, it might have excited my ridicule. But into what quackeries will not people rush for a last chance, where all accustomed means have failed, and the life of a beloved object is at stake? Nothing, you will say, could be more absurd than the learned man's letter. It was monstrous enough to have consigned him to a madhouse. He said that the patient was suffering from the visits of a vampire. The punctures which he described as having occurred near the throat were, he insisted, the insertion of those two long, thin and sharp teeth which, it is well known, are peculiar to vampires. And there could be no doubt, he added, as to the well-defined presence of the small livid mark, which all concurred in describing as that induced by the demon's lips. And every symptom described by the sufferer was in exact conformity with those recorded in every case of a similar visitation. Being myself wholly sceptical as to the existence of any such portent as the vampire, the supernatural theory of the good doctor furnished, in my opinion, but another instance of learning and intelligence oddly associated with some one hallucination. I was so miserable, however, that rather than try nothing, I acted upon the instructions of the letter. I concealed myself in the dark dressing-room that opened upon the poor patient's room in which a candle was burning, and watched there till she was fast asleep. I stood at the door peeping through the small crevice, my sword laid on the table beside me, as my directions prescribed, until, a little after one, I saw a large, black object, very ill-defined, crawl, as it seemed to me, over the foot of the bed, and swiftly spread itself up to the poor girl's throat, where it swelled in a moment into a great, palpitating mass. For a few moments I had stood petrified, I now sprang forward with my sword in my hand. The black creature suddenly contracted towards the foot of the bed, glided over it, and standing on the floor about a yard below the foot of the bed, with a glare of skulking ferocity and horror fixed upon me, I saw Milarka. Speculating I know not what, I struck at her instantly with my sword, but I saw her standing near the door unscathed. Horrified, I pursued and struck again. She was gone, and my sword flew to shivers against the door. I can't describe to you all that passed upon that horrible night. The whole house was up and stirring. The spectre Milaka was gone, but her victim was sinking fast, and before the morning dawned, she died. The old general was agitated. We didn't speak to him. My father walked to some little distance and began reading the inscriptions on the tombstones, and thus occupied, he strolled into the door of a side chapel to prosecute his researches. The general leaned against the wall, dried his eyes, and sighed heavily. I was relieved on hearing the voices of Carmela and Madame, who were at that moment approaching. The voices died away. In this solitude, having just listened to so strange a story, connected, as it was, with the great entitled dead, 
whose monuments were mouldering among the dust and ivy round us, and every incident of which bore so awfully upon my own mysterious case, in this haunted spot, darkened by the towering foliage that rose on every side, dense and high above its noiseless walls, a horror began to steal over me, and my heart sank, as I thought that my friends were, after all, not about to enter and disturb this tryst and ominous scene. The old general's eyes were fixed upon the ground as he leaned with his hand upon the basement of a shattered monument. Under a narrow, arched doorway, surmounted by one of those demoniacal grotesques in which the cynical and ghastly fancy of old Gothic carving delights, I saw, very gladly, the beautiful face and figure of Carmilla enter the shadowy chapel. I was just about to rise and speak and nodded, smiling in answer to her peculiarly engaging smile, when with a cry the old man by my side caught up the woodman's hatchet and started forward. On seeing him a brutalised change came over her features. It was an instantaneous and horrible transformation as she made a crouching step backwards. Before I could utter a scream he struck at her with all his force, but she dived under his blow and unscathed, caught him in her tiny grasp by the wrist. He struggled for a moment to release his arm, but his hand opened, the axe fell to the ground, and the girl was gone. He staggered against the wall, his grey hair stood upon his head, and a moisture shone over his face, as if he were at the point of death. The frightful scene had passed in a moment. The first thing I recollect after is Madame standing before me, and impatiently repeating again and again the question, Where is Mademoiselle Carmilla? I answered at length, I don't know, I, I can't tell, she went there, and I pointed to the door through which Madame had just entered, only a minute or two since. But I have been standing there in the passage ever since Mademoiselle Carmilla entered, and she did not return. She then began to call Carmilla through every door and passage and from the windows, but no answer came. She called herself Carmilla, asked the general, still agitated. Carmilla, yes, I answered. Ah, he said, that is Milarka. That is the same person who long ago was called mere Carla, Countess Karnstein. Depart from this accursed ground, my poor child, as quickly as you can. Drive to the clergyman's house and stay there till we come. Be gone. May you never behold Carmilla more. You will not find her here. Fifteen, Ordeal and Execution As he spoke, one of the strangest-looking men I ever beheld entered the chapel at the door through which Carmilla had made her entrance and her exit. He was tall, narrow-chested, stooping with high shoulders and dressed in black. His face was brown and dried in with deep furrows. He wore an oddly-shaped hat with a broad leaf. His hair, long and grizzled, hung on his shoulders. He wore a pair of gold spectacles and walked slowly with an odd, shambling gait, with his face sometimes turned up to the sky and sometimes bowed down towards the ground, seemed to wear a perpetual smile. His long thin arms were swinging and his lank hands, in old black gloves ever so much too wide for them, waving and gesticulating in utter abstraction. The very man, exclaimed the general, advancing with manifest delight, my dear baron, how happy I am to see you. I had no hope of meeting you so soon, he signed to my father, who had by this time returned, and leading the fantastic old gentleman whom he called the Baron, to meet him. He introduced him formally, and they at once entered into an earnest conversation. The stranger took a roll of paper from his pocket, and spread it on the worn surface of a tomb that stood by. He had a pencil case in his fingers, with which he traced imaginary lines from point to point on the paper which, from their often glancing from it together at certain points of the building, I concluded to be a plan of the chapel. He accompanied what I may term his lecture with occasional readings from a dirty little book, whose yellow leaves were closely written over. They sauntered together down the side aisle opposite to the spot where I was standing conversing as they went. Then they began measuring distances by paces, and finally they all stood together, facing a piece of the side wall, which they began to examine with great minuteness, pulling off the ivy that clung over it, and wrapping the plaster with the ends of their sticks, 
scraping here and knocking there. At length they ascertained the existence of a broad marble tablet with letters carved in relief upon it. With the assistance of the woodman who soon returned, a monumental inscription and carved escutcheon were soon disclosed. They proved to be those of the long-lost monument of Michala, Countess Karnstein. The old general, though not, I fear, given to the praying mood, raised his hands and eyes to heaven in mute thanksgiving for some moments. Tomorrow, I heard him say, the commissioner will be here and the inquisition will be held according to law. Then, turning to the old man with the gold spectacles whom I have described, he shook him warmly by both hands and said, Baron, how can I thank you? How can we all thank you? You will have delivered this region from a plague that has scourged its inhabitants for more than a century. The horrible enemy, thank God, is at last tracked. My father led the stranger aside, and the general followed. I know that he had led them out of hearing that he might relate my case, and I saw them glance often quickly at me as the discussion proceeded. My father came to me, kissed me again and again, and leading me from the chapel said, It's time to return, but before we go home, we must add to our party the good priest, who lives but a little way from this, and persuade him to accompany us to the Schloss. In this quest we were successful, and I was glad, being unspeakably fatigued, when we reached home. But my satisfaction was changed to dismay on discovering that there were no tidings of Carmilla. Of the scene that had occurred in the ruined chapel, no explanation was offered to me, and it was clear that it was a secret which my father for the present determined to keep from me. The sinister absence of Carmilla made the remembrance of the scene more horrible to me. The arrangements for the night were singular. Two servants and madame were to sit up in my room that night, and the ecclesiastic with my father kept watch in the adjoining dressing-room. The priest had performed certain solemn rites that night, the purport of which I didn't understand any more than I comprehended the reason of this extraordinary precaution taken for my safety during sleep. I saw it all clearly a few days later. The disappearance of Carmilla was followed by the discontinuance of my nightly sufferings. You have heard, no doubt, of the appalling superstition that prevails in Upper and Lower Styria, in Moravia, Silesia, in Turkish Serbia, in Poland, even in Russia, the superstition, so we must call it, of the vampire. If human testimony, taken with every care and solemnity, judicially before commissions innumerable, each consisting of many members, all chosen, for integrity and intelligence, and constituting reports more voluminous, perhaps, than exist upon any one other class of cases, is worth anything. It is difficult to deny or even to doubt the existence of such a phenomenon as the vampire. For my part, I have heard no theory by which to explain what I myself have witnessed and experienced, other than that supplied by the ancient and well-attested belief in the country. The next day the formal proceedings took place in the chapel of Karnstein. The grave of the Countess Michala was opened, and the general and my father recognized each his perfidious and beautiful guest in the face now disclosed to view. The features, though a hundred and fifty years had passed since her funeral, were tinted by the warmth of life. Her eyes were open. No cadaverous smell exhaled from the coffin. The two medical men, one officially present, the other on the part of the promoter of the inquiry, attested the marvellous fact that there was a faint but appreciable respiration and a corresponding action of the heart. The limbs were perfectly flexible, the flesh elastic, and the leaden coffin floated with blood, in which to a depth of seven inches the body lay immersed. Here, then, were all the admitted signs and proofs of vampirism. The body, therefore, in accordance with the ancient practice, was raised, and a sharp stake driven through the heart of the vampire, who uttered a piercing shriek at the moment in all respects, such as might escape from a living person in the last agony. Then the head was struck off, and a torrent of blood flowed from the severed neck. The body and head was next placed on a pile of wood and reduced to ashes, which were thrown upon the river and borne away. And that territory has never since been plagued by the visits of a vampire. My father has a copy of the report of the Imperial Commission, with the signatures of all who were present at these proceedings, attached in verification of the statement. It is from this official paper that I have summarised my account of this last shocking scene.
That was Carmilla, written by Joseph Sheridan Lefano and narrated by Tony Walker. If you want to hear other stories narrated by Tony Walker, please check out Music Glue under Eerie Cumbria, where the stories are available on a pay-as-you-want basis. So there's a minimum payment of something like 50 cents or 30 British pennies. If you fancy hearing more stories read by myself, Tony Walker, just Google Music Glue Eerie Cumbria, and I would be delighted if you would buy them. The Beckoning Fair One Written by Oliver Onions And narrated by Tony Walker One the three or four to let boards had stood within the low paling as long as the inhabitants of the little triangular square could remember, and if they had ever been vertical, it was a very long time ago. They now overhung the palings each at its own angle, and resembled nothing so much as a row of wooden choppers, ever in the act of falling upon some passer-by, yet never cutting off a tenant for the old house from the stream of his fellows. Not that there ever was any great stream through the square. The stream passed a furlong and more away, beyond the intricacy of tenements and alleys and byways that had sprung up since the old house had been built, hemming it in completely, and probably the house itself was only suffered to stand pending the falling in of a lease or two, when doubtless a clearance would be made of the whole neighbourhood. It was of bloomy old red brick, and built into its walls were the crowns and clasped hands and other insignia of insurance companies long since defunct. The children of the secluded square had swung upon the low gate at the end of the entrance alley until little more than the solid top bar of it remained, and the alley itself ran past boarded basement windows on which tramps had chalked their cryptic marks. The path was washed and worn unevenly by the spilling of water from the eaves of the encroaching next house, and cats and dogs had made the approach their own. The chances of a tenant did not seem such as to warrant the keeping of the toilet boards in the state of legibility and repair, and as a matter of fact, they were not so kept. For six months Oleron had passed the old place twice a day or oftener, on his way from his lodgings to the room ten minutes walk away he had taken to work in, and for six months no hatchet-like notice board had fallen across his path. This might have been due to the fact that he usually took the other side of the square, but he chanced one morning to take the side that ran past the broken gate and the rain-worn entrance alley, and to pause before one of the inclined boards. The board bore, beside the agent's name, the announcement, written apparently about the time of Oleron's own early youth, that the key was to be had at number six. Now Oleron was already paying for his separate bedroom and workroom, more than an author who without private means habitually disregards his public can afford. And he was paying in addition a small rent for the storage of the greater part of his grandmother's furniture. Moreover, it invariably happened that the book he wished to read in bed was at his working quarters half a mile and more away, while the note or letter he had sudden need of during the day was as likely as not to be in the pocket of another coat hanging behind his bedroom door and there were other inconveniences in having a divided domicile. Therefore, Oleron, brought suddenly up by the hatchet-like notice-board, looked first down through some scanty privet bushes at the boarded basement windows, then up at the blank and grimy windows of the first floor, and so up to the second floor and the flat stone coping of the leads. He stood for a minute, thumbing his lean and shaven jaw, then, with another glance at the board, 
He walked slowly across the square to number six. He knocked and waited for two or three minutes, but although the door stood open, received no answer. He was knocking again when a long-nosed man in shirt sleeves appeared. I was asking a blessing on our food, he said in severe explanation. Oleron asked if he might have the key of the old house, and the long-nosed man withdrew again. Oleron waited for another five minutes on the step, then the man, appearing again and masticating some of the food of which he had spoken, announced that the key was lost. But you won't want it, he said. The entrance door ain't closed, and a push will open any of the others. I'm an agent for it if you're thinking of taking it. Oleron recrossed the square, descended the two steps at the broken gate, passed along the alley, and turned in at the old wide doorway. To the right, immediately within the door, steps descended to the roomy cellars, and the staircase before him had a carved rail, it was broad and handsome and filthy. Oleron ascended it, avoiding contact with the rail and wall, and stopped at the first landing. A door facing him had been boarded up, but he pushed at that on his right hand, and an insecure bolt or staple yielded. He entered the empty first floor. He spent a quarter of an hour in the place, and then came out again. Without mounting higher, he descended and recrossed the square to the house of the man who had lost the key. Can you tell me how much the rent is? he asked. The man mentioned a figure, the comparative lowness of which seemed accounted for by the character of the neighbourhood and the abominable state of unrepair of the place. Would it be possible to rent a single floor? The long-nosed man didn't know. They might. Who are they? The man gave Oleron the name of a firm of lawyers in Lincoln's Inn. You might mention my name, Barrett, he added. Pressure of work prevented Oleron from going down to Lincoln's Inn that afternoon, but he went on the morrow, and was instantly offered the whole house as a purchase for fifty pounds down, the remainder of the purchase money to remain on mortgage. It took him half an hour to disabuse the lawyer's mind of the idea that he wished anything more of the place than to rent a single floor of it. This made certain hums and haws of a difference, and the lawyer was by no means certain that it lay within his power to do as Oleron suggested. But it was finally extracted from him that, provided the notice boards were allowed to remain up, and that, provided it was agreed that in the event of the whole house letting, the arrangement should terminate automatically without further notice, something might be done. That the old place should suddenly let over his head seemed to Oleron the slightest of risks to take and he promised a decision within the week. On the morrow he visited the house again, went through it from top to bottom, and then went home to his lodgings to take a bath. He was immensely taken with that portion of the house he had already determined should be his own, scraped clean and repainted, and with that old furniture of Oleron's grandmother's, it ought to be entirely charming. He went to the storage warehouse to refresh his memory of his half-forgotten belongings, and to take measurements and thence he went to a decorator's. He was very busy with his regular work, and could have wished the notice board had caught his attention either a few months earlier or else later in the year. But the quickest way would be to suspend work entirely until after his removal. A fortnight later, his first floor was painted throughout in a tender elderflower white. The paint was dry, and Oleron was in the middle of his installation. He was animated, delighted, and he rubbed his hands as he polished and made disposals of his grandmother's effects. The tall lattice pane china cupboard with its derby and mason and spode, the large folding Sheraton table, the long low bookshelves, he had two of them copied, the chairs, the Sheffield candlesticks, the riveted rose bowls. These things he set against his newly painted elder white walls, walls of wood panelled in the happiest proportions and moulded and coffered to the low-seated window recesses in a mood of gaiety and rest that the builders of rooms no longer know. The ceilings were lofty and faintly painted with an old pattern of stars. Even the tapering mouldings of his iron fireplace were as delicately designed as jewellery, and Oleron walked about rubbing his hands, frequently stopping for the mere pleasure of the glimpses from white room to white room. Charming, charming, he said to himself. I wonder what Elsie Bengough will think of this. He bought a bolt and a Yale lock for his door, 
and shut off his quarters from the rest of the house. If he now wanted to read in bed, his book could be had for stepping into the next room. All the time he thought how exceedingly lucky he was to get the place. He put up a hat rack in a little square hall, and hung up his hats and caps and coats, and passes through the small triangular square late at night, looking up over the little serried row of wooden to let hatchets, could see the light within Ulderon's red blinds, or else the sudden darkening of one blind and the illumination of another, as Ulderon, candlestick in hand, passed from room to room, making final settlings of his furniture, or preparing to resume the work that his removal had interrupted. Two. As far as the chief business of his life, his writing was concerned, Paul Oleron treated the world a good deal better than he was treated by it, but he seldom took the trouble to strike a balance or to compute how far at forty-four years of age he was behind his points on the handicap. To have done so wouldn't have altered matters, and it might have depressed Oleron. He had chosen his path and was committed to it beyond possibility of withdrawal, Perhaps he had chosen it in the days when he had been easily swayed by something a little disinterested, a little generous, a little noble, and had he ever thought of questioning himself, he would still have held to it, that a life without nobility and generosity and disinterestedness was no life for him. Only quite recently, and rarely, had he even vaguely suspected that there was more in it than this, but it was no good anticipating the day when he supposed he would reach that maximum point of his powers beyond which he must inevitably decline, and be left face to face with the question whether it would not have profited him better to have ruled his life by less exigent ideals. In the meantime, his removal into the old house with the insurance marks built into its brick merely interrupted Romilly Bishop at the fifteenth chapter. As this tall man with a lean ascetic face moved about his new abode, arranging, changing, altering, hardly yet into his working stride again, he gave the impression of almost spinster-like precision and nicety. For twenty years past, in a score of lodgings, garrets, flats and rooms furnished and unfurnished, he had been accustomed to do many things for himself, and he had discovered that it saves time and temper to be methodical. He had arranged with the wife of the long-nosed Barrett, a stout Welshwoman with a falsetto voice, the Marionethshire accent of which long residence in London had not perceptibly modified, to come across the square each morning to prepare his breakfast, and also to turn the place out on Saturday mornings, and for the rest he even welcomed a little housework as a relaxation from the strain of writing. His kitchen together with the adjoining strip of an apartment into which a modern bath had been fitted, overlooked the alley at the side of the house, and at one end of it was a large closet with a door and a square sliding hatch in the upper part of the door. This had been a powder closet, and through the hatch the elaborately dressed head had been thrust to receive the click and puff of the powder pistol. Oleron puzzled a little over this closet, then, as its use occurred to him, he smiled faintly, a little moved, he knew not by what. He would have put it to a very different purpose from its original one. It would probably have to serve as his larder. It was in this closet that he made a discovery. The back of it was shelved, and rummaging on an upper shelf that ran deeply into the wall, Oleron found a couple of mushroom-shaped old wig stands. He didn't know how they had come to be there. Doubtless the painters had turned them up somewhere or other, and had put them there. But his five rooms as a whole were short of cupboard and closet room, and it was only by the exercise of some ingenuity that he was able to find places for the bestowal of his household linen, his boxes, and his seldom used, but not to be destroyed, accumulations of papers. It was in early spring that Oleron entered on his tenancy, and he was anxious to have Romilly ready for publication in the coming autumn. Nevertheless, he didn't intend to force its production. Should it demand longer in the doing, so much the worse. He realised its importance, its crucial importance, in his artistic development, and it must have its own length and time. In the workroom he had recently left, 
he had been making excellent progress. Romilly had begun, as the saying is, to speak and act of herself, and he didn't doubt she would continue to do so the moment the distraction of his removal was over. This distraction was almost over. He told himself it was time he pulled himself together again, and on a March morning he went out, returned again with two great bunches of yellow daffodils, placed one bunch on his mantelpiece between the Sheffield sticks and the other on the table before him, and took out the half-completed manuscript of Romilly Bishop. But before beginning work he went to a small rosewood cabinet and took from a drawer his cheque-book and pass-book. He totted them up, and his monk-like face grew thoughtful. His installation had cost him more than he had intended it should, and his balance was rather less than fifty pounds, with no immediate prospect of more. Hmm, I'd forgotten rugs and chintz curtains and so forth mounted up so, said Oleron. But it would have been a pity to spoil the place for the want of ten pounds or so. Well, Romilly simply must be out for the autumn. That's all. So here goes. He drew his papers towards him, but he worked badly, or rather, he did not work at all. The square outside had its own noises, frequent and new, and Oleron could only hope that he would speedily be accustomed to these. First came hawkers with their carts and cries. At midday the children, returning from school, trooped into the square and swung on Oleron's gate, and when the children had departed again for afternoon school, an itinerant musician with a mandolin posted himself beneath Oleron's window and began to strum. This was a not unpleasant distraction and Oleron, pushing up his window, threw the man a penny. Then he returned to his table again. But it was no good. He came to himself at long intervals to find that he had been looking about his room and wondering how it had formerly been furnished, whether a settee in buttercup or petunia satin had stood under the farther window, whether from the centre moulding of the light, lofty ceiling had depended a glimmering crystal chandelier, or where the tambour frame or the piquet table had stood. Now it was no good. He had far better be frankly doing nothing than getting fruitlessly tired, and he decided that he would take a walk, but chancing to sit down for a moment, dozed in his chair instead. This won't do, he yawned when he awoke at half-past four in the afternoon. I must do better than this tomorrow. And he felt so deliciously lazy that for some minutes he even contemplated the breach of an appointment he had for the evening. The next morning he sat down to work without even permitting himself to answer one of his three letters, two of them tradesmen's accounts, the third a note from Miss Bengough, forwarded from his old address. It was a jolly day of white and blue, with a gay noisy wind and a subtle turn in the colour of growing things, and over and over again, once or twice a minute, his room became suddenly light and then subdued again as the shining white clouds rolled northeastwards over the square. The soft, fitful illumination was reflected in the polished surface of the table, and even in the foot-worn old floor, and the morning noises had begun again. Oleron made a pattern of dots on the paper before him, and then he broke off to move the jar of daffodils exactly opposite the centre of a creamy panel. Then he wrote a sentence that ran continuously for a couple of lines, after which it broke into notes and jottings. For a time he succeeded in persuading himself that in making these memoranda he was really working. Then he rose and began to pace his room. As he did so, he was struck by an idea. It was, perhaps, a thought too pale. It was that the place might possibly be a little better for more positive colour. It was, perhaps, a thought too pale mild and sweet as a kind old face, but a little devitalized, even one. Yes, decidedly it would bear a robuster note, more and richer flowers, and possibly some warm and gay stuff for cushions for the window seats. Of course I can't really afford it, he muttered, as he went for a two-foot and began to measure the width of the window recesses. In stooping to measure a recess, his attitude suddenly changed to one of interest and attention. Presently he rose again, rubbing his hands with gentle glee. Oh, 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 he said, these look to me very much like window boxes nailed up. We must look into this. Yes, those are boxes where I am. Oh, oh, this is an adventure. 
On that wall of his sitting room there were two windows, the third was in another corner, and beyond the open bedroom door on the same wall was another. The seats of all had been painted, repainted and painted again, and Oleron's investigating finger had barely detected the old nail heads beneath the paint. Under the ledge over which he stooped, an old keyhole had also been putted up. Oleron took out his penknife. He worked carefully for five minutes and then went into the kitchen for a hammer and chisel. Driving the chisel cautiously under the seat, he started the whole lid slightly. Again, using the penknife, he cut along the hinged edge and outward along the ends, and then he fetched a wedge and a wooden mallet. Now for our little mystery, he said. The sound of the mallet on the wedge seemed, in that sweet and pale apartment, somehow a little brutal, nay, even shocking. The panelling rang and rattled and vibrated to the blows like a sounding board. The whole house seemed to echo. From the roomy cellarage to the garrets above, a flock of echoes seemed to awake, and the sound got a little on Oleron's nerves. All at once he paused, fetched a duster, and muffled the mallet. When the edge was sufficiently raised, he put his fingers under it and lifted. The paint flaked and starred a little. The rusty old nails squeaked and grunted, and the lid came up, laying open the box beneath. Oleron looked into it, save for a couple of inches of scurf and mould and old cobwebs. It was empty. No treasure there, said Oleron, a little amused that he should have fancied there might have been. Romilly will still have to be out by autumn. Let's have a look at the others. He turned to the second window. The raising of the two remaining seats occupied him until well into the afternoon. That of the bedroom, like the first, was empty, but from the second seat of his sitting room he drew out something yielding and folded and furred over an inch thick with dust. He carried the object into the kitchen, and having swept it over a bucket, took a duster to it. It was some sort of a large bag of an ancient frieze-like material, and when unfolded it occupied the greater part of the small kitchen. In shape it was an irregular, a very irregular triangle, and it had a couple of wide flaps and the remains of straps and buckles. The patch that had been uppermost in the folding was of a faded yellowish-brown, but the rest of it was shades of crimson that varied according to the exposure of the parts of it. Now whatever can that have been? Oleron mused as he stood surveying it. I give up. Whatever it is, it's settled my work for today, I'm afraid. He folded the object up carelessly and thrust it into the corner of the kitchen. Then, taking pans and brushes and an old knife, he returned to the sitting room and began to scrape and wash and to line with paper his newly discovered receptacles. When he had finished, he put his spare boots and books and papers into them, and he closed the lids again, amused with his little adventure, but also a little anxious, for the hour had come when he should settle fairly down to his work again. Three. It piqued Oleron a little that his friend, Miss Bengough, should dismiss with a glance the place he himself had found so singularly winning. Indeed, she scarcely lifted her eyes to it. But then she had always been more or less like that, a little indifferent to the graces of life, careless of appearances, and perhaps a shade more herself when she ate biscuits from a paper bag than when she dined with greater observance of the conveniences. She was an unattached journalist of thirty-four, large, showy, fair as butter, pink as a dog-rose, reminding one of a florist's picked specimen bloom, and given to sudden and ample movements and moist and explosive utterances. She pulled a better living out of the pool, as she expressed it, than Oleron did, and by cunningly disguised puffs of drapers and haberdashers, she pulled also the greater part of her very varied wardrobe. She left small whirlwinds of air behind her when she moved, in which her veils and scarves fluttered and spun. Oleron heard the flurry of her skirts on his staircase and her single loud knock at his door when he had been a month in his new abode. Her garments brought in the outer air, and she flung a bundle of ladies' journals down on a chair. 
Don't knock off for me, she said, across a mouthful of large-headed hatpins as she removed her hat and veil. I didn't know whether you were straight yet, so I brought some sandwiches for lunch. You've got coffee, I suppose. No, don't get up. I'll find the kitchen. Oh, that's all right. I'll clear these things away. To tell the truth, I'm rather glad to be interrupted, said Oleron. He gathered his work together and put it away. She was already in the kitchen. He heard the running of water into the kettle. He joined her, and ten minutes later followed her back to the sitting room with the coffee and sandwiches on a tray. They sat down with the tray on a small table between them. Well, what do you think of the new place? Oleron asked as she poured out coffee. Hmm, anybody'd think you were going to get married, Paul, he laughed. Oh no, but it's an improvement on some of them, isn't it? Is it? I suppose it is, I don't know. I like the last place, in spite of the black ceiling and no water tap. How's Romilly? Oleron thumbed his chin. Mm, I'm rather ashamed to tell you. The fact is, I've not got on very well with it. But it'll be all right on the night, as you used to say. Stuck? Rather stuck. Got any of it you care to read to me? Oleron had long been in the habit of reading portions of his work to Miss Bengough occasionally. Her comments were always quick and practical, sometimes directly useful, sometimes indirectly suggestive. She, in return for his confidence, always kept all mentions of her own work sedulously from him. His, she said, was real work. Hers merely filled space, not always even grammatically. I'm afraid there isn't, Oleron replied, still meditatively dry shaving his chin. Then he added with a little burst of candour, The fact is, Elsie, I have not written, not actually written, very much more of it, any more of it, in fact. But of course, that doesn't mean I haven't progressed. I progressed, in one sense, rather alarmingly. I am now thinking of reconstructing the whole thing. Miss Bengough gave a gasp. Reconstructing? Making Romilly herself a different type of woman? Somehow I began to feel that I am not getting the most out of her. As she stands, I have certainly lost interest in her to some extent. But, but, Miss Bengough protested, you had her so real, so living, Paul. Oleron smiled faintly. He had been quite prepared for Miss Bengough's disapproval. He wasn't surprised that she liked Romilly, as she at present existed. She would. Whether she realised it or not, there was much of herself in this fictitious creation. Naturally, Romilly would seem real, living to her. But are you really serious, Paul? Miss Bengough asked presently, with a round-eyed stare. Quite serious. You're really going to scrap those fifteen chapters? I didn't exactly say that. That fine, rich love scene. I should only do it reluctantly, and for the sake of something I thought better. And that beautiful, beautiful description of Romilly on the shore. It wouldn't necessarily be wasted, he said a little uneasily. But Miss Bengough made a large and windy gesture, and then let him have it. Really, you're too trying, she broke out. I do wish sometimes you'd remember you're human and live in the world. You know, I'd be the last to wish you to lower your standard one inch, but it wouldn't be lowering it to bring it within human comprehension. Oh, you're sometimes altogether too godlike. Why, it would be a wicked, criminal waste of your powers to destroy those fifteen chapters. Look at it reasonably now. You've been working for nearly twenty years. You've now got what you've been working for almost within your grasp. Your affairs are at a most critical stage. Oh, don't tell me. I know you're about at the end of your money. And here you are, deliberately proposing to withdraw a thing that will probably make your name, and to substitute it for something that ten to one nobody on earth will ever want to read, and small blame to them. Really, you try my patience. Oleron had shaken his head slowly as she had talked. It was an old story between them. The noisy, able, practical journalist was an admirable friend, up to a certain point. Beyond that, well, each of us knows that point beyond which we stand alone. Elsie Bengough sometimes said that had she had one-tenth part of Oleron's genius, there were few things she couldn't have done, thus making that genius a quantitatively divisible thing, a sort of ingredient to be attracted to or subtracted from in the admixture of his work. That it was a qualitative thing, essential, indivisible, informing, past her comprehension. Their spirits parted company at that point. Oleron knew it. She didn't appear to know it. Yes, 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 he said a little wearily, by and by. Practically, you're quite right, entirely right, and I haven't a word to say. If I could only turn Romilly over to you, you'd make an enormous success of her. 
but that can't be, and I, for my part, am seriously doubting whether she's worth my while. You know what that means. What does it mean? she demanded bluntly. Well, he said, smiling wanly, what does it mean when you're convinced the thing isn't worth doing? You simply don't do it. Miss Bengough's eyes swept the ceiling for assistance against this impossible man. What utter rubbish, she broke out at last. Why, when I saw you last, you were simply oozing Romilly. You were turning her off at the rate of four chapters a week. If you hadn't moved, you'd have her three parts done by now. What on earth possessed you to move right in the middle of your most important work? Oleron tried to put her off with a recital of inconveniences, but she wouldn't have it. Perhaps in her heart she partly suspected the reason. He was simply mortally weary of the narrow circumstances of his life. He had had twenty years of it. Twenty years of garrets and roof chambers and dingy flats and shabby lodgings, and he was tired of dinginess and shabbiness. The reward was as far off as ever. Or, if it was not, he no longer cared as once he would have cared to put out his hand and take it. It's all very well to tell a man who's at the point of exhaustion that only another effort is required of him. If he cannot make it, he is as far off as ever. Anyway, old one summed up, I'm happier here than I have been for a long time. That's some sort of a justification. And doing no work, said Miss Bengough pointedly. At that, a trifling petulance that had been gathering in Oleron came to her head. And why should I do nothing but work, he demanded. How much happier am I for it? I don't say I don't love my work when it's done, but I hate doing it. Sometimes it's an intolerable burden that I simply long to be rid of. Once in many weeks it has a moment, one moment, of glow and thrill for me. I remember the days when it was all glow and thrill, and now I'm forty-four and it's becoming drudgery. Nobody wants it. I'm ceasing to want it myself, and if any ordinary sensible man were to ask me whether I didn't think I was a fool to go on, I think I should agree that I was. Miss Bengough's comely pink face was serious. But you knew all that, Paul, many, many years ago, and you still chose it, she said in a low voice. Well, and how should I have known, he demanded. I didn't know. I was told so. My heart, if you like, told me so, and I thought I knew. Youth always thinks it knows. Then one day it discovers that it's nearly fifty. Forty-four, Paul. Forty-four, then and it finds that the glamour isn't in front but behind. Yes, I knew and chose, if that's knowing and choosing, but it's a costly choice we call them to make when we're young. Miss Bengough's eyes were on the floor. Without moving them, she said, You're not regretting it, Paul. Am I not? He took her up. Upon my word, I've lately thought I am. What do I get in return for it all? You know what you get, she replied. He might have known from her tone what else he could have had for the holding up of a finger, herself. She knew, but couldn't tell him, that he could have done no better thing for himself. Had he, any time these ten years, asked her to marry him, she would have replied quietly, Very well. When? He had never thought of it. Yours is the real work, she continued quietly. Without you, we jackals couldn't exist. You and a few like you hold everything upon your shoulders. For a minute there was a silence. Then it occurred to Oleron that this was common vulgar grumbling. It wasn't his habit. Suddenly he rose and began to stack cups and plates on the tray. Sorry you catch me like this, Elsie, he said with a little laugh. No, I'll take them out. Then we'll go for a walk if you like. He carried out the tray and began to show Miss Bengough round his flat. She made few comments. In the kitchen she asked what an old faded square of reddish frieze was that Mrs. Barrett used as a cushion for her wooden chair. That! I should be glad if you could tell me what it is, Oleron replied, as he unfolded the bag and related the story of its finding in the window seat. I think I know what it is, said Miss Bengough. It's been used to wrap up a harp before putting it in its case. By Jove, that's probably just what it is, said Oleron. I could make neither head nor tail of it. They finished the tour of the flat and returned to the sitting-room. "'And uh, who lives in the rest of the house?' Miss Bengough asked. "'I dare say a tramp sleeps in the cellar occasionally. Nobody else.' Mm. "'Well, I'll tell you what I think about it, if you like. I should like. You'll never work here.' "'Oh,' said Oleron quickly, "'why not? You'll never finish Romilly here. Why, I don't know. But you won't. I know it. You'll have to leave before you get on with that book.' 
He mused for a moment and then said, Isn't that a little prejudiced, Elsie? Perfectly ridiculous. As an argument, it hasn't a leg to stand on. But there it is, she replied, her mouth once more full of large-headed hat pins. Oleron was reaching down his hat and coat. He laughed. I can only hope you're entirely wrong, he said, for I shall be in a serious mess if Romilly isn't out in the autumn. As Oleron sat by his fire that evening, pondering Miss Bengough's prognostication that difficulties awaited him in his work, he came to the conclusion that it would have been far better had she kept her beliefs to herself. No man does a thing better for having his confidence stamped at the outset, and to speak of difficulties is in a sense to make them. Speech itself becomes a deterrent act, to which other discouragements accrete until the very event of which warning is given is as likely as not to come to pass. He heartily confounded her. An influence hostile to the completion of Romilly had been born. And in some illogical, dogmatic way women seemed to have, she had attached this antagonistic influence to his new abode. Was ever anything so absurd? You'll never finish Romilly here. Why not? Was this her idea of the luxury that saps the springs of action and brings a man down to indolence and dropping out of the race? The place was well enough. It was entirely charming for the matter, but it wasn't so demoralising as all that. No, Elsie had missed a mark that time. He moved his chair to look around the room that smiled, positively smiled in the firelight. He too smiled, as if pity was to be entertained for a maligned apartment. Even that slight lack of robust colour, he had remarked, was not noticeable in the soft glow. The drawn chintz curtains, they had a flowered and trellised pattern, with baskets and oaten pipes, fell in long, quiet folds to the window seats. The rows of bindings in old bookcases took the light richly. The last trace of sallowness had gone with the daylight, and if the truth must be told, it had been Elsie herself who had seemed a little out of the picture. That reflection struck him a little, and presently he returned to it. Yes, the room had, quite accidentally, done Miss Bengough a disservice that afternoon. It had, in some subtle but unmistakable way, placed her, marked a contrast of qualities. Assuming for the sake of argument the slightly ridiculous proposition that the room in which Oleron sat was characterised by a certain sparsity and lack of vigour, so much the worse for Miss Bengough. She certainly erred on the side of redundancy and general muchness. And if one must contrast abstract qualities, Oleron inclined to the austere in taste, Yes, here Oleron had made a distinct discovery. He wondered had he not made it before. He pictured Miss Bengough again as she had appeared that afternoon, large, showy, moistly pink, with that quality of the prized bloom exuding as it was from her, and instantly she suffered in his thought. He even recognised now that he had noticed something odd at the time, and that unconsciously his attitude, even while she had been there, had been one of criticism. The mechanism of her was a little obvious. Her melting humidity was a result of analysable processes, and behind her there had seemed to lurk some dim shape emblematic of mortality. He had never, during the ten years of their intimacy, dreamed for a moment of asking her to marry him. Nonetheless, he now felt for the first time a thankfulness that he hadn't done so. Then suddenly and swiftly his face flamed that he should be thinking thus of his friend. What Elsie Bengough, with whom he had spent weeks and weeks of afternoons, she the good chum, on whose help he would have counted that all the rest of the world failed him, she whose loyalty to him would not, he knew, swerve as long as there was breath in her, Elsie, to be even in thought dissected thus, he was an ingrate and a cad. Had she been there in that moment, he would have abased himself before her. For ten minutes and more he sat, still gazing into the fire, with that humiliating red fading slowly from his cheeks. All was still within and without, save for a tiny musical tinkling that came from his kitchen, the dripping of water from an imperfectly turned-off tap into the vessel beneath it. Mechanically he began to beat with his finger to the faintly heard falling of the drops. The tiny, regular movement seemed to hasten that shameful withdrawal from his face. He grew cool once more, and when he resumed his meditation, 
he was all unconscious that he took it up again at the same point. It was not only her florid superfluity of build that he had approached in the attitude of criticism. He was conscious also of the wide differences between her mind and his own. He felt no thankfulness that up to a certain point their natures had ever run companionably side by side. He was now full of questions beyond that point. Their intellects diverged, there was no denying it, and looking back, he was inclined to doubt whether there had been any real coincidence. True, he had read his writings to her, and she had appeared to speak comprehendingly and to the point, but what can a man do, who, having assumed that another sees as he does, is suddenly brought up sharp by something that falsifies and discredits all that has gone before? He doubted all now. It did for a moment occur to him that the man who demands of a friend more than can be given to him is in danger of losing that friend. But he put the thought aside. And he ceased to think, and again moved his finger to the distant dripping of the tap. And now, he resumed by and by, if these things were true of Elsie Bengough, they were also true of the creation of which she was the prototype, Romilly Bishop. And since he could say of Romilly what for very shame he could not say of Elsie, he gave his thoughts rein. He did so in that smiling, fire-lighted room to the accompaniment of the faintly heard tap. There was no longer any doubt about it. He hated the central character of his novel. Even as he had described her physically, she overpowered the senses. She was coarse-fibred, over-coloured, rank. It became true the moment he formulated his thoughts. Gulliver had described the Brobdingnagian maids of honour thus, and mentally and spiritually she corresponded, was unsensitive, limited, common. The model, he closed his eyes for a moment, the model struck out through fifteen vulgar and blatant chapters to such a pitch that without seeing the reason he had been unable to begin the sixteenth. He marvelled that it had only just dawned upon him. And this was to have been his Beatrice, his vision, as Elsie she was to have gone into the furnace of his art, and she was to come out the woman all men desire. Her thoughts were to have been culled from his own finest, her form from his dearest dreams, and her setting wherever he could find one fit for her worth. He had brooded long before making the attempt. Then one day he had felt a stir within him, as a mother feels a quickening, and he had begun to write, and so he had added chapter to chapter, and those fifteen sodden chapters were what he had produced. Again he sat, softly moving his finger, and he bestirred himself. She must go, all fifteen chapters of her, that was settled. For what was to take her place, his mind was a blank, but one thing at a time. A man is not excused from taking the wrong course, because the right one isn't immediately revealed to him. Better would come if it was to come. In the meantime, he rose, fetched the fifteen chapters, and read them over before he should drop them into the fire. But instead of putting them into the fire, he let them fall from his hand. He became conscious of the dripping of the tap again. It had a tinkling gamut of four or five notes, on which it rang irregular changes, and it was foolishly sweet and dulcimer-like. In his mind, Oleron could see the gathering of each drop, its little tremble on the lip of the tap, and the tiny percussion of its fall, plink, plunk, minimised almost to inaudibility. Following the lowest note, there seemed to be a brief phrase, irregularly repeated, and presently Oleron found himself waiting for the recurrence of this phrase, it was quite pretty, but it did not conduce to wakefulness, and Oleron dozed over his fire. When he awoke again, the fire had burned low, and the flames of the candles were licking the rims of the Sheffield sticks. Sluggishly he rose, yawned, went his nightly round of door locks and window fastenings, and passed into his bedroom. Soon he slept soundly. But a curious little sequel followed on the morrow. Mrs. Barrett usually tapped, not at his door, but at the wooden wall beyond which lay Oleron's bed, and then Oleron rose, put on his dressing-gown, and admitted her. He was not conscious that as he did so that morning he hummed an air, but Mrs. Barrett, lingering with her hand on the doorknob and her face a little averted and smiling, "'Dear me,' her soft falsetto rose, "'but that will be a very old tune, Mr. Oleron. I will not have heard it these forty years.' "'What tune?' Oleron asked. 
that tune, indeed, that you was humming, sir. Oleron had his thumb in the flap of a letter that remained there. I was humming. Sing it, Mrs. Barrett. Mrs. Barrett pr prutted. I have no voice for singing, Mr. Oleron. It was Anne Pew who was the singer of our family. But the tune will be very old, and it is called The Beckoning Fair One. Try to sing it, said Oleron, his thumb still in the envelope. And Mrs. Barrett, with much dimpling and confusion, hummed the air. They do say it was sung to a harp, Mr. Oleron, and it will be very old, she concluded. And I was singing that. Indeed you was. I would not be likely to tell you lies. With a very well, let me have breakfast, Oleron opened his letter. But the trifling circumstance struck him as more odd than he would have admitted to himself. The phrase he had hummed had been that which he had associated with the falling from the tap on the evening before. Part 5 Even more curious than the commonplace dripping of an ordinary water tap should have tallied so closely with an actually existing air was another result it had, namely that it awakened, or seemed to awaken, in Oleron, an abnormal sensitiveness to other noises of the old house. It has been remarked that the silence obtains its fullest and most impressive quality when it is broken by some minute sound. and. Truth to tell, the place was never still. Perhaps the mildness of the spring air operated on its torpid old timbers. Perhaps Oleron's fires caused it to stretch its own anatomy. And certainly a whole world of insect life bored and burrowed in its balks and joists. At any rate, Oleron had only to sit quiet in his chair and to wait for a minute or two in order to become aware of such a change in the auditory scale as comes upon a man who, conceiving the midsummer woods to be motionless and still, all at once finds his ear sharpened to the crepitation of a myriad insects. And he smiled to think of man's arbitrary distinction between that which has life and that which has not. Here, quite apart from such recognisable sounds as the scampering of mice, the falling of plaster behind its panelling, and the popping of purses or coffins from his fire, was a whole house talking to him, had he but known its language. Beams settled with a tired sigh into the old mortises, creatures ticked in the walls, joints cracked, boards complained. With no palpable stirring of the air, window sashes changed their positions with a soft knock in their frames. And whether the place had life in this sense or not, it had at all events a winsome personality. It needed but an hour of musing for Oleron to conceive the idea that, as his own body stood in friendly relation to his soul, so, by an extension and an attenuation, his habitation might fantastically be supposed to stand in some relation to himself. He even amused himself with the far-fetched fancy that he might so identify himself with the place that some future tenant, taking possession, might regard it as in a sense haunted. It would be rather a joke if he, a perfectly harmless author, with nothing on his mind worse than a novel he had discovered he must begin again, should turn out to be laying the foundation of a future ghost. In proportion, however, as he felt this growing attachment to the fabric of his abode, Elsie Bengough, from being merely unattracted, began to show a dislike of the place that was more and more marked and she did not scruple to speak of her aversion. It doesn't belong to today at all, and for you, especially, it's bad, she said with decision. You're only too ready to let go your hold on actual things and to slip into apathy. You ought to be in a place with concrete floors and a patent gas meter and a tradesman's lift, and it would do you all the good in the world if you had a job that made you scramble and rub elbows with your fellow men. Now, if I could get you a job for, say, two or three days a week, one that would allow you heaps of time for your proper work, would you take it? Somehow Oleron resented a little being diagnosed like this. He thanked Miss Bengough, but without a smile. Thank you, but I don't think so. After all, each of us has his own life to live, he couldn't refrain from adding. His own life to live? How long is it since you were out, Paul? About two hours. 
I don't mean to buy stamps or to post a letter. How long is it since you had anything like a stretch? Oh, some little time, perhaps, I don't know. Since I was here last, I haven't been out much. And has Romilly progressed much better for your being cooped up? I think she has. I'm laying the foundations of her. I shall begin the actual writing presently. It seemed as if Miss Bengough had forgotten their tussle about the first Romilly. She frowned, turned half away, and then quickly turned again. Ah, so you've still got that ridiculous idea in your head. If you mean, said Oleron slowly, that I've discarded the old Romilly, and I'm at work on a new one, you're right. I have still got that idea in my head. Something uncordial in his tone struck her, but she was a fighter. His own absurd sensitiveness hardened her. She gave a pshaw of impatience. Where's the old one? she demanded abruptly. Why? asked Oleron. I want to see it. I want to show some of it to you. I want, if you're not wool-gathering entirely, to bring you back to your senses. This time it was he who turned his back, but when he turned around again, he spoke more gently. It's no good, Elsie. I'm responsible for the way I go, and you must allow me to go it, even if it should seem wrong to you. Believe me, I am giving thought to it. The manuscript? I was on the point of burning it, but I didn't. It's in that window seat, if you must see it. Miss Bengough crossed quickly to the window seat and lifted the lid. Suddenly she gave a little exclamation and put the back of her hand to her mouth. She spoke over her shoulder. You ought to knock those nails in, Paul, she said. He strode to her side. What? What is it? What's the matter? he asked. I did knock them in, or rather pulled them out. You left enough to scratch with, she replied, showing her hand. From the upper wrist to the knuckle of the little finger, a welling red wound showed. Good gracious, Oleron ejaculated. Here, come to the bathroom and bathe it quickly. He hurried her to the bathroom, turned on warm water and bathed and cleansed the bad gash. Then, still holding the hand, he turned cold water on it, uttering broken phrases of astonishment and concern. Good Lord, how did that happen? As far as I knew, I'd... Is this water too cold? Does that hurt? I can't imagine how on earth... There, that'll do. No, one moment longer. I can bear it, she murmured. Her eyes closed. Presently, he led her back to the sitting room and bound the hand in one of his handkerchiefs, but his face did not lose its expression of perplexity. He had spent half a day in opening and making serviceable the three window boxes, and he could not conceive how he had come to leave an inch and a half of rusty nail standing in the wood. He himself had opened the lids of each of them a dozen times and hadn't noticed any nail, but there it was. It shall come out now, at all events, he muttered, as he went for a pair of pinches, and he made no mistake about it that time. Elsie Bengough had sunk into a chair, and her face was rather white, but in her hand was the manuscript of Romilly. She had not finished with Romilly yet. Presently she returned to the charge. Oh, Paul, it will be the greatest mistake you ever, ever made if you do not publish this, she said. He hung his head, genuinely distressed. He couldn't get that incident of the nail out of his head, and Romilly occupied a second place in his thoughts for the moment. But still she insisted, and when presently he spoke, it was almost as if he asked a pardon for something. What can I say, Elsie? I can only hope that when you see the new version, you'll see how right I am. And if in spite of all you don't like her, well, he made a hopeless gesture. Don't you see that I must be guided by my own lights? She was silent. Come on, Elsie, he said gently. We've got along well so far. Don't let us split on this. The last words had hardly passed his lips before he regretted them. She had been nursing her injured hand with her eyes once more closed, but her lips and lids quivered simultaneously. Her voice shook as she spoke. I can't help saying it, Paul, but you are so greatly changed. Harsh, Elsie, he murmured soothingly. You've had a shock. Rest for a while. How could I change? I don't know, but you are. You've not been yourself ever since you came here. I wish you'd never seen the place. It's stopped your work, it's making you into a person I hardly know, and it's made me horribly anxious about you. Oh, how my hand is beginning to throb. Poor child, he murmured. Will you let me take you to the doctor and have it properly dressed? No, I shall be all right presently. I'll keep it raised. She put her elbow on the back of her chair, and the bandaged hand rested lightly on his shoulder. 
At that touch, an entirely new anxiety stirred suddenly within him. Hundreds of times previously, on their jaunts and excursions, she had slipped her hand within his arm as she might have slipped it into the arm of a brother, and he had accepted the little affectionate gesture as a brother might have accepted it. But now, for the first time, there rushed into his mind a hundred startling questions. Her eyes were still closed, and her head had fallen pathetically back, and there was a lost and ineffable smile on her parted lips. The truth broke in upon him. Good God! And he had never divined it. And stranger than all was that now that he did see that she was lost in love of him, there came to him not sorrow and humility and abasement, but something else that he struggled in vain against, something entirely strange and new, that, had he analysed it, he would have found to be petulance and irritation and resentment and ungentleness. The sudden selfish prompting mastered him before he was aware. He all but gave it words. What was she doing there at all? Why wasn't she getting on with her own work? Why was she here interfering with his? Who had given her this guardianship over him that lately she had put forward so assertively? Changed. It was she, not himself, who had changed. But by the time she had opened her eyes again, he had overcome his resentment sufficiently to speak gently, albeit with reserve. I wish you'd let me take you to a doctor. She rose. No, thank you, Paul, she said. I'll go now. If I need a dressing, I'll get one. Take the other hand, please. Goodbye. He didn't attempt to detain her. He walked with her to the foot of the stairs. Halfway along the narrow alley, she turned. It will be a long way to come if you happen not to be in, she said. I'll send you a postcard the next time. At the gate, she turned again. Leave here, Paul, she said with a mournful look. Everything's wrong with this house. Then she was gone. Oleron returned to his room. He crossed straight to the window box. He opened the lid and stood long looking at it. Then he closed it again and turned away. That's rather frightening, he muttered. It's simply not possible that I shouldn't have removed that nail. Six. Oleron knew very well what Elsie had meant when she had said that her next visit would be preceded by a postcard. She, too, had realised that at last, at last he knew, knew, and didn't want her. It gave him a miserable, pitiful pang, therefore, when she came again within a week, knocking at the door unannounced. She spoke from the landing. She didn't intend to stay, she said, and he had to press her before she would so much as enter. Her excuse for calling was that she had heard of an inquiry for short stories that he might be wise to follow up. He thanked her. Then, her business being over, she seemed anxious to get away again. Oleron did not seek to detain her, even though he saw through the pretext of the stories, and he accompanied her down the stairs. But Elsie Bengough had no luck whatever in that house. A second accident befell her. Halfway down the staircase... There was the sharp sound of splintering wood, and she checked a loud cry. Oleron knew the woodwork to be old, but he himself had ascended and descended frequently enough without mishap. Elsie had put her foot through one of the stairs. He sprang to her side in alarm. Oh, I say, my poor girl! She laughed hysterically. It's my weight. I know I'm getting fat. Keep still. Let me clear these splinters away, he muttered between his teeth. She continued to laugh and sob that it was her weight. She was getting fat. He thrust downwards at the broken boards. The extrication was no easy matter, and her torn boot showed him how badly the foot and ankle within it must be abraded. Good God, good God, he muttered over and over again. I shall be too heavy for anything soon, she sobbed and laughed. But she refused to reascend and to examine her hurt. No, let me go quickly, let me go quickly, she repeated. But it's a frightful gash. No, not so bad. Let me get away quickly. I'm, I'm, I'm not wanted. At her words, that she was not wanted, his head dropped as if she had given him a buffet. Elsie, he choked brokenly and shocked. But she too made a quick gesture as if she put something violently aside. Oh, Paul, not that. Not you. Of course I do mean that too, in a sense. Oh, oh, you know what I mean. But if the other can't be... Spare me this now. I wouldn't have come, but... 
Oh, I did try to keep away. It was intolerable, heartbreaking. But what could he do? What could he say? He didn't love her. Let me go. I'm not wanted. Let me take away what's left of me. Dear Elsie, you are very dear to me. But again she made the gesture as of putting something violently aside. No, not that. Not anything less. Don't offer me anything less. Leave me a little pride. Let me get my hat and coat. Let me take you to a doctor, he muttered. But she refused. She refused even the support of his arm. She gave another unsteady laugh. I'm sorry I broke your stairs, Paul. You will go and see about the short stories, won't you? He groaned. Then, if you won't see a doctor, will you go across the square and let Mrs. Barrett look at you? Look, there's Barrett passing now. The long-nosed Barrett was looking curiously down the alley, but as Oleron was about to call him, he made off without a word. Elsie seemed anxious for nothing so much as to be clear of the place, and finally promised to go straight to a doctor, but insisted on going alone. Goodbye, she said. And Oleron watched her until she was past the hatchet-like to let boards, as if he feared that even they might fall upon her and maim her. That night, Oleron didn't dine. He had far too much on his mind. He walked from room to room of his flat, as if he could have walked away from Elsie Bengough's haunting cry that still rang in his ears. I'm not wanted. Don't offer me anything less. Let me take away what's left of me. Oh, if he could only have persuaded himself that he loved her. He walked until twilight fell, then, without lighting candles, he stirred up the fire and flung himself into a chair. Poor, poor Elsie. But even while his heart ached for her, it was out of the question. If only he'd known, if only he'd used common observation, but those walks, those sisterly takings of the arm, what a fool he had been. Well, it was too late now. It was she, not he, who must now act, act by keeping away. He would help her all he could. He himself would not sit in her presence. If she came, he would hurry her out again as fast as he could. Poor, poor Elsie. His room grew dark, the fire burned dead, and he continued to sit, wincing from time to time as a fresh tortured phrase rang again in his ears. Then, suddenly, he knew not why, he found himself anxious for her in a new sense, uneasy about her personal safety. A horrible fancy that even then she might be looking over an embankment down into the dark water, that she might even now be glancing up at the hook on the door, took him. Women had been known to do these things. Then there'd be an inquest, and he himself would be called upon to identify her, and would be asked how she had come by an ill-healed wound on the hand and a bad abrasion of the ankle. Barrett would say that he had seen her leaving his house. Then he recognised that his thoughts were morbid. By an effort of will he put them aside and sat for a while listening to the faint creakings and tickings and rappings within his panelling. If only he could have married her. But he couldn't. Her face had risen before him again as he had seen it on the stairs, drawn with pain and ugly and swollen with tears. Ugly, yes, positively blubbered. If tears were women's weapons, as they were said to be, such tears were weapons turned against themselves. Suicide again. Then, all at once, he found himself attentively considering her two accidents. Extraordinary they had been, both of them. He could not have left that old nail standing in the wood. Why, he had fetched tools especially from the kitchen, and he was convinced that the step that had broken beneath her weight had been as sound as the others. It was inexplicable. If these things could happen, anything could happen. There was not a beam nor a jam in the place that might not fall without warning, not a plank that might not crash inwards, not a nail that might not become a dagger. The whole place was full of life, even now. As he sat there in the dark, he heard its crowds of noises, as if the house had been one great microphone. Only half conscious that he did so, he had been sitting for some time identifying these noises, attributing each crack or creak or knock its material cause. But there was one noise, which again not fully conscious of the omission, he had not sought to account for. It had last come some minutes ago. It came again now. A sort of soft, sweeping rustle it seemed to hold an almost inaudibly minute crackling. For half a minute or so, it had Oleron's attention. 
then his heavy thoughts were of Elsie Bengough again. He was nearer to loving her in that moment than he had ever been. He thought how to some men their loved ones were but the dearer for those poor mortal blemishes that tell us we are but sojourners on earth, with a common fate not far distant that makes it hardly worthwhile to do anything but love for the time remaining. Strangling sobs, blearing tears, bodies buffeted by sickness, hearts and minds callous and hard with the rubs of the world. How little love there would be were these things a barrier to love. In that sense he did love Elsie Bengough. What her happiness had never moved in him, a sorrow almost awoke. Suddenly his meditation went. His ear had once more become conscious of that soft and repeated noise, the long sweep with the almost inaudible crackle in it. Again and again it came with a curious insistence and urgency. It quickened a little as he became increasingly attentive. It seemed to Oleron that it grew louder. All at once he started bolt upright in his chair, tense and listening. The silky rustle came again. He was trying to attach it to something. The next moment he had leapt to his feet, unnerved and terrified. His chair hung poised for a moment and then went over, setting the fire irons clattering as it fell. There was only one noise in the world like that which had caused him to spring thus to his feet. The next time it came, Olderon felt behind him at the empty air with his hand and backed slowly until he found himself against the wall. God in heaven! The ejaculation broke from Olderon's lips. The sound had ceased. The next moment he had given a high cry. What is it? What's there? Who's there? A sound of scuttling caused his knees to bend under him for a moment, but that he knew was a mouse. That was not something that his stomach turned sick and his mind reeled to entertain. That other sound, the like of which was not in the world, had now entirely ceased, and again he called. He called and continued to call, and then another terror, a terror of the sound of his own voice seized him. He didn't dare to call again. His shaking hand went to his pocket for a match, but found none. He thought there might be matches on the mantelpiece. He worked his way to the mantelpiece round a little recess, without for a moment leaving the wall. Then his hand encountered the mantelpiece and groped along it. A box of matches fell to the hearth. He could just see them in the firelight, but his hand could not pick them up until he had cornered them inside the fender. Then he rose and struck a light. The room was as usual. He struck a second match. The candle stood on the table, he lighted it, and the flame sank for a moment and then burned up clear. Again he looked round. There was nothing, but there had been something, and might still be something. Formerly Oleron had smiled at the fantastic thought that by merging an interplay of identities between himself and his beautiful room he might be preparing a ghost for the future. It had not occurred to him that there might have been a similar merging and coalescence in the past, yet... With this staggering impossibility he was now face to face. Something did persist in the house. It had a tenant other than himself, and that tenant, whatsoever, or whosoever, had appalled Oleron's soul by producing the sound of a woman brushing her hair.
seven. Without quite knowing how he came to be there, Oleron found himself striding over the loose board he had temporarily placed on the step broken by Miss Bengough. He was hatless, and descending the stairs, not until later did there return to him a hazy memory that he had left the candle burning on the table, had opened the door no wider than was necessary to allow the passage of his body, and had sidled out, closing the door softly behind him. At the foot of the stairs another shock awaited him. Something dashed with the flurry up from the disused cellars and disappeared out of the door. It was only a cat, but Oleron gave a childish sob. He passed out of the gate and stood for a moment under the toilette boards, plucking foolishly at his lip and looking up at the glimmer of light behind one of his red blinds. Then, still looking over his shoulder, he moved, stumblingly, up the square. There was a small public house round the corner. Oleron had never entered it, but he entered it now and put down a shilling that missed the counter by inches. Brandy, he said, and then stooped to look for the shilling. He had the little sawdust bar to himself what company there was. Carters and labourers and the small tradesmen of the neighbourhood was gathered in the farther compartment, beyond the space where the white-haired landlady moved about her taps and bottles. Oleron sat down on a hardwood settee with a perforated seat, drank half his brandy, and then, thinking he might as well drink it as spill it, finished it. Then he fell to wondering which of the men whose voices he heard across the public house would undertake the removal of his effects on the morrow. In the meantime, he ordered more brandy, for he did not intend to go back to that room where he had left the candle burning. Oh no, he couldn't have faced even the entry in the staircase with the broken step, certainly not that pith-white, fascinating room. He would go back for the present to his old arrangement of workroom and separate sleeping quarters. He would go to his old landlady at once, presently, when he had finished his brandy, and see if she could put him up for the night. His glass was empty now. He rose, had it refilled, and sat down again. And if anybody asked his reason for removing again, oh, he had reason enough, reason enough. Nails that put themselves back into wood again and gashed people's hands. Steps that broke when you trod on them and women who came into a man's place and brushed their hair in the dark were reasons enough. He was querulous and injured about it all. He had taken the place for himself, not for invisible women to brush their hair in. That lawyer fellow in Lincoln's Inn should be told so, too, before many hours were out. It was outrageous, letting people in for agreements like that. A cut glass partition divided the compartment where Oleron sat from the space where the white-haired landlady moved but it stopped seven or eight inches above the level of the counter. There was no partition at the further bar. Presently, Oleron, raising his eyes, saw that faces were watching him through the aperture. The faces disappeared when he looked at them. He moved to a corner where he could not be seen from the other bar, but this brought him into line with the white-haired landlady. She knew him by sight, had doubtless seen him passing and repassing, and presently she made a remark on the weather. Oleron did not know what he replied, but it sufficed to call forth a further remark that the winter had been a bad one for influenza and that the spring weather seemed to be coming at last. Even this slight contact with the commonplace steadied Oleron a little. An idle, nascent wonder whether the landlady brushed her hair every night, and if so, whether it gave out those little electric cracklings were shut down with a snap, and Oleron was better. With his next glass of brandy, he was all for going back to his flat. Not go back, indeed, he would go back. They should very soon see whether he was to be turned out of his place like that. He began to wonder why he was doing the rather unusual thing he was doing at that moment. Unusual for him, sitting, hatless, drinking brandy in a public house. Suppose he were to tell the white-haired landlady all about it, to tell her that a caller had scratched her hand on a nail, that later had had the bad luck to put her foot through a rotten stair, and that he himself, in an old house full of squeaks and creaks and whispers, had heard a minute noise and had bolted from it in fright. What would she think of him? That he was mad, of course. Pshh. The real truth of the matter was that he hadn't been doing enough work to occupy him. He had been dreaming his days away, filling his head with a lot of moonshine about a new Romilly, as if the old one wasn't good enough. And now he was surprised that the devil should enter an empty head. Yes, he would go back. He would take a walk in the air first, he hadn't walked enough recently, and then he would take himself in hand, settle the hash of that sixteenth chapter of Romilly, 
fancy he had actually been fool enough to think of destroying fifteen chapters, and thenceforth he would remember that he had obligations to his fellow men and work to do in the world. There was the matter in a nutshell. He finished his brandy and went out. He had walked for some time before any other bearing of the matter than that on himself occurred to him. At first, the fresh air had increased the heady effect of the brandy he had drunk, but afterwards his mind grew clearer than it had been since morning, and the clearer it grew, the less final did his boastful self-assurances become, and the firmer his conviction that, when all explanations had been made, there remained something that could not be explained. His hysteria of an hour before had passed. He grew steadily calmer, but the disquieting conviction remained. Deep fear took possession of him. It was a fear for Elsie. For something in this place was inimical to her safety. Of themselves, her two accidents might not have persuaded him of this, but she herself had said it. I'm not wanted here. And she had declared that there was something wrong with the place. She had seen it before he had, well and good. One thing stood out clearly, namely, that if this was so, she must be kept away for quite another reason than that which had so confounded and humiliated Oleron. Luckily, she had expressed her intention of staying away. She must be held to that intention. He must see to it. And he must see to it all the more that he now saw his first impulse never to set foot in the place again was absurd. People didn't do that kind of thing. With Elsie made secure, he could not, with any respect to himself, suffer himself to be turned out by a shadow nor even by a danger merely because it was a danger. He had to live somewhere, and he would live there. He must return. He mastered the faint chill of fear that came with the decision and turned in his walk abruptly. Should fear grow on him, should fear grow on him again, he would perhaps take one more glass of brandy. But by the time he reached the short street that led to the square, he was too late for more brandy. The little public house was still lighted, but closed and one or two men were standing talking on the curb. Oleron noticed that a sudden silence fell on them as he passed, and he noticed further that the long-nosed Barrett, whom he passed a little lower down, did not return his good night. He turned in at the broken gate, hesitated, merely an instant in the alley, and then mounted his stairs again. Only an inch of candle remained in the Sheffield stick, and Oleron did not light another one. Deliberately, he forced himself to take it up, to make the tour of his five rooms before retiring. It was as he returned from the kitchen across his little hall that he noticed that a letter lay on the floor. He carried it into his sitting room and glanced at the envelope before opening it. It was unstamped and had been put into the door by hand. His handwriting was clumsy, and it ran from beginning to end without a comma or period. Oleron read the first line, turned to the signature, and then finished the letter. It was from the man Barrett, and it informed Oleron that he, Barrett, would be obliged if Mr. Oleron would make other arrangements for the preparing of his breakfasts and the cleaning out of his place. The sting lay in the tail, that is to say, the postscript. This consisted of a text of scripture. It embodied an allusion that could only be to Elsie Bengough. A seldom-seen frown had cut deeply into Oleron's brow. So that was it. Very well. They would see about that on the morrow, but the rest is seemed merely another reason why Elsie should keep away. Then his suppressed rage broke out. The foul-minded lot, the devil himself could not have given a leer at anything that had ever passed between Paul Oleron and Elsie Bengough, yet this nosing rascal must be prying and talking. Oleron crumpled the paper up, held it in the candle flame, and then ground the ashes under his heel. One useful purpose, however, the letter had served. It had created an Oleron a wrathful blaze that effectually banished pale shadows. Nevertheless, one other puzzling circumstance was to close the day. As he undressed, he chanced to glance at his bed. The coverlets bore an impression as if somebody had lain on them. Oleron couldn't remember that he himself had lain down during the day. Offhand, he would have said that certainly he had not, but after all he could not be positive. His indignation for Elsie acting possibly with the residue of the brandy in him excluded all other considerations, and, as he put down his candle, lay down and passed immediately into a deep and dreamless sleep, which, in the absence of Mrs. Barrett's morning call, 
lasted almost once round the clock. Part 8 To the man who pays heed to that voice within him, which warns him that twilight and danger are settling over his soul, terror is apt to appear an absolute thing, against which his heart must be safeguarded in a twink unless there is to take place an alteration in the whole range and scale of his nature. Mercifully, he is never far to look for safeguards. Of the immediate and small and common and momentary things of life, of usages and observances and modes and conventions, he builds up fortifications against the powers of darkness. He is even content that not terror only, but joy also, should be for working purposes be placed in the category of the absolute things, and the last treason he will commit will be that breaking down of terms and limits that strikes not at one man, but at the welfare of the souls of all. In his own person, Oleron began to commit this treason. He began to commit it by admitting the inexplicable and horrible to an increasing familiarity. He did it insensibly, unconsciously, by a neglect of the things that he now regarded it as an impertinence in Elsie Bengoff to have prescribed. Two months before, the words a haunted house applied to his lovely, bemusing dwelling would have chilled his marrow. Now, his scale of sensation becoming depressed, he could ask, haunted by what? And remain unconscious that horror, when it can be proved to be relative, by so much loses its proper quality. He was setting aside the landmarks. Mists and confusion had begun to enwrap him and he was conscious of nothing so much as of a voracious inquisitiveness. He wanted to know. He was resolved to know. Nothing but the knowledge would satisfy him, and craftily he cast about for means whereby he might attain it. He might have spared his craft. The matter was the easiest imaginable. As in time past he had known in his writing moments when his thoughts had seemed to rise of themselves and to embody themselves in words not to be altered afterwards, so now the questions he put himself seemed to be answered even in the moment of their asking. There was exhilaration in the swift, easy processes. He had known no such joy in his own power since the days when his writing had been a daily freshness and a delight to him. It was almost as if the course he must pursue was being dictated to him. And the first thing he must do, of course, was to define the problem. He defined it in terms of mathematics. Granted that he had not the place to himself, granted that the old house had inexpressibly caught and engaged his spirit, granted that by virtue of the common denominator of the place, this unknown co-tenant stood in some relation to himself, what next? Clearly, the nature of the other numerator must be ascertained. And how? Ordinarily, this would not have seemed simple, but to Oleron it was now pellucidly clear. The key, of course, lay in his half-written novel, or rather in both Romilly's, the old and the proposed new one. A little while before, Oleron would have thought himself mad to have embraced such an opinion. Now he accepted the dizzying hypothesis without a quiver. He began to examine the first and second Romilies. From the moment of his doing so, the thing advanced by leaps and bounds. Swiftly he reviewed the history of the Romilly of the fifteen chapters. He remembered clearly now that he had found her insufficient on the very first morning on which he had sat down to work in his new place. Other instances of this aversion leaped up to confirm his obscure investigation. There had come the night when he had hardly forborne to throw the whole thing into the fire, and the next morning he had begun the planning of the new Romilly. It had been on that morning that Mrs. Barrett, overhearing him humming a brief phrase at the dripping of a tap the night before had suggested, had informed him that he was singing some air he had never in his life heard before, called The Beckoning Fair One. The beckoning fair one. With scarcely a pause in thought, he continued. The first Romilly having been definitely thrown over, 
The second had instantly fastened herself upon him, clamouring for birth in his brain. He even fancied now, looking back, that there had been something like passion, hate almost, in the supplanting, and that more than once a stray thought given to his discarded creation had, it was astonishing how credible Oleron found the almost unthinkable idea, had offended the supplanter. Yet that a malignancy almost homicidal should be extended to his fiction's poor mortal prototype. In spite of his inuring to a scale in which the horrible was now a thing to be fingered and turned this way and that, a good God broke from Oleron. This intrusion of the first Romilly's prototype into his thought again was a factor that for the moment brought his inquiry into the nature of his problem to a termination. The mere thought of Elsie was fatal to anything abstract. For another thing, he could not yet think of that letter of Barrett's, nor of a little scene that had followed it without a mounting of colour and a quick contraction of the brow. For wisely or not, he had had that argument out at once. Striding across the square on the following morning, he had bearded Barrett on his own doorstep. Coming back again a few minutes later, he had been strongly of the opinion that he had only made matters worse. The man had been vagueness itself. He had not been to be either challenged or browbeaten into anything more definite than a muttered farrago in which the words, Certain things, Mrs. Barrett, respectable ass, if the cap fits, proceedings that shall be nameless, had been constantly repeated. Nor that I make any charge, he had concluded. Charge? Old Ron had cried. I have my ideas of things, and I don't doubt you have yours. Ideas? Mine? Oleron had cried wrathfully, immediately dropping his voice as heads had appeared at windows of the square. Look you here, my man. You've an unwholesome mind which probably you can't help, but a tongue which you can help, and shall, if there is a breath of this repeated. I'll not be talked to on my own doorstep like this by anybody, Barrett had blustered. You shall, and I'm doing it. Don't you forget there's a god above all who has said... You're a low scandal-monger, and so forth, continuing badly what was already badly begun. Oleron had returned wrathfully to his own house, and thenceforward, looking out of his windows, had seen Barrett's face at odd times, lifting blinds or peering round curtains, as if he sought to put himself in possession of heaven knew what evidence, in case it should be required of him. The unfortunate occurrence made certain minor differences in Oleron's domestic arrangements. Barrett's tongue, he gathered, had already been busy. He was looked at askance by the dwellers of the square, and he judged it better, until he should be able to obtain other help, to make his purchases of provisions a little farther afield, rather than at the small shops of the immediate neighbourhood. For the rest, housekeeping was no new thing to him, and he would resume his old bachelor habits. Besides, he was deep in certain rather abstruse investigations in which it was better that he should not be disturbed. He was looking out of his window one midday rather tired, not very well, and glad that it was not very likely he would have to stir out of doors when he saw Elsie Bengough crossing the square towards his house. The weather had broken. It was a raw and gusty day, and she had to force her way against the wind that set her ample skirts bellying about her opulent figure, and her veil spinning and streaming behind her. Oleron acted swiftly and instinctively. Seizing his hat, he sprang to the door and descended the stairs at a run. A sort of panic had seized him. She must be prevented from setting foot in the place. As he ran along the alley, he was conscious that his eyes went up to the eaves, as if something drew them. He did not know that a slate might not accidentally fall. He met her at the gate and spoke with curious volubleness. This is really too bad, Elsie, just as I'm urgently called away. I'm afraid it can't be helped, though, and that you have to think me an inhospitable beast. He poured it out, just as it came into his head. She asked if he was going to town. Yes, yes, to town, he replied. I've got to call on um, uh, Chambers. You know Chambers, don't you? No, I remember you don't. Big man, you once saw me with. I ought to have gone yesterday, and this, he felt to be a brilliant effort, and he's going out of town this afternoon, uh, to Brighton. I had a letter from him this morning. He took her arm and led her up the square. 
She had to remind him his way to town lay in the other direction. <laughs> of course, how stupid of me, he said with a little loud laugh. I'm so used to going the other way with you, of course. It's the other way to the bus. Will you come along with me? I'm so awfully sorry it's happened like this. They took the street to the bus terminus. This time Elsie bore no signs of having gone through interior struggles. If she detected anything unusual in his manner, she made no comment. And he, seeing her calm, began to talk less recklessly through silences. By the time they reached the bus terminus, nobody seeing the pallid-faced man without an overcoat and the large, ample-skirted girl at his side would have supposed that one of them was ready to sink on his knees for thankfulness that he had, as he believed, saved the other from a wildly unthinkable danger. They mounted to the top of the bus, Oleron protesting that he should not miss his overcoat, and that he found the day, if anything, rather oppressively hot. They sat down on a front seat. Now that this meeting was forced upon him, he had something else to say that would make demands upon his tact. It had been on his mind for some time, and was indeed peculiarly difficult to put. He revolved it for some minutes, and then, remembering the success of his story of a sudden call to town, cut the knot of his difficulty with another lie. "'I'm uh, thinking of going away for a little while, Elsie,' he said. She merely said, "'Oh, somewhere for a change. I need a change. I, I think I shall go tomorrow, or the day after. Yes, uh, tomorrow, I think. Yes,' she replied. "'I don't know quite how long I shall be,' he continued. "'I shall have to let you know when I'm back. Yes, let me know,' she replied in an even tone. The tone was, for her, suspiciously even. He was a little uneasy. "'You uh, don't ask me where I'm going,' he said, with a little cumbrous effort to rally her. She was looking straight before her past the bus driver. "'I know,' she said. He was startled. "'How? You know?' "'You're not going anywhere,' she replied. He found not a word to say. It was a minute or so before she continued, in the same controlled voice she had employed from the start. You're not going anywhere. You weren't going out this morning. You only came out because I appeared. Don't behave as if we were strangers, Paul. A flush of pink had mounted to his cheeks. He noticed that the wind had given her the pink of early rhubarb. Still, he found nothing to say. Of course you ought to go away, she continued. I don't know whether you look at yourself often in the glass, but you're rather noticeable. Several people have turned to look at you this morning, so of course you ought to go away. But you won't. And I know why. He shivered, coughed a little, and then broke silence. Then, if you know, there's no use in continuing this discussion, he said curtly. Not for me, perhaps. But there is for you, she replied. Shall I tell you what I know? No, he said in a voice slightly raised. No, she asked, her round eyes earnestly on him. No. Again, he was getting out of patience with her. Again he was conscious of the strain. Her devotion and fidelity and love plagued him. She was only humiliating both herself and him. It would have been bad enough had he ever, by word or deed, given her cause for thus fastening herself on him. But there, that was the worst of that kind of life for a woman. Women such as she, business women, in and out of offices all the time, always, whether they realised it or not, made comradeship a cover for something else. They accepted the unconventional status, came and went freely as men did, were honestly taken by men at their own valuation, and then it turned out to be the other thing after all, and they went and fell in love. No wonder there was gossip in shops and squares and public houses. In a sense, the gossipers were in the right of it, independent, yet not efficient, with some of womanhood's graces foregone, and yet with all the woman's hunger and need, half sophisticated yet not wise. Oleron was tired of it all, and it was time he told her so. I suppose, he said tremblingly, looking down between his knees, I suppose the real trouble is in the life women who earn their own living are obliged to lead. He couldn't tell in what sense she took the lame generality. She merely replied, I suppose so. It can't be helped, he continued, but you do sacrifice a great deal. She agreed, a good deal. And then she added after a moment, What, for instance? 
You may or may not be gradually attaining a new status, but you're in a false position today. It was very likely, she said. She hadn't thought of it much in that light. And, he continued desperately, you're bound to suffer. Your most innocent acts are misunderstood. Motives you never dreamed of are attributed to you. And in the end it comes to... He hesitated a moment and then took the plunge to the sidelong look and the leer. She took his meaning with perfect ease. She merely shivered a little as she pronounced the name. Barrett. His silence told her the rest. Anything further that was to be said must come from her. It came as the bus stopped at a stage and fresh passengers mounted the stairs. You'd better get down here and go back, Paul, she said. I understand perfectly. Perfectly. It isn't Barrett. You'd be able to deal with Barrett. It's merely convenient for you to say it is Barrett. I know what it is. But you said I wasn't to tell you that. Very well. But before you go, let me tell you why I came up this morning. In a dull tone, he asked her why. Again, she looked straight before her as she replied. I came to force your hand. Things couldn't go on as they have been going, you know. And now, that's all over. All, all over, he repeated stupidly. All over. I want you now to consider yourself, as far as I'm concerned, perfectly free. I make only one reservation. He hardly had the spirit to ask her what it was. If I merely need you, she said, please don't give that a thought. That's nothing. I shan't come near for that. But, she dropped her voice, if you're in need of me, Paul, and I shall know if you are, and you will be, then I shall come no matter what cost. You understand that? He could only groan. So, that's understood, she concluded. And I think that's all. Now go back. I should advise you to walk back for your shivering. Goodbye. She gave him a cold hand and he descended. He turned on the edge of the curb as the bus started again. For the first time in all the years he had known her, she parted from him with no smile and no wave of her long arm. He stood on the curb, plunged in misery, looking after her as long as she remained in sight, but almost instantly with her disappearance he felt the heaviness lift from his spirit. She had given him his liberty, true. There was a sense in which he had never parted with it, but now was no time for splitting hairs. He was free to act, and all was clear ahead. Swiftly the sense of lightness grew on him. It became a positive rejoicing in his liberty, and before he was halfway home, he had decided what must be done next. The vicar of the parish in which his dwelling was situated lived within ten minutes of the square. To his house, Oleron turned his steps. It was necessary that he should have all the information he could get about this old house with the insurance marks and the sloping to let boards, and the vicar was the person most likely to be able to furnish it. This last preliminary out of the way, and aha, Oleron chuckled, things might be expected to happen. But he gained less information than he hoped for. The house, the vicar said, was old, but there needed no vicar to tell Oleron that. It was reputed, Oleron pricked up his ears, to be haunted. But there were few old houses about which some such rumour didn't circulate among the ignorant, and the deplorable lack of faith of the modern world, the vicar thought, did not tend to dissipate these superstitions. For the rest, his manner was the soothing manner of one who prefers not to make statements without knowing how they will be taken by his hearer. Oleron smiled as he perceived this. You may leave my nerves out of the question, he said. How long has the place been empty? A dozen years, I should say, the vicar replied. And the last tenant, did you know him or her? Oleron was conscious of a tingling of his nerves as he offered the vicar the alternative of sex. Him, said the vicar, a man, if I remember rightly. His name was Madley, an artist. He was a great recluse, seldom went out of the place, and, the vicar hesitated and then broke into a little gush of candour, and since you appear to have come for this information, 
And, since it's better that the truth should be told than that garbled versions should get about, I don't mind saying that this man madly died there under somewhat unusual circumstances. It was ascertained at the post-mortem that there was not a particle of food in his stomach, though he was found not to be without money, and his frame was simply worn out. Suicide was spoken of, but you'll agree with me that deliberate starvation is, to say the least, an uncommon form of suicide. An open verdict was returned. Ah, said Oleron, does there happen to be any comprehensive history of this parish? No, partial ones only. I myself am not guiltless of having made a number of notes on its purely ecclesiastical history, its registers and so forth, which I shall be happy to show you if you would care to see them. But it's a large parish. I have only one curate, and my leisure, as you will readily understand, the extent of the parish and the scantiness of the vicar's leisure occupied the remainder of the interview, and Oleron thanked the vicar, took his leave, and walked slowly home. He walked slowly for a reason, twice turning away from the house within a stone's throw of the gate, and taking another turn of twenty minutes or so. He had a very ticklish piece of work now before him. It required the greatest mental concentration. It was nothing less than to bring his mind, if he might, into such a state of unpreoccupation and receptivity that he should see the place as he had seen it on that morning when his removal accomplished he had sat down to begin the sixteenth chapter of his first Romilly. For, could he recapture that first impression, he now hoped for far more from it. Formerly he had carried no end of mental lumber. Before the influence of the place had been able to find him out at all, it had had the inertia of those dreary chapters to overcome. No results had shown. The process had been one of slow saturation, charging, filling up to a brim. But now he was light and burdened, rid at last both of that Romilly and of her prototype. Now for the new unknown, coy, jealous, bewitching, beckoning fair. At half past two of the afternoon, he put his key into the Yale lock, entered and closed the door behind him. His fantastic attempt was instantly and astonishingly successful. He could have shouted with triumph as he entered the room. It was as if he had escaped into it. Once more, as in the days when his writing had had a daily freshness and wonder and promise for him, he was conscious of that new ease and mastery and exhilaration and release. The air of the place seemed to hold more oxygen, as if his own specific gravity had changed. His very tread seemed less ponderable. The flowers in the bowls, the fair proportions of the meadow-sweet coloured panels and mouldings, the polished floor, and the lofty and faintly starred ceiling, fairly laughed their welcome. Oleron actually laughed back and spoke aloud. Oh, you're pretty, pretty, he flattered it. Then he lay down on his couch. He spent that afternoon as a convalescent who expected a dear visitor might have spent it, in a delicious vacancy, smiling now and then as if in his sleep and ever lifting drowsy and contented eyes to his alluring surroundings. He lay thus until darkness came, and with darkness, the nocturnal noises of the old house. But if he waited for any specific happening, he waited in vain. He waited similarly in vain on the morrow, maintaining, though with less ease, that sensitised plate-like condition of his mind. Nothing occurred to give it an impression. Whatever it was which he so patiently wooed, it seemed to be both shy and exacting. Then, on the third day, he thought he understood. A look of gentle drollery and cunning came into his eyes, and he chuckled. Oh, 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 well, if the wind sits in that quarter, we must see what else there is to be done. But what is there now? No, I won't send for Elsie. We don't need a wheel to break the butterfly on. We won't go to those lengths, my butterfly. He was standing, musing, thumbing his lean jaw, looking aslant. Suddenly, he crossed to his hall, took down his hat and went out. My lady is coquettish, is she? Well, we'll see what a little neglect will do. He chuckled as he went down the stairs. He sought a railway station, got onto a train, and spent the rest of the day in the country. Oh, yes, Oleron thought. He was the man to deal with fair ones who beckoned and invited and then took refuge in shyness and hanging back. He didn't return until after eleven that night. 
Now, my fair beckoner, he murmured as he walked along the alley and felt in his pocket for his keys. Inside his flat, he was perfectly composed, perfectly deliberate, exceedingly careful not to give himself away, as if to intimate that he intended to retire immediately, he lighted only a single candle, and as he set out with it on his nightly round, he affected to yawn. He went first into his kitchen. There was a full moon and a lozenge of moonlight, almost peacock blue by contrast with his candle flame, lay on the floor. The window was uncurtained, and he could see the reflection of the candle, and faintly, that of his own face as he moved about. The door of the powder closet stood a little jar, and he closed it before sitting down to remove his boots on the chair with a cushion made of the folded harp bag. From the kitchen he passed to the bathroom. There another slant of blue moonlight cut the windowsill and lay across the pipes on the wall. He visited his seldom-used study and stood for a moment gazing at the silvered roofs across the square. Then, walking straight through his sitting-room, his stockinged feet making no noise, he entered his bedroom and put the candle on the chest of drawers. His face all this time wore no expression save that of tiredness. He had never been wilier nor more alert. His small bedroom fireplace was opposite the chest of drawers on which the mirror stood, and his bed and the window occupied the remaining sides of the room. Oleron drew down his blind, took off his coat, and then stooped to get his slippers from under the bed. He could have given no reason for the conviction, but the manifestation that for two days had been withheld was close at hand he never for an instant doubted. Nor, though he could not form the faintest guess of the shape it might take, did he experience fear. Startling or surprising it might be, he was prepared for that, but that was all. His scale of sensation had become depressed, his hand moved this way and that under the bed in search of the slippers. But, for all his caution and method and preparedness, his heart all at once gave a leap and a pause that was almost horrid. He had found the slippers, but he was still on his knees, save for this circumstance he would have fallen. The bed was a low one, the groping for the slippers accounted with the turn of his head to one side, and he was careful to keep the attitude until he had partly recovered his self-possession. When presently he rose, there was a drop of blood on his lower lip, where he had caught at it with his teeth, and his watch had jerked out of the pocket of his waistcoat, and was dangling at the end of its short leather guard. Then, before the watch had ceased its little oscillation, he was himself again. In the middle of his mantelpiece there stood a picture, a portrait of his grandmother. He placed himself before this picture so that he could see in the glass of it the steady flame of the candle that burned behind him on the chest of drawers. He could also see in the picture glass the little glancings of light from the bevels and facets of the objects about the mirror and candle, but he could see more. These twinklings and reflections and re-reflections did not change their position, but there was one gleam that had motion. It was fainter than the rest, and it moved up and down through the air. It was a reflection of the candle on Oleron's black vulcanite comb, and each of its downward movements was accompanied by a silky and crackling rustle. Oleron, watching what went on in the glass of his grandmother's portrait, continued to play his part. He felt for his dangling watch and began slowly to wind it up. Then, for a moment, ceasing to watch, he began to empty his trouser pockets and place methodically in a little row on the mantelpiece the pennies and halfpennies he took from them. The sweeping, minutely electric noise filled the whole bedroom, and had Oleron altered his point of observation, he could have brought the dim gleam of the moving comb so into position that it would almost have outlined his grandmother's head. Any other head of which it might have been following the outline was invisible. Oleron finished the emptying of his pockets, then under cover of another simulated yawn, not so much summoning his resolution as overmastered by an exorbitant curiosity, he swung suddenly round. That which was being combed was still not to be seen, but the comb did not stop. It had altered its angle a little, and had moved a little to the left. It was passing in fairly regular sweeps from a point rather more than five feet from the ground, in a direction roughly vertical, 
to another point a few inches below the level of the chest of drawers. Oleron continued to act to admiration. He walked to his little washstand in the corner, poured out water, and began to wash his hands. He removed his waistcoat and continued his preparations for bed. The combing did not cease, and he stood for a moment in thought. Again his eyes twinkled. The next was very cunning. Hmm, I think I'll read for a quarter of an hour, he said aloud. He passed out of the room. He was away a couple of minutes. When he returned again, the room was suddenly quiet. He glanced at the chest of drawers. The comb lay still between the collar he had removed and a pair of gloves. Without hesitation, Oleron put out his hand and picked it up. It was an ordinary eighteen-penny comb, taken from a card in a chemist's shop, of a substance of a definite specific gravity and no more capable of rebellion against the laws by which it existed than are the worlds that keep their orbits through the void. Oleron put it down again. Then he glanced at the bundle of papers he held in his hand. What he had gone to fetch had been the fifteen chapters of the original Romilly. Hmm, he muttered as he threw the manuscript into a chair. As I thought, she's just blindly, ragingly, murderously jealous. On the night after that, and on the following night, and for many nights and days, so many that he began to be uncertain about the count of them, Oleron courting, cajoling, neglecting, threatening, beseeching, eaten out with unappeased curiosity, and regardless that his life was becoming one consuming passion and desire, continued his search for the unknown co-numerator of his abode. Ten. As time went on, it came to pass that few except the postman mounted Oleron's stairs, and since men who do not write letters receive few, even the postman's tread became so infrequent that it was not heard more than once or twice a week. There came a letter from Oleron's publishers asking when they might expect to receive the manuscript of his new book. He delayed for some days to answer it and finally forgot. A second letter came which he also failed to answer. He received no third. The weather grew bright and warm. The privet bushes among the chopper-like notice boards flowered, and in the streets where Oleron did his shopping the baskets of flower women lined the curbs. Oleron purchased flowers daily. His room clamoured for flowers, fresh and continually renewed, and Oleron did not stint its demands. Nevertheless, the necessity for going out to buy them became to irk him more and more, and it was with a greater and ever greater sense of relief that he returned home again. He began to be conscious that again his scale of sensation had suffered a subtle change, a change that was not restoration to its former capacity, but an extension, an enlarging that once more included terror. It admitted it in an entirely new form, Lux Orco, Tenebrae Jovi. The name of this terror was agoraphobia. Oleron had begun to dread air and space and the horror that might pounce upon the unguarded back. Presently, he so contrived it that his food and flowers were delivered daily at his door. He rubbed his hands when he had hit upon this expedient. That was better. Now he could please himself whether he went out or not. Quickly he was confirmed in his choice. It became his pleasure to remain immured. But he was not happy. Or if he was, his happiness took an extraordinary turn. He fretted discontentedly, could sometimes have wept for mere weakness and misery, and yet he was dimly conscious that he would not have exchanged his sadness for all the noisy mirth of the world outside. And speaking of noise, noise, much noise now, caused him the acutest discomfort. It was hardly more to be endured than that newborn fear that kept him, on the increasingly rare occasions when he did go out, sidling close to walls and feeling friendly railings with his hand. He moved from room to room softly and in slippers, and sometimes stood for many seconds closing a door so gently that not a sound broke the stillness that was in itself a delight. Sunday now became an intolerable day for him, for since the coming of the fine weather, 
there had begun to assemble in the square under his windows each Sunday morning certain members of the sect to which the long-nosed Barrett adhered. These came with a great drum and large brass-bellied instruments, men and women uplifted, anguished voices, struggling with their god, and Barrett himself with upraised face and closed eyes and working brows, prayed that the sound of his voice might penetrate the ears of all unbelievers, as it certainly did Oleron's. One day, in the middle of one of these rhapsodies, Oleron sprang to his blind and pulled it down, and heard as he did so his own name made the subject of a fresh torrent of outpouring. And sometimes, but not as expecting a reply, Oleron stood still and called softly. Once or twice he called, Romilly, and then waited, but more often his whispering did not take the shape of a name. There was one spot in particular of his abode that he began to haunt with increasing persistency. This was just within the opening of his bedroom door. He had discovered one day that by opening every door in his place, always excepting the outer one, which he only opened unwillingly, and by placing himself on this particular spot, he could actually see to a greater or less extent into each of his five rooms without changing his position. He could see the whole of his sitting room, all of his bedroom except the part hidden by the open door, and glimpses of his kitchen, bathroom, and of his rarely used study. He was often in this place, breathless and with his finger on his lip. One day, as he stood there, he suddenly found himself wondering whether this madly, of whom the vicar had spoken, had ever discovered the strategic importance of the bedroom entry. Light, moreover, now caused him greater disquietude and did darkness. Direct sunlight, of which as the sun passed daily round the house, each of his rooms had now its share, was like a flame in his brain and even diffused light was a dull and numbing ache. He began at successive hours of the day, one after another, to lower his crimson blinds. He made short and daring excursions in order to do this, but he was ever so careful to leave his retreat open, in case he should have sudden need of it. Presently, this lowering of the blinds had become a daily methodical exercise, and his rooms, when he had been on his round, had the blood-red half-light of a photographer's darkroom. One day, as he drew down the blind of his little study and backed in good order out of the room again, he broke into a soft laugh. That bilks Mr. Barrett, he said, and the baffling of Barrett continued to afford him mirth for an hour. But on another day, soon after, he had a fright that left him trembling also for an hour. He had seized the cord to darken the window over the seat in which he had found the harp bag, and was standing with his back well protected in the embrasure when he thought he saw the tail of a black-and-white check skirt disappear round the corner of the house, he couldn't be sure. He had to run to the window of the other wall, which was blinded. The skirt must have already been passed, but he was almost sure that it was Elsie. He listened in an agony of suspense for her tread on the stairs. But no tread came, and after three or four minutes he drew a long breath of relief. By Jove, but that would have compromised me horribly, he muttered and he continued to mutter from time to time, horribly compromising. No woman would stand that, not any kind of a woman, oh, compromising the extreme. Yet he was not happy. He could not have assigned the cause of the fits of quiet weeping which took him sometimes. They came and went, like the fitful illumination of the clouds that travelled over the square, and perhaps, after all, if he was not happy, he was not unhappy. Before he could be unhappy, something must have been withdrawn and nothing had yet been withdrawn from him, for nothing had been granted. He was waiting for that granting, in that flower-laden, frightfully enticing apartment of his, with the pith-white walls tinged and subdued by the crimson blinds to a blood-like gloom. He paid no heed to it that his stock of money was running perilously low, nor that he had ceased to work. Ceased to work? He had not ceased to work. They knew very little about it. It was supposed that Oleron had ceased to work. He was, in truth, only now beginning to work. He was preparing such a work, such a work, such a mistress was a making in the gestation of his art. Let him but get this period of probation and poignant waiting over, and men should see. How should men know her, this fair one of Oleron's, until Oleron himself knew her? Lovely, radiant creations are not thrown off like how-do-you-do's. 
the man to whom it is committed to father them must weep wretched tears, as Oleron did, must swell with vain presumptuous hopes, as Oleron did, must pursue, as Oleron pursued, the capricious, fair, mocking, slippery, eager spirit that ever eluding, ever sees to it that the chase does not slacken. Let Oleron but hunt this huntress a little longer, he would have a sparkling and panting in his arms yet. Oh no, they were very far from the truth to suppose that Oleron had ceased to work. And if all else was falling away from Oleron, gladly he was letting it go. So do we all when our fair ones beckon. Quite at the beginning we wink and promise ourselves that we will put her ladyship through her paces, neglect her for a day, turn her own jealous wiles against her, flout and ignore her when she comes wheedling. Perhaps there lurks within us all the time a heartless sprite who is never fooled, but in the end all falls away. She beckons, beckons, and all goes. And so Oleron kept his strategic post within the frame of his bedroom door and watched and waited and smiled with his finger on his lips. It was his duty of service, his worship, his troth-plighting, all that he had ever known of love. And when he found himself, as he now and again did, hating the dead man madly and wishing that he had never lived, he felt that that too was an acceptable service. But as he thus prepared himself, as it were, for a marriage, and moped and chafed more and more that the bride made no sign. He made a discovery that he ought to have made weeks before. It was through a thought of the dead madly that he made it. Since that night when he had thought in his greenness that a little studied neglect would bring the lovely beckoner to her knees, and had made use of her own jealousy to banish her, he had not set eyes on those fifteen discarded chapters of Romilly. He had thrown them back into the window seat, forgotten their very existence but his own jealousy of madly put him in mind of hers, of her jilted rival of flesh and blood, and he remembered them fool that he had been. Had he then expected his desire to manifest herself where there still existed the evidence of his divided allegiance? What? And she with a passion so fierce and centred that it had not hesitated at the destruction twice attempted of her rival? Fool that he had been! But if that was all the pledge and sacrifice she required, she should have it, oh yes, and quickly. He took the manuscript from the window seat and brought it to the fire. He kept his fire always burning now. The warmth brought out the last vestige of odour of the flowers with which his room was banked. He didn't know what time it was. Long since he had allowed his clock to run down. It had seemed a foolish measure of time in regard to the stupendous things that were happening to Oleron but he knew it was late. He took the Romilly manuscript and knelt before the fire. But he hadn't finished removing the fastening that held the sheets together before he suddenly gave a start, turned his head over his shoulder, and listened intently. The sound he had heard had not been loud. It had, indeed, been no more than a tap, twice or thrice repeated, but it had filled Oleron with alarm. His face grew dark as it came again. He heard a voice outside on his landing. Paul, Paul, it was Elsie's voice. Paul, I know you're in. I want to see you. He cursed her under his breath, but kept perfectly still. He did not intend to admit her. Paul, you're in trouble. I believe you're in danger. At least come to the door. Oleron smothered a low laugh. It somehow amused him that she, in such danger herself, should talk to him of his danger. Well, if she was, serve her right. She knew or said she knew all about it. Paul, 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 he mimicked her under his breath. Oh, Paul, it's horrible. Horrible, was it, thought Oleron. Then let her get away. I only want to help you, Paul. I didn't promise not to come if you'd needed me. He was impervious to the pitiful sob that interrupted the low cry. The devil take the woman. Should he shout to her to go away and not come back? No, let her call and knock and sob. She had a gift for sobbing. She mustn't think her sobs would move him. They irritated him, so that he set his teeth and shook his fist at her. But that was all. Let her sob. Paul! Paul! With his teeth hard set, he dropped the first page of Romilly into the fire. Then he began to drop the rest in, sheet by sheet. For many minutes the calling behind his door continued. Then, suddenly, 
it ceased. He heard the sound of feet slowly descending the stairs. He listened for the noise of a fall or a cry or the crash of a piece of the handrail of the upper landing. But none of these things came. She was spared. Apparently her rival suffered her to crawl abject and beaten away. Oleron heard the passing of her steps under his window. Then she was gone. He dropped the last page into the fire and then, with a low laugh, rose. He looked fondly round his room. Lucky to get away like that, he remarked. She wouldn't have got away if I'd given her as much as a word or a look. What devils these women are. But no, I wouldn't say that. One of them showed forbearance. Who showed forbearance and what was forborne? Ah, Oleron knew contempt, no doubt. Had been at the bottom of it, but that didn't matter. The pestering creature had been allowed to go unharmed. Yes, she was lucky. Oleron hoped she knew it. And now, 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 for his reward. Oleron crossed the room. All his doors were open. His eyes shone as he placed himself within that of his bedroom. Fool that he had been not to think of destroying the manuscript sooner. How, in a house full of shadows, should he know his own shadow? How, in a house full of noises, distinguish the summons he felt to be at hand? Ah, trust him, he would know. The place was full of a jugglery of dim lights. The blind at his elbow that allowed the light of a street lamp to struggle vaguely through, the glimpse of greeny-blue moonlight seen through the distant kitchen door, the sulky glow of the fire under the black ashes of the burnt manuscript, the glimmering of the tulips and the moon daisies, the narcissi in the bowls and jugs and jars. These did not so trick and bewilder his eyes that he wouldn't know his own. It was he, not she, who had been delaying the shadowy bridal. He hung his head for a moment in mute acknowledgement. Then he bent his eyes on the deceiving, puzzling gloom again. He would have called her name had he known it. But now he would not ask her to share even a name with the other. His own face within the frame of the door glimmered white as a narcissi in the darkness. A shadow light as fleece seemed to take shape in the kitchen. The time had been when Olron would have said that a cloud had passed over the unseen moon. The low illumination and the blind at his elbow grew dimmer. The time had been when Olron would have concluded that the lamplighter going on his rounds had turned low the flame of the lamp. The fire settled letting down the black and charred papers. A flower fell from a bowl and lay indistinct upon the floor. All was still. And then a stray draught moved through the old house, passing before Oleron's face. Suddenly, inclining his head, he withdrew a little from the door jamb. The wandering draught caused the door to move a little on its hinges. Oleron trembled violently stood for a moment longer, and then, putting his hand out to the knob, softly drew the door to, sat down on the nearest chair, and waited, as a man might await the calling of his name that should summon him to some weighty high and privy audience. Part 11 one knows not whether there can be human compassion for anemia of the soul. When the pitch of life is dropped, and the spirit is so put over and reversed, that that only is horrible which before was sweet and worldly, and of the day, the human relation disappears. The sane soul turns appalled away, lest not merely itself but sanity should suffer. We are not gods. We cannot drive out devils. We must see selfishly to it that devils do not enter into ourselves. And this we must do even though love so transfuse us that we may well deem our nature to be half divine. We shall but speak of honour and duty in vain. The letter dropped within the dark door will lie unregarded or, if regarded for a brief instant between two unspeakable lapses, left and forgotten again. The telegram will be undelivered, nor will the whistling messenger, wisely a guided than he knows to whistle, 
be conscious as he walks away of the drawn blind that is pushed aside an inch by a finger and then fearfully replaced again. No, let the miserable wrestle with his own shadows. Let him, if indeed he be so mad, clip and strain and enfold and couch the succubus. But let him do so in a house into which not an air of heaven penetrates, nor a bright finger of the sun pierces the filthy twilight. The lost must remain lost. Humanity has other business to attend to. For the handwriting of the two letters that Oleron stealing noiselessly one June day into his kitchen to rid his sitting room of an armful of fetid and decaying flowers had seen on the floor within his door had had no more meaning for him than if it had belonged to some dim and faraway dream. And at the beating of the telegraph boy upon the door within a few feet of the bed where he lay, he had gnashed his teeth and stopped his ears. He had pictured the lad standing there just beyond his partition, among packets of provisions and bundles of dead and dying flowers, for his outer landing was littered with these. Oleron had feared to open his door to take them in. After a week, the errand lads had reported that there must be some mistake about the order, and had left no more. Inside, in the red twilight, the old flowers turned brown and fell and decayed where they lay. Gradually, his power was draining away. The abomination fastened on Oleron's power. The steady sapping sometimes left him for many hours of prostration gazing vacantly up at his red-tinged ceiling, idly suffering such fancies as came of themselves to have their way with him. Even the strongest of his memories had no more than a precarious hold upon his attention. Sometimes a flitting half-memory of a novel to be written, a novel it was important that he should write, tantalised him for a space before vanishing again, and sometimes whole novels, perfect, splendid, established to endure, rose magically before him and sometimes the memories were absurdly remote and trivial, of garrets he had inhabited and lodgings that had sheltered him and so forth. Oleron had known a good deal about such things in his time, but all that now was past. He had at last found a place which he did not intend to leave until they fetched him out, a place that some might have thought a little on the greenstick side, that others might have considered to be a little too redolent of long dead and morbid things for a living man to be mewed up in, but ah, so irresistible, with such an authority of its own, with such an associate of its own, and a place of such delights when once a man had ceased to struggle against its inexorable will. A novel. Somebody ought to write a novel about a place like that. There must be lots to write about in a place like that, if one could but get to the bottom of it. It had probably already been painted by a man called Madley who had lived there. But Oleron had not known this Madley, had a strong feeling that he wouldn't have liked him, would rather he had lived somewhere else, really couldn't stand the fellow, hated him. Madley, in fact. Aha, that was a joke. He seriously doubted whether the man had led the life he ought. Oleron was in two minds sometimes whether he wouldn't tell that long-nosed guardian of the public morals across the way about him, but probably he knew, and had made his praying hullabaloos for him also. That was his line. Why, Oleron himself had had a dust-up with him about something or other, some girl or other. Elsie Bengoff, her name was, he remembered. Oleron had moments of deep uneasiness about this Elsie Bengoff, or rather, he was not so much uneasy about her as restless about the things she did. Chief of these was the way in which she persisted in thrusting herself into his thoughts, and whenever he was quick enough, he sent her packing the moment she made her appearance there. The truth was that she wasn't merely a bore, she'd always been that. It had now come to the pitch where her very presence in his fancy was inimical to the full enjoyment of certain experiences. She had no tact, 
really ought to have known that people are not at home to the thoughts of everybody all the time, ought in mere politeness to have allowed him certain seasons quite to himself, and was monstrously ignorant of things as she didn't know, as she appeared not to know. That there were certain special hours when a man's veins ran with fire and daring and power, in which, well, in which he had the reasonable right to treat folk as he had treated that prying Barrett, to shut them out completely. But no, up she popped the thought of her and ruined all. Bright, towering fabrics by the side of which even those perfect, magical novels of which he dreamed were dun and grey vanished utterly at her intrusion. It was as if a fog should suddenly quench some fair beaming star, as if at the threshold of some golden portal prepared for Oleron, a pit should suddenly gape, as if a bat-like shadow should turn the growing dawn to murk and darkness again. Therefore Oleron strove to stifle even the nascent thought of her. Nevertheless, there came an occasion on which this woman, Bengoff, absolutely refused to be suppressed. Oleron couldn't have told exactly when this happened. He only knew by the glimmer of the street lamp on his blind that it was some time during the night, and that for some time she had not presented herself. He had no warning, none, of her coming. She just came, was there. Strive as he would, he couldn't shake off the thought of her, nor the image of her face. She haunted him. But for her to come at that moment of all moments, really it was past belief how she could endure it, Oleron could not conceive. Actually to look on, as it were, at the triumph of a rival, good God, it was monstrous. Tact, reticence, he had never credited her with an overwhelming amount of either, but he had never attributed mere, no, there was no word for it. Monstrous, monstrous. Did she intend thenceforward, good God, to look on? Oleron felt the blood rush up to the roots of his hair with anger against her. Damnation, take her, he choked. But the next moment his heat and resentment had changed to a cold sweat of cowering fear. Panic-stricken, he strove to comprehend what he had done. But though he knew not what, he knew he had done something. Something fatal, irreparable, blasting. Anger he had felt, but not this blaze of infernal light. That appalling flash wasn't his, not his, that open rift of bright and searing hell, not his, not his. His had been the hand of a child, preparing a puny blow, but what was this other horrific hand that was drawn back to strike in the same place? Had he set that in motion? Had he provided the spark that had touched off the whole accumulated power of that formidable and relentless place? He didn't know. He only knew that that poor igniting particle in himself was blown out. That, oh, impossible, clinging kiss, how else to express it, that changed on his very lips to a gnashing and a removal. And that for the very pity of the awful odds, he must cry out to her against whom he had lately raged to guard herself, guard herself. Look out, he shrieked aloud. The revulsion was instant, as if a cold, slow billow had broken over him. He came too to find that he was lying in his bed, that the mist and horror that had for so long enwrapped him had departed, that he was Paul Oleron, and that he was sick, naked, helpless, and unutterably abandoned and alone. His faculties, though weak, answered at last to his calls upon them, and he knew that it must have been a hideous nightmare that had left him sweating and shaking thus. Yes, he was himself, Paul Oleron, a tired novelist, already past the summit of his best work and slipping downhill again, empty-handed from it all. He had struck short in his life's aim. He had tried too much, had overestimated his strength and was a failure, a failure. It all came to him in a single word, enwrapped and complete. He needed no sequential thought. He was a failure. He had missed. And he had missed not one happiness, but two. He had missed the ease of this world which men love, 
and he had missed also that other shrining prize for which men forgo ease, the snatching and holding and triumphant bearing up aloft, of which is the only justification of the mad adventurer who hazards the enterprise. There was no second attempt. Fate has no morrow. Oleron's morrow must be to sit down to profitless, ill-done, unrequired work again. And so, on the morrow after that, and the morrow after that, and as many morrows as there might be, he lay there, weakly, yet sanely, considering it. And since the whole attempt had failed, it was hardly worthwhile to consider whether a little might not be saved from the general wreck. No good would ever come of that half-finished novel. It intended that it should appear in the autumn, it was under contract that it should appear, no matter. It was better to pay forfeit to his publishers than to waste what days were left. He was spent. Age was not far off, and paths of wisdom and sadness were the properest for the remainder of the journey. If only he had chosen the wife, the child, the faithful friend at the fireside, and let them follow in ignis fatus, that list. In the meantime, it began to puzzle him exceedingly. What, he should be so weak? that his room should smell so overpoweringly of decaying vegetable matter, and that his hand, chancing to stray to his face in the darkness, should encounter a beard. He thought he heard a sound from the kitchen or bathroom. He rose a little on his pillow and listened. Ah, he was not alone then. It certainly would have been extraordinary if they had left him ill and alone. Alone? Oh no, he would be looked after. He wouldn't be left ill to shift for himself. If everybody else had forsaken him, he could trust Elsie Bengoff, the dearest chum he had for that. Bless her faithful heart. But suddenly, a short, stifled, spluttering cry rang sharply out. Paul! It came from the kitchen. And in the same moment it flashed upon Olderon. He knew not how. The two, three, five. He didn't know how many minutes before. Another sound, unremarked at the time but suddenly transfixing his attention now had striven to reach his intelligence. This sound had been the slight touch of metal on metal, just such a sound as Oleron made when he put his key into the lock. Hello? Who's that? he called sharply from his bed. He had no answer. He called again. Hello? Who's there? Who is it? This time he was sure he heard noises soft and heavy in the kitchen. This is a queer thing altogether, he muttered. By Jove, I'm as weak as a kitten, too. Hello there. Somebody called, didn't they? Elsie? Is that you? Then he began to knock with his hand on the wall at the side of his bed. Elsie, Elsie, you called, didn't you? Please come here, whoever it is. There was a sound as of a closing door, and then, in silence... Oleron began to get rather alarmed. It, it may be a nurse, he muttered. Elsie would have got me a nurse, of course. She'd sit with me as long as she could spare the time, brave lass, and she'd get a nurse for the rest. But it was awfully like her voice. Elsie, or whoever it is, I can't make this out at all. I must go and see what's the matter. He put one leg out of the bed, feeling its feebleness. He reached with his hand for the additional support of the wall. But before putting out the other leg, he stopped and considered, picking at his newfound beard. He was suddenly wondering whether he dared go into the kitchen. It was such a frightfully long way. No man knew what horror might not leap and huddle on his shoulders if he went so far. When a man has an overmastering impulse to get back into bed, he ought to take heed of the warning and obey it. Besides, why should he go? What was there to go for? If it was that Vengoff creature again, let her look after herself. Oleron wasn't going to have things cramp themselves on his defenceless back for the sake of such a spoil sport as she. If she was in, let her let herself out again. And the sooner the better for her. Oleron simply couldn't be bothered. He had his work to do. On the morrow, he must set about the writing of a novel with a heroine so winsome, capricious, Adorable, jealous, wicked, beautiful, inflaming, and altogether evil. The men should stand amazed. She was coming over him now. He knew that by the alteration of the very air of the room when she was near him. 
And that soft thrill of bliss that had begun to stir in him never came back and that she was beckoning, beckoning. He let go of the wall and fell back into the bed again. Oh, as oh, unthinkable. The other half of that kiss that a gnash had interrupted was placed, how else convey it, on his lips, robbing him of very breath. Part 12 In the bright June sunlight a crowd filled the square and looked up at the windows of the old house with the antique insurance marks in its walls of red brick and the agents' notice boards hanging like wooden choppers over the paling. Two constables stood at the broken gate of the narrow entrance alley keeping folk back. The women kept to the outskirts of the throng, moving now and then as if to see the red drawn blinds of the old house from a new angle and talking in whispers. The children were in the houses behind closed doors. A long-nosed man had a little group about him, and he was telling some story over and over again, and another man, little and fat and wide-eyed, sought to capture the long-nosed man's audience with some relation in which a key figured. And it was revealed to me that there had been something in that very afternoon, the long-nosed man was saying. I was standing there, where Constable Saunders is, or, or rather, I was passing about my business when they came out. There was no deceiving me, oh no, deceiving me. I saw a face. What was it like, Mr Barrett? a man asked. It was like hers whom our Lord said to, Woman, doth any man accuse thee? White as paper, and no mistake, don't tell me. And so I walked straight over to Mrs Barrett, and Jane, I says, this must stop, and stop at once. We are commanded to avoid evil, I says, and it must come to an end now. Let him get help somewhere else. And then she says to me, John, she says, it's four and sixpence a week. Them was her words. Jane, I says, if it was 46,000 pounds, it should stop. And from that day to this, she hasn't set a foot inside that gate. There was a short silence then. Did uh, Mrs Barrett ever see anything like? Somebody vaguely inquired. Barrett turned austerely on the speaker. What Mrs Barrett saw, what Mrs Barrett didn't see, shall not pass these lips, even as it is written, keep thy tongue from speaking evil, he said. Another man spoke. He was pretty near canned up at the wagon and horses that night, weren't he, Jim? Yeah, he had no off copped it. Not standing treat much neither. He was in the bar all on his own. So he was, we talked about it. The fat, scared-eyed man made another attempt. She got the key off me. She had the number of it. She come into my shop of a Tuesday evening. Nobody heeded him. Shut your heads, a heavy labourer commented gruffly. She hasn't been found yet. Here's the inspectors. We shall know more in a bit. Two inspectors had come up and were talking to the constables who guarded the gate. The little fat man ran eagerly forward, saying that she had bought the key off him. I remember the number because it's been free ones and free frees. One, 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 three, 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 he exclaimed excitedly. An inspector put him aside. Nobody's been in, he asked one of the constables. No, sir. Then you, Brackley, come with us. You, Smith, keep the gate. There's a squad on its way. The two inspectors and the constable passed down the alley and entered the house. They mounted the wide, carved staircase. This don't look like as if it had been much out lately, one of the inspectors muttered as he kicked aside a litter of dead leaves and a paper that lay outside Oleron's door. I don't think we need to knock. Break a pane, Brackley. The door had two glazed panels. There was a sound of shattered glass, and Brackley put his hand through the hole his elbow had made and drew back the latch. Boah! choked one of the inspectors as they entered. Let some light and air in quick. It stinks like a hearse. The assembly out in the square saw the red blinds go up and the windows of the old house flung open. That's better, said one of the inspectors, putting his head out of a window and drawing a deep breath. That seems to be the bedroom in there. Will you go in, Sims, while I go over the rest? They had drawn up the bedroom blind also, and the waxy, white, emaciated man on the bed had made a blinker of his hand against the torturing flood of brightness, nor could he believe that his hearing wasn't playing tricks with him for there were two policemen in his room, bending over him and asking where she was. He shook his head. This woman, Bengough, goes by the name of Miss Elsie Bengough. Do you hear? Where is she? 
No good, Brackley. Get him up. Be careful with him. I'll just shove my head out of the window, I think. The other inspector had been through Oleron's study and had found nothing, and was now in the kitchen, kicking aside an ankle-deep mass of vegetable refuse that cumbered the floor. The kitchen window had no blind, and was overshadowed by the blank end of the house across the alley. The kitchen appeared to be empty, but the inspector, kicking aside the dead flowers, noticed that a shuffling track that was not of his making had been swept to a cupboard in the corner. In the upper part of the door of the cupboard was a square panel that looked as if it slid on runners. The door itself was closed. The inspector advanced, put out his hand to the little knob and slid the hatch along its groove. Then he took an involuntary step back again. Framed in the aperture and falling forward a little before it jammed again in its frame was a something that resembled a large lumpy pudding done up in a pudding bag of faded browny red frieze. Ah, said the inspector. To close the hatch again, he would have had to thrust that pudding back with his hand, and somehow he didn't quite like the idea of touching it. Instead, he turned the handle of the cupboard itself. There was weight behind it, so much weight that after opening the door three or four inches and peering aside, he had to put his shoulder to it in order to close it again. In closing it, he left sticking out a few inches from the door, a triangle of black and white checked skirt. He went into the small hall. All right, he called. They had got Oleron into his clothes. He still used his hands as blinkers, and his brain was very confused. A number of things were happening that he couldn't understand. He couldn't understand the extraordinary mess of dead flowers that seemed to be everywhere. He couldn't understand why there should be police officers in his room. He couldn't understand why one of these should be sent for a four-wheeler and a stretcher, and he couldn't understand what heavy article they seemed to be moving about in the kitchen, his kitchen. What, what's the matter? he muttered sleepily. Then he heard a murmur in the square and the stopping of a four-wheeler outside. A police officer was at his elbow again, and Olderon wondered why, when he whispered something to him, he should run off with a string of words, something about used in evidence against you. They had lifted him to his feet and were assisting him towards the door. No, Oleron couldn't understand it at all. They got him down the stairs and along the alley. Oleron was aware of confused, angry shoutings. He gathered that a number of people wanted to lynch somebody or other. Then his attention became fixed on a little fat, frightened-eyed man who appeared to be making a statement that an officer was taking down in a notebook. I I'd seen her with him. They was often together. She came into my shop and said it was for him. I thought it was all right. One, 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 three, 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 the number was, the man was saying. The people seemed to be very angry. Many police were keeping them back, but one of the inspectors had a voice that older one thought quite kind and friendly. He was telling somebody to get somebody else into the cab before something or other was brought out. And Oleron noticed that a four-wheeler was drawn up at the gate. It appeared that it was himself who was to be put into it. And as they lifted him up, he saw that the inspector tried to stand between him and something that stood behind the cab, but was not quick enough to prevent Oleron seeing that this something was a hooded stretcher. The angry voices sounded like the sea. Something hard like a stone hit the back of the cab, and the inspector followed Oleron in and stood with his back to the window nearer the side where the people were. The door they had put Oleron in at remained open, apparently till the other inspector should come. And through the opening, Oleron had a glimpse of the hatchet-like to let boards among the privet trees. One of them said that the key was at number six. Suddenly the raging of voices was hushed, Along the entrance alley, shuffling steps were heard, and the other inspector appeared at the cab door. Right away, he said to the driver. He entered, fastened the door after him, and blocked up the second window with his back. Between the two inspectors, Oleron slept peacefully. The cab moved down the square. The other vehicle went up the hill. The mortuary lay that way. That was The Beckoning Fair One, written by Oliver Onions and narrated by Tony Walker.
The music is The Long Road Ahead by Kevin MacLeod.